Born in 1965, The Undertaker, or his real name, Mark Calloway, grew up in Houston, Texas. As a teenager, the dead man was gifted in sports, especially basketball, so much in fact that he attended college on a basketball scholarship. Likely due to both his talent and size, Undertaker actually considered playing professional basketball in Europe. Imagine how different wrestling would have been had The Undertaker gone that route. Well, he ended up pursuing wrestling instead, and Undertaker made his debut in 1987. Undertaker wasn't, well, The Undertaker, yet though. Instead, he wore a mask and was named Texas Red. After only a few years, the Phenom got a big opportunity when he was signed by WCW in 1989. There, he performed as Mean Mark Callis. His time in WCW isn't that notable, partially because Taker spent less than a year in the company. However, WCW's loss turned out to be WWE's gain. The same year Undertaker left World Championship Wrestling, he got signed by WWE. After joining the company, it would be on November 22, 1990, that The Undertaker made his iconic debut. At Survivor Series, Ted DiBiase's Million Dollar Team took on Dusty Rhodes' Dream Team in a 4 on 4 elimination tag team match. DiBiase only announced three men for his team and promised to reveal the fourth at the pay-per-view. Once everyone was in the ring, the Million Dollar Man made his now iconic announcement. From Death Valley, I give you The Undertaker! <laughs> Accompanied by Brother Love, The Undertaker walked towards the ring for his first WWE match. The Phenom was chosen to start the match for his team, while another legend, Bret Hart, was selected for his. Bret tried running the ropes, but Undertaker caught him and started choking out the excellence of execution. Jim Neidhart then tagged in, but the dead man took him down with ease as well. Coco Beware then took a stab at The Undertaker, but to no avail. The demon from Death Valley quickly grabbed Coco and hit the first ever Tombstone Piledriver to pin the Birdman. Bret Hart then got back in the ring and actually managed to hit The Undertaker. Even after absorbing several blows to the face, Undertaker's expression didn't change a bit, although he did tag out of the match. When Taker became the legal man again, Dusty Rhodes was on the mat, so the Phenom hit a curb stomp to the shoulder? Anyways, Dusty quickly tagged in Bret Hart, but the dead man brought his A-game and took control of the hitman. The Phenom got a little offense in, but soon tagged out with Greg Valentine. However, Taker became the legal man again when Ted DiBiase was having trouble with Dusty Rhodes. The dead man took down the American Dream with a knee, and then got on the top rope and delivered a double axe handle. Undertaker pinned the Dream Team's captain, and was then attacked by Bret Hart. Like last time, the hitman's assault had no effect, and the dead man tagged back out. On the outside, Dusty Rhodes and Brother Love got into a tussle, which prompted The Undertaker to come to his manager's aid. This inadvertently got the Phenom disqualified via a countout, but The Undertaker didn't seem to care, and he and Dream brawled to the back. The match continued without Undertaker, and despite being eliminated, the dead man's team won after DiBiase pinned Bret Hart. Undertaker's debut is pretty iconic, but looking back, it's unique as well. How many wrestlers have debuted at Survivor Series and as part of a team? While Undertaker didn't spend a ton of time in the ring, I felt like it was a pretty good balance. It gave you an idea of what the Deadman was like, but left you wanting more. He also looked really strong, and having Undertaker get counted out prevented him from getting beaten, but also got him out of the match. Considering how people reacted to wrestlers like Roman Reigns, I kind of wonder how fans would respond if The Undertaker debuted like this today. In general though, I thought this was a great debut, and maybe one of the best I've seen since doing Bell to Bell. But let's see what The Undertaker did after Survivor Series. After debuting, The Undertaker mostly just competed in squash matches and racked up wins. In February 1991, the dead man got rid of Brother Love and would replace them with Paul Bearer. Not long after adding his iconic manager, The Undertaker competed in his first WrestleMania match on March 24th, 1991. The dead man defeated Jimmy Snuka, which was the start of Undertaker's legendary WrestleMania streak. After that, the Phenom had his first major feud with one of the WWE's biggest stars, The Ultimate Warrior. The two eventually went at it in a body bag match that Warrior won, which also made him the first person to defeat The Undertaker in a singles match. However, bigger things were just around the corner. Almost exactly a year after he made his debut, The Undertaker wrestled and defeated Hulk Hogan to win the WWE Championship at the 1991 Survivor Series. Due to Ric Flair's interference, a rematch was set up only six days later, where the Deadman lost the title. A little while after that, Undertaker turned face when he saved Macho Man and Miss Elizabeth from an attack by Jake Roberts. 
This was followed up by having The Undertaker feud with some of the biggest monsters in WWE at the time, including Kamala and Jack Gonzalez. In fact, Undertaker's last feud before he took a break was against Yokozuna. They faced off at the 1994 Royal Rumble in a casket match, which the 589 pound behemoth won by locking the dead man away. As the coffin was being pushed out, Undertaker appeared on the screen and warned that he'd be back. Number 9 in the top 10 scariest Undertaker moments. After a few months had gone by, The Undertaker returned, but this time under the control of Ted DiBiase. As time went on, we found out this Undertaker was an imposter. The real dead man returned at the 1984 SummerSlam and put the faker in his place. From there, Undertaker began a rivalry with Ted DiBiase and his million dollar corporation, and was usually the one who had his hand raised. In late 1995, Undertaker suffered an injury to his orbital bone and had to take some time off for surgery. When he returned, the Phenom wore a Phantom of the Opera style mask, but it only lasted for a few months. Undertaker's next legendary feud was with Mankind, who had just debuted in April of 1996. The deranged Mankind would interfere in Undertaker's matches, so the two faced off at a number of pay-per-views throughout 96. During their SummerSlam match, Paul Bearer betrayed the dead man and helped Mankind win the fight. This only added more fuel to the fire, and led to Undertaker defeating Mankind at In Your House 11 and the 1996 Survivor Series. After that, Undertaker sort of took a break from his rivalry with Mankind and Paul Bearer. This allowed him to pursue the WWE Championship again, which culminated at WrestleMania 13. In the main event, Undertaker took on Sid Vicious for the WWE title, and thanks to some help from Bret Hart, the Phenom won the championship for the second time in his career. This victory also put Undertaker's WrestleMania streak at 6-0, in case you were wondering. Undertaker held the goal until SummerSlam 1997, where special guest referee Shawn Michaels accidentally took out the dead man with a steel chair. This eventually led to The Undertaker and Shawn Michaels facing off in the first Hell in a Cell match. Of course, this moment is most famous for how it ended. During the match, the lights went black and out came Paul Bearer and a big red masked man called Kane. Kane, who in the storyline was Undertaker's half-brother, attacked his sibling and cost him the match. At first, Undertaker refused to fight the big red machine. However, after Kane locked Taker inside of a casket and set it on fire, the Phenom had a change of mind. The two wrestlers finally went one-on-one -on -one at WrestleMania, where Undertaker proved his superiority. With that over, the dead man reignited his old rivalry with Mankind. The two made history when they squared off at the 1998 King of the Ring in a Hell in a Cell match. The entire thing is amazing, but the moment that is most remembered is when Undertaker threw Mankind off Hell in a Cell. Number 3 on the top 10 scariest Undertaker moments. That match was pretty much the climax of Mankind and Undertaker's rivalry, so the dead man went on to feud with Stone Cold for the WWE Championship. The plot thickened when it was revealed that The Undertaker was now working with his former enemy, Kane. Despite having the Big Red Machine on his team, Undertaker was unable to win the WWE title. The alliance with Kane ultimately ended when Undertaker turned on his brother with the help of Paul Bearer. This meant that Taker and Bearer were back together and the Phenom was a villain again. This set up the Undertaker's Ministry of Darkness phase where he was sort of a cult leader that performed sacrifices and rituals. While the faction wasn't around for too long, it did create some of The Undertaker's most well-known moments, like the Black Wedding with Stephanie McMahon and the reveal of the Higher Power. Also, during this period, The Undertaker would wrestle and defeat Stone Cold to win the WWE Championship. However, in September 1999, Undertaker, in storyline, walked away from the company and wouldn't be seen for months. The reason for this was to allow the dead man to heal from a groin injury. He finally came back in May of 2000, and with a new biker character, and at the same time, turned face. Upon his return, Undertaker feuded with the McMahon-Helmsley faction, and successfully defeated Triple H, Shane, and Vince McMahon at the King of the Ring, alongside The Rock and Kane. From there, Undertaker once again started chasing after the WWE Championship. Unfortunately, the dead man's attempts were unsuccessful, but he did create this awesome moment at Armageddon. With no luck in the singles department, Undertaker reunited with Kane as the Brothers of Destruction. The two men went on to win their first tag team championship together when they beat Edge and Christian in April 2001, only to lose the belts to Triple H and Stone Cold a week and a half later. However, things weren't all bad for the Brothers, as they not only won the WWE tag team titles again, but also the WCW ones as well. 
Undertaker and Kane held on to their gold until September, but continued to tag together and even represented Team WWE at the Invasion pay-per-view. After that, not only were the two not teamed together for roughly five years, but Undertaker also turned heel. For the next several months, Undertaker had a number of shorter rivalries with people like Rob Van Dam, The Rock, Ric Flair, and Maven. When the WWE roster was split between Raw and SmackDown in 2002, Undertaker got drafted to the Raw brand. Things actually went pretty well for the Dead Man, as he won his fourth and final WWE Championship at Judgment Day by defeating Hulk Hogan. He held the title for a respectable 63 days before being beaten by The Rock. Not long after that, Undertaker would be traded from Raw to SmackDown, where he stayed for the entirety of the original brand split. On The Blue Show, Taker had some really great matches with younger talents such as Brock Lesnar, John Cena, and Kurt Angle. A key moment in Undertaker's career happened in November 2003, fittingly enough at Survivor Series. The Undertaker took on Vince McMahon in a Buried Alive match after the chairman of WWE interfered in the Dead Man's bout at No Mercy. The Phenom looked to have the match in the bag until Kane interfered and buried his brother alive. Undertaker wouldn't be heard from for months until he finally returned at WrestleMania 20. However, he was back to being the Dead Man again and also had Paul Bearer back as his manager. In the end, The Undertaker defeated Kane for a second time at WrestleMania and the streak was now sitting at a clean 12-0. The next major rivalry Undertaker had was against JBL for the WWE Championship. They faced off several times in 2004, but the champion always managed to retain, usually either by disqualification or interference. Undertaker's next storyline was with Randy Orton, who looked to live up to his legend killer name by beating The Undertaker at WrestleMania. Of course, that didn't happen, but the rivalry didn't end after Mania. Orton challenged Undertaker to a rematch at SummerSlam, and the future Apex Predator won. The feud continued for the rest of the year, and ultimately concluded in a Hell in a Cell match, where Undertaker proved why he's a legend. For the next year or so, the Phenom would have a number of rivalries with a range of wrestlers, from Kurt Angle to Great Khali, to MVP and Mr. Kennedy. It wasn't until 2007 that Undertaker's career had a big resurgence, as he won the Royal Rumble match and defeated Batista for the World Heavyweight Championship at WrestleMania 23. The rivalry continued well after Mania though. The two wrestled in multiple matches that were so brutal they often ended in a draw. In fact, after one particular match on SmackDown, Edge cashed in his Money in the Bank contract to challenge and beat the Dead Man for the World Heavyweight title. This planted the seeds for the feud Undertaker and the Radar Superstar would have in 2008. At the Elimination Chamber pay-per-view, Undertaker won his match, which made him the number one contender for Edge's world title at WrestleMania 24. Like last year, Undertaker not only walked away with the gold, but also another win in his streak, putting him at 16-0. Sadly, the title was stripped from the Phenom on May 2nd, 2008 by the SmackDown General Manager, Vicky Guerrero. Even without the championship, Undertaker and Edge still feuded, and the rivalry ultimately concluded at SummerSlam in a spectacular Hell in a Cell match. Like before, after his storyline with Edge wrapped, Undertaker had several smaller feuds until things got rolling again. In early 2009, Shawn Michaels earned the right to face Undertaker at WrestleMania 25. The match is a classic, and one of the best matches in WWE history. People were on the edge of their seats, wondering if HBK was going to do it, but the dead man managed to keep his undefeated streak alive. It was such a great match, it happened again at next year's WrestleMania, but this time with Shawn Michaels' career on the line. No matter how much Michaels wanted to win, it wasn't enough and the dead man put an end to the career of the showstopper. For eight years, at least. After that, a storyline developed where Undertaker was found in a, quote, vegetative state, and was absent from WWE for a while. Kane furiously looked for the individual who attacked his brother, but once Undertaker returned, it turned out the big red machine was the perpetrator all along. This set up a no-holds-barred match at Night of Champions 2010, where Kane successfully defeated Undertaker. Shortly after the defeat, Paul Bearer returned as Undertaker's manager, only to turn on the Phenom during his rematch with Kane at Hell in a Cell. After two defeats, Undertaker challenged Kane to a third and final match at Bragging Rights, which was fittingly a Buried Alive match. Thanks to interference from the Nexus, Kane was able to win and avenge his two WrestleMania defeats with three consecutive wins over his brother. This marked the end of Undertaker's run as a full-time wrestler. For the next three years, Undertaker almost exclusively wrestled at WrestleMania. 
During that time, he defeated Triple H twice and CM Punk once, putting his undefeated streak at 21-0. However, the unthinkable was about to happen. On February 24, 2014, Undertaker returned and accepted Brock Lesnar's open challenge for a match at WrestleMania. The two fought for over 25 minutes, but after enduring three F5s, the dead man couldn't take it anymore, and Brock Lesnar pinned him and ended the streak. It's arguably the most shocking moment in WWE history, and while Undertaker would continue to compete at WrestleMania, his matches at the biggest show of the year felt a bit different without the streak. For the next six years, Undertaker's career stayed fairly consistent. He would usually return for WrestleMania and maybe wrestle a few additional matches here and there. However, even a dead man has to retire sometime. The beginning of the end of The Undertaker's career began at the 2020 Super Showdown. During a gauntlet match, Undertaker appeared as a surprise final participant and defeated AJ Styles. After the loss, the Phenomenal One began taunting The Undertaker and would later start using The Undertaker's real name and targeting his wife, Michelle McCool. Undertaker responded and agreed to face Styles at WrestleMania. With everything set, Undertaker geared up for the final match of his career. Over 29 years after his first WWE match, Undertaker got set to wrestle his last at WrestleMania 36. This time though, it took place inside a cemetery in what was called a boneyard match. It began with a hearse pulling into the graveyard. When the vehicle stopped, two druids emerged and pulled out a casket. Inside was the un AJ Styles. The phenomenal one taunted the Undertaker as Styles and the viewers waited for the dead man's arrival. Taking inspiration from one of his past personas, Undertaker rode in on a bike and was all business. The demon from Death Valley immediately wiped AJ's smile off his face and smacked him all over the cemetery. The fight found its way to the hearse, which Undertaker used as a weapon against Styles. The Phenom and the Phenomenal One took things to the roof of the car, where Taker continued to pummel AJ Styles. To take control of the match, AJ threw some dirt into the dead man's eyes and low blowed him. Now that his opponent was down, Styles led Undertaker to the grave he had prepared for the Phenom. Taker wasn't going to go out that easily, and knocked AJ down and dropped him into the grave instead. Before Undertaker could do anything, AJ's buddies, Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson, appeared. They brought with them a small army of druids, who then surrounded the dead man. Undertaker fought off the black cloaked men, but was quickly ambushed by Gallows and Anderson. Unfortunately for the OC, Taker still had fight in him, and fought off both men. Once Gallows and Anderson were taken care of, AJ Styles came back and smashed a tombstone over Undertaker's back. AJ continued wailing on Undertaker, even breaking his own finger. However, Styles did let the Phenom get up, only to knock him back down. At this point, it was clear that the Undertaker was hurt, and it looked like the match was over. The nail in the coffin came when AJ Styles broke a shovel over the dead man's back and sent him plummeting into the open grave. It seemed like the Undertaker was finished. But right before Styles dropped the dirt, the Phenom used his powers to appear behind AJ, and you can probably guess what happened next. A fully revived Undertaker began beating Styles and chased him onto the roof. Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson tried to intervene, but the dead man was unstoppable. Taker threw Gallows off the building and Tombstone pile drived Anderson. AJ tried to fight back, but just like Bret Hart in 1990, Styles' attacks had no effect on the Undertaker. With no one to interfere and nowhere to go, the dead man wrapped his hand around the Phenomenal One's throat and sent him flying with a choke slam. Undertaker then carried AJ's body to the grave and had a little talk with his opponent. At first, it seemed like the Undertaker was going to show Styles some mercy, but come on. Taker used a big boot to push AJ Styles into the grave and then buried him alive. With his work done, Undertaker got on his bike, raised his fists, and rode off into the night. Of course, this match is way different than any of Undertaker's previous ones. This falls under the cinematic match category, and I think it's one of the best WWE's ever done. I felt like the camera angles, the music, lighting, and special effects made the match better. For example, Undertaker spends a decent amount of time talking to AJ, and the music definitely helps make it feel more dramatic. The only thing I didn't really like was when Gallows and Anderson brought out the druids. It just felt a little too weird and strange. I know that Undertaker did similar stuff, like when he just warped from the grave and whatnot, but we've seen Undertaker do supernatural stuff for decades. 
having the druids come out just felt like they were taking a little too much liberty with the cinematic match setting. Plus, Undertaker literally just went around and punched the druids one by one. They didn't even look like they were trying to attack him. However, this is just one moment, and I don't think it hurts the match a ton. Like I said, I thought this was one of WWE's better cinematic matches, and it's a really cool way for The Undertaker to retire. Speaking of which, we originally didn't know that this was going to be Undertaker's last match, so let's see what happened afterward. Sometime after WrestleMania, WWE released a documentary series on The Undertaker called The Last Ride. The whole thing was great to watch, but the big moment was at the end, when Undertaker announced he was retiring. However, it really settled in at Survivor Series. On November 22, 2020, exactly 30 years after Undertaker wrestled his first WWE match, the dead man gave his farewell speech and officially put his career to rest. Even though you won't be wrestling, Undertaker will still be part of WWE, but likely in a behind the scenes type role. For myself and a lot of other fans, Undertaker has always been there, so it's massive to have him gone. Before he was the game, Triple H was a kid from the small city of Nashua, New Hampshire called Paul Levesque. He became hooked on wrestling at an early age and took up bodybuilding at 14 years old so he could look like the wrestlers he saw on TV. During that time, the gang was working at a gym and met Ted Arcidi, a world champion powerlifter who also briefly wrestled in WWE in the mid 80s. Arcidi knew the legendary Killer Kowalski, one of the most feared and respected wrestlers of the 50s and 60s. Eventually, Ted Arcidi agreed to introduce Triple H to Kowalski, who began training the future WWE star in early 1990. During this time, the Camp Kings also trained with future WWE stars Perry Saturn and China. Triple H had his first wrestling match in 1992 at a show Killer Kowalski was running. Kowalski wanted his student to be called the Terrorizer, but Triple H didn't like it. They ultimately settled on the name Terra Rising. Triple H was impressive from the start, and not long after his first match, the game would be signed by WCW. He continued to call himself Terra Rising, but it wasn't quite working. The Camp Kings decided to change and became Jean-Paul Levesque, a snobby upper-class Frenchman. While it didn't make him famous, the character change did give Triple H more screen time. Later on, Triple H was paired with Lord Steven Regal, a wrestler who had become a lifelong friend. While it seemed like a good pairing, the game wasn't happy with his role in the company. He met with Vince McMahon, and after seeing Triple H's match in the 1994 Starcade pay-per-view, McMahon offered the Cerebral Assassin a WWE contract. In a rare move, Triple H essentially kept his WCW character intact when he joined WWE. While he was no longer French, he continued playing an aristocratic character who was from Greenwich, Connecticut. Triple H would also change his name to Hunter Hearst Helmsley. After weeks of promo videos, the game competed in his first WWE match on April 30th, 1995. Triple H's first opponent was a wrestler named Buck Zumhoff, who would later be sentenced to 25 years in prison for criminal sexual misconduct. Yikes. As the game walked to the ring, he held a cane and had a disdainful look on his face. The commentator said that Triple H was here to bring civility and class to the WWE. Once the match started, the Camp Kings gave Zumhoff a waistlock takedown. Zumhoff quickly got out of it and taunted the newcomer. When the two locked up again, they exchanged wrist locks until Triple H landed a closed fist right hand, knocking down the veteran. With his opponent on the mat, the Cerebral Assassin stomped away at Buck Zumhoff and then picked him back up and connected with a European uppercut. Soon after that, Triple H surprisingly broke out a spinning heel kick. The game felt kind of cocky, which gave Zumhoff an opportunity to make a comeback. Buck was going to try and hit a hip toss, but Triple H struck with an RKO from out of nowhere. The referee counted to three, and Triple H had won his debut match. From start to finish, the fight was about two minutes long. We didn't get to see much of Triple H's moveset, but it is crazy to see him hit a spinning heel kick and a cutter. The match did, however, introduce fans to the Hunter Hearst Helmsley character, and over the next few shows, we'd get more acquainted with them. After his first match, Triple H continued defeating enhancement talent. Finally, in October 1985, the game had his first rivalry with a farmer character called Henry O'Godwin. It started when the two fought to a draw on Raw, the first time Triple H didn't win a one-on-one -on -one match in WWE. This led to a rematch at the In Your House 5 pay-per-view, where the game and Godwin fought in an Arkansas hog pen match. Triple H picked up the victory by back body dropping Henry O'Godwin into a hog pen filled with actual pigs. The thrill of the victory is short-lived though, as the special guest referee, Hillbilly Jim, threw the Camp Kings into the pig pen too, where he was covered in manure. After feuding with a farmer, Triple H would have a rivalry with a garbage man named Duke the Dumpster Drozzy. They fought at the 1996 Royal Rumble, where the game knocked out Drozzy with brass knucks. 
only to have the decision reversed by WWE President Gorilla Monsoon. While Triple H got his revenge against the dumpster by defeating him at In Your House 6, things were about to get a lot worse for the King of Kings. The Ultimate Warrior had recently returned to WWE, and the company was eager to feature him at that year's WrestleMania. Originally, the match between the Warrior and Triple H was supposed to be competitive, but Warrior had other ideas. Since he was a legend, the Ultimate Warrior decided he wanted to defeat Triple H in less than two minutes at WrestleMania. Not only that, but Warrior also decided not to sell Triple H's finisher, the Pedigree. The game was still a newbie and had to go along with it, and ended up losing in spectacular fashion in his first WrestleMania match. Even with the setback, WWE still had big plans for Triple H. He was rumored to win that year's King of the Ring tournament, but in May of 1996, his career took a surprising setback. Triple H was real life friends with Shawn Michaels, Kevin Nash, and Scott Hall. Hall and Nash decided to leave WWE and go to WCW, and in their final night in WWE, the entire group broke character and hugged in the ring. People backstage were livid, but since Kevin Nash and Scott Hall were gone, and since Shawn Michaels was WWE's biggest star, only Triple H could be punished. In the King of the Ring tournament, Hunter ended up losing to Jake the Snake, but it didn't end there. The game's career continued to stall, as he was left without any major storylines. Finally, WWE management felt that Triple H had served his punishment and briefly paired him with Mr. Perfect. Together, they schemed their way into the game capturing his first WWE title against Mark Marrow on Raw, the Intercontinental Championship. However, in a sign of things to come, Triple H lost the title to a young rock on Raw in early 1997. Even with the loss, fans continued to look up for the Cerebral Assassin. On the following episode of Raw, one of the most pivotal moments of his career would happen. While wrestling a match against Goldust, Triple H's real-life girlfriend, China, emerged from the crowd and manhandled Goldust manager, Marlena. This led to China becoming Triple H's bodyguard, and not only that, but the King of Kings would also defeat the Bizarre One at WrestleMania 13. The momentum continued, as Triple H finally got his King of the Ring victory after picking up wins in the tournament against Crush, Ahmed Johnson, and another soon-to-be major rival, Mankind. The game's career rose to another level that year, as he dropped his aristocratic character and embraced the role of a degenerate. This is pretty ironic, since this is exactly what he didn't want to see in the WWE when he debuted in 1995. Triple H and Shawn Michaels, along with China, Rick Rude, and later on, Billy Gunn and the Road Dog, aligned to create D-Generation X. During this time, the name Hunter Hearst Helmsley went away, and he'd be officially known as Triple H. As a member of DX, the group set their sights on the Hart Foundation. Bret Hart had been critical of Triple H and HBK's over-the-top language and sexual references. The battle culminated in the infamous Montreal Screwjob at the 1997 Survivor Series. Hart ended up losing the WWE Championship to Shawn Michaels, despite the fact he never tapped out. Bret left WWE after that match, but even with him out of the company, Triple H wasn't done with the Hart Foundation just yet. A couple of weeks later on Raw, DX had a little person betray Hart. Later that same night, Triple H beat up former Hart Foundation member Jim Neidhart after DX briefly formed an alliance with them. This embarrassment and betrayal of Neidhart led to WWE Commissioner Sergeant Slaughter getting involved. This set up a match between Triple H and Slaughter at the D-Generation X In Your House pay-per-view that the game won. After that, Triple H began feuding with Owen Hart over the European Championship, leading to a match at WrestleMania 14. Per the stipulation, China was handcuffed to Sergeant Slaughter, but that proved pretty ineffective as she was still able to interfere and help give the King of Kings the victory. Triple H and Hart faced off once again at Unforgiven in your house, where the game successfully retained his championship. Triple H and Owen Hart's rivalry wasn't over, as Hart joined up with the Nation of Domination. This resulted in a battle between DX and the Nation, and Hart was finally able to defeat Triple H in a 3-on-3 tag team match. Not only that, but around the same time, Triple H would lose the European Championship to another member of the Nation of Domination, D'Lo Brown. After a fuse with Owen Hart and Brown, the next person Triple H would feud with was the leader of the Nation, The Rock. At the fully loaded pay-per-view, the two battled to a time limit draw in a best 2 out of 3 falls match for the IC Championship. At the next pay-per-view, SummerSlam, Triple H and The Rock delivered an awesome ladder match. The fight saw Triple H become a two-time Intercontinental Champion after China gave Rock a low blow while he was climbing the ladder. Unfortunately, Triple H suffered a knee injury shortly after that and had to vacate the title. 
After returning to the ring, the game received a big moment at the 1999 Royal Rumble. In the final moments of the match, it looked like Triple H had won, only to be thrown out by Vince McMahon, who was then thrown out by China. Things got even worse for the Camp Kings when China betrayed them the following day to join the corporation. The real-life couple faced off on opposing sides at St. Valentine's Day Massacre, with the Cerebral Assassin teaming up with fellow DX member X-Pac and Kane joining China's side. Even though Triple H's team took the loss, he was soon reunited with the Ninth Wonder of the World at WrestleMania 15. China turned on Kane by hitting him with a chair, allowing Triple H to hit the pedigree. The power couple was back together, and later that night, Triple H betrayed X-Pac by helping Shane McMahon defeat him. At the 1999 Backlash, the Cerebral Assassin defeated X-Pac and set his sights on The Rock once again. Triple H threw the Great One off the Raw stage, breaking Rock's arm in the process. The two competed in several one-on-one -on -one matches over the next few months. At the 1999 fully loaded pay-per-view, Triple H defeated the Brahma Bowl in a strap match, making the game the number one contender for the WWE Championship. This ultimately led to a triple threat match at SummerSlam between Triple H, Mankind, and the WWE Champion, Stone Cold Steve Austin. The match ended with Mankind paying Steve Austin to become the new champion. However, the next night, Triple H challenged Mankind for the title and won. It was one of the biggest moments of Triple H's career, but his first reign as WWE Champion was kind of weird. Less than a month after winning the title, he lost it to Vince McMahon, only to then win it back in a six-pack challenge at Unforgiven. Triple H got a huge win when he beat Steve Austin to retain the WWE Championship, even if it was because The Rock accidentally hit Stone Cold with a sledgehammer. After that, Triple H would face the Brahma Bull as well as the Big Show in a triple threat match at Survivor Series. In a shocking twist, Big Show won the match, and Triple H was once again without any gold. This wasn't a downgrade though, as the game took part in one of the biggest storylines of the Attitude Era. For months, Test and Stephanie McMahon had been an on-air couple. The two were set to get married on an episode of Raw, but right before the couple could say their I do's, they were interrupted by Triple H. The game dropped a shocking revelation that he was actually married to Stephanie McMahon. The King of Kings admitted to paying a bartender to spike Stephanie's drink, where he then kidnapped her, drove her to a Las Vegas chapel, and mimicked her voice to say, I do. However, it was eventually revealed that Stephanie was in on it the whole time. This came to light when she helped her husband defeat Vince McMahon at the Armageddon pay-per-view. This was also the start of the McMahon-Helmsley era. At the start of 2000, Triple H would become a major star. He defeated Big Show to win back the WWE Championship and then defeated Cactus Jack at the Royal Rumble. At WrestleMania, Triple H defended his title in a four-way elimination match and won, making him the first heel or villain to win the main event of WrestleMania. While The Rock would take the title at Backlash, the Cerebral Assassin won it back at Judgment Day 2000 in a 60-minute Iron Man match. Once again, Triple H's fourth championship reign was brief, just lasting over a month. The Rock once again won the gold after pinning Vince McMahon in a six-man tag team match at the King of the Ring. After this, Triple H would stay out of the title scene for a while. In the meantime, the game had an entertaining rivalry with Chris Jericho that saw the Camp Kings defeat Y2J in a last man standing match at the fully loaded pay-per-view. After that, Triple H would feud with Kurt Angle, which evolved into a love triangle with Stephanie McMahon. Ultimately, Steph stood by her husband and helped Triple H defeat Kurt Angle at Unforgiven. Meanwhile, Stone Cold Steve Austin returned to action after being hit by a car. Infamously, it was Rikishi who drove the car, but it was later revealed that Triple H had paid him to do it. Austin wasn't going to let this slide, and the Texas Rattlesnake lifted Triple H's car with a forklift and dropped it with the game inside. Triple H somehow survived and returned a few weeks later. To settle the score, they battled in a three stages of hell match at No Way Out, with Triple H winning 2-1. After settling things with Stone Cold, Triple H battled The Undertaker at WrestleMania 17. Taker beat Triple H, but this was just the beginning of their rivalry. At the same event, Stone Cold joined up with Vince McMahon. This caused him and Triple H to become tag team partners on the Raw after WrestleMania. Known as the two-man power trip, the duo set out to hold every championship. Triple H picked up the Intercontinental title, and he and Steve Austin soon also won the tag team championship. However, while the two-man power trip was defending their titles, Triple H would injure his leg. This was a serious injury, and Triple H would not be seen for the rest of the year. After eight months of recovering, the game was ready to make a comeback. He returned on the first Raw of 2002 and then won the Royal Rumble match. 
Everything was going great, but his on-screen marriage with Stephanie was falling apart. She faked a pregnancy, and when Triple H found out, he dumped his wife during their wedding vows. This caused Stephanie to allow Triple H's WrestleMania opponent, the undisputed WWE Champion, Chris Jericho. At the event, Triple H got a sweet revenge and won his fifth WWE Championship. Unfortunately, like his other title reigns, it was short-lived. At the next pay-per-view, Backlash, Triple H lost the title to Hulk Hogan, who had recently returned. Around the same time, another major star made his return as well, Shawn Michaels. Triple H and HBK teased a DX reunion, only for Triple H to brutally attack Michaels. The former DX teammates faced off at SummerSlam in an unsanctioned street fight. While Shawn Michaels picked up the victory, he was left lying after the King of Kings attacked him with a sledgehammer. Around this time, Raw and SmackDown were split into two separate brands with their own rosters and champions. The WWE title went to SmackDown, which left Raw without a world champion. In a controversial move, Eric Bischoff just handed the World Heavyweight Championship to Triple H. The game's first challenger for the gold was Rob Van Dam, who couldn't beat the game at Unforgiven. What happened next continues to live on in wrestling infamy. Intercontinental Champion Kane and Triple H kicked off a feud revolving around the death of Kane's girlfriend, Katie Vick. The game blamed Katie Vick's death on Kane and did some other things too. Mercifully, the storyline ended with Triple H winning at No Mercy, unifying the World Heavyweight and Intercontinental Championships. Triple H's reign of terror hit a slight bump when he lost the world title to Shawn Michaels in the first Elimination Chamber match. HBK's tail run was short-lived though, as the Cerebral Assassin regained the gold at Armageddon a month later. To continue his reign over Raw, Triple H enlisted some help to form the most dominant stable of the era, Evolution, featuring the legend Ric Flair, star in the making Randy Orton, and the muscle Batista. A series of challengers emerged with the King of Kings battling Booker T at WrestleMania 19. The angle was controversial as it seemed to incorporate racism into the storyline. It didn't help either that Triple H defeated Booker T and retained his championship. Tripp's next challenger was Goldberg, who debuted the night after WrestleMania. Goldberg appeared to be Triple H's kryptonite as he ended the game's world title reign at Unforgiven. I say appeared because Triple H won the title back at Armageddon. Soon after, Chris Benoit won the Royal Rumble and chose to challenge Triple H for the World Heavyweight Championship. The match ended up becoming a triple threat when Shawn Michaels was added in. All three men put on a very memorable match at WrestleMania 20 that saw Benoit force Triple H to tap out. The King of Kings tried to regain his title and employed the help of Eugene. Eugene ended up accidentally getting in the way, which angered Triple H. This set up a match at SummerSlam where the game defeated Eugene. At the same event, Randy Orton won the World Heavyweight Championship. This caused Triple H to betray Orton the next night. To add insult to injury, the game also beat Randy just a few weeks later for the title. Triple H would feud the likes of Shawn Michaels and Edge, but his next major opponent was ironically his own teammate, Batista. The Animal won the 2005 Royal Rumble and was deciding who he would fight. Batista overheard Ric Flair and Triple H scheming against him, causing the Animal to choose the game as his WrestleMania opponent. Not only would Triple H lose his World Heavyweight Championship to Batista, but he also lost their two rematches as well. After that, Triple H disappeared for a few months to heal from a neck injury. When he returned, the game reunited with Ric Flair. However, Triple H made his true intentions clear when he attacked the Nature Boy. The former Evolution teammates squared off in a last man standing match at Survivor Series, which Triple H won. Riding that momentum, the Cerebral Assassin won a tournament that meant he would challenge the WWE Champion, John Cena, at WrestleMania. However, for a third year in a row, Triple H failed to win on the grandest stage of them all. After being a serious bad guy, Triple H decided to change things up. He reunited with Shawn Michaels and brought back DX. They feuded with Vince and Shane McMahon, as well as the Spirit Squad, which was filled with D-Generation X's trademark humor. H and Michaels would need to get serious though when they crossed paths with Randy Orton and Edge. They had some good matches, but unfortunately, the rivalry came to an abrupt stop when Triple H tore his quad again during a match. Like in 2001, this kept the game on the sideline for several months. He made his return at the 2007 SummerSlam, where he defeated his former rival, Booker T. Then, two months after that, Triple H would be given a WWE Championship match against Randy Orton at the start of the No Mercy pay-per-view. The game won, but he had to defend the title against Umaga later that night. Triple H won that match as well, but had to face off against Randy Orton in the main event. This was the breaking point, and Triple H lost the title back to Orton. However, Triple H finally got another shot after winning an Elimination Chamber match at the 2008 No Way Out pay-per-view. This put him in a WWE Championship match involving John Cena and Randy Orton. Once again, the Cerebral Assassin failed to win the big one at WrestleMania. 
However, things finally got back on track for the game as he won the WWE Championship in a Fatal 4-Way match at Backlash. This caused his feud to be reignited with Randy Orton. The two fought in two pay-per-view matches with the King of Kings having his hand raised both times. From there, Triple H had title defenses against opponents like the Great Khali, Vladimir Kozlov, and Jeff Hardy. In the end, the game lost the WWE Championship to Edge at Survivor Series. Like many times in the past, Triple H's time without the gold was temporary. He won the WWE Championship back in an Elimination Chamber match at No Way Out in 2009. At the same time, Randy Orton had won the Royal Rumble and was going after the McMahon family. The Viper attacked Shane McMahon and shockingly, Triple H's wife, Stephanie. Of course, this enraged the game and Orton challenged Triple H at WrestleMania 25. At the event, Triple H ended his losing streak and retained the WWE title. But the good times didn't last long, as Randy Orton got his revenge at Backlash in a six-man tag team match that awarded the Viper the WWE title. Soon after, Triple H got back with Shawn Michaels and reformed DX once again. Their main rivalry was with Cody Rhodes and Ted DiBiase, the Legacy. The teams battled three separate times, with Legacy winning one match and DX winning two. At the end of 2009, The Game and HBK challenged Chris Jericho and Big Show for the Unified World Tag Team Championship. DX won, but unfortunately, their title reign was short-lived, as they lost the belts in February 2010. Soon after, Triple H entered the Elimination Chamber for a third year in a row. He didn't win this time, but did eliminate the WWE Champion, Sheamus. The Celtic Warrior was upset and attacked the Cerebral Assassin afterward. The two decided to face off WrestleMania 26, where Triple H was supreme. Sheamus wasn't done yet though, and a rematch was set up for the next pay-per-view, Extreme Rules. This time, the Celtic Warrior got the better of the game and defeated him. After this loss, Triple H would be absent from WWE. The reason for this was to focus on becoming involved in the behind the scenes of the company. It wasn't until early 2011 that we'd see Triple H again. The game returned and wanted to avenge Shawn Michaels, who was forced to retire after losing to The Undertaker at last year's WrestleMania. The dead man accepted Triple H's challenge, but Trips wasn't able to defeat the Phenom. After being absent for a few months, the game returned as the COO of WWE. He told Vince McMahon that McMahon was relieved of his duties and re-signed CM Punk, whose contract had recently expired. Despite this, Triple H and Punk kept butting heads. It finally resulted in a match between them at Night of Champions that Triple H won. The celebration was short-lived as the WWE roster had a vote of no confidence in Triple H and the game had his authority taken away. In 2012, the Camp King's focus returned to The Undertaker. Triple H won one more shot at the Dead Man, and the two faced off in a Hell in a Cell match at WrestleMania 28. Even with Shawn Michaels as the guest referee, the former DX mates couldn't get the job done. Not long after that, Triple H would begin his next storyline with Brock Lesnar. The rivalry started when Lesnar broke the game's arm after Triple H refused to give in to Lesnar's contract demands. Once he was healed, the Camp Canes and the Beast fought it out for the first time at SummerSlam. Brock Lesnar would win that encounter, but Triple H wasn't done. Trips and Lesnar had a rematch at WrestleMania 29 that saw the game as the winner. The rivalry ended with one final match at Extreme Rules where Brock walked away victorious. A few months later, Triple H would begin a new faction called The Authority. It started when Triple H was the special guest referee for a match between Daniel Bryan and the WWE Champion, John Cena. Bryan won, but his victory was cut short when Triple H attacked him. This allowed Randy Orton to cash in his Money in the Bank contract and become the new WWE Champion. In addition to the Cerebral Assassin and the Viper, the group also included Stephanie McMahon and Kane. The Authority tried to hold Daniel Bryan down, but Bryan proved to be too resilient and defeated Triple H at WrestleMania 30 and captured the Heavyweight Championship later in the night. The Camp Canes had one more plan in mind to stop Bryan by reforming Evolution, but this quickly set off a feud with The Shield. H, Batista, and Orton weren't able to get the job done and lost to The Shield at Extreme Rules and Payback. However, as Triple H said, there's always a plan B. The game had secretly persuaded Rollins to join the Authority and betray Dean Ambrose and Roman Reigns. Triple H continued to lead his faction while also being a mentor to Rollins. However, there was a thorn in the game's side, Sting. The icon made his long-awaited debut in WWE and caused trouble for the Authority. This ultimately led to Triple H and Sting going one-on-one -on -one at WrestleMania 31. The game proved why he is that good and defeated the Stainer in the icon's first WWE match. 
For the rest of 2015, Triple H continued to appear regularly, but was mainly focused on helping Seth Rollins, who is now WWE Champion. Due to an unfortunate real-life injury, Seth had to vacate the WWE title. Roman Reigns ended up becoming the new champion, which angered the game. At the 2016 Royal Rumble, the 30-man match was turned into a title offense for Reigns. The Cerebral Assassin came out as a surprise final entrant and was able to eliminate Roman. This meant Triple H was the WWE Champion again, and this was also his 14th world title reign. The game and the Big Dog Clash at WrestleMania 32, where Triple H lost the WWE title back to Reigns. Following the defeat, Triple H would be absent for several months. He returned in August 2016 during a match for the Universal Championship. In a shocking twist, Triple H betrayed Seth Rollins and helped Kevin Owens win the title. This began a slow building rivalry which resulted in Rollins and Triple H fighting at WrestleMania 33. The Cerebral Assassin locked up with his former protege but couldn't beat Rollins and Triple H took the L again at WrestleMania. For the next couple of years, Triple H would continue to appear sporadically. He mainly would show up for big matches, like teaming up with Stephanie McMahon against Ronda Rousey and Kurt Angle at WrestleMania 34, fighting John Cena at the Greatest Royal Rumble, or reuniting with Shawn Michaels to take on Undertaker and Kane. The game's last big rivalry was with his old friend and rival, Batista. Now a major movie star, the animal is dead set on facing Triple H again. Batista made a statement by attacking Ric Flair before the Nature Boy's birthday celebration. The game had no choice but to accept the challenge, resulting in a match at WrestleMania 35. The match was nearly 25 minutes long and featured some brutal moments. Thanks to help from Ric Flair, Triple H was able to defeat Batista and end the night with his hand held high. Ironically, not long after defeating one former Evolution teammate, Triple H would wrestle another, Randy Orton. It was announced that the two would clash at Super Showdown in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. It wasn't clear at the time, but this would be the game's last match in WWE. Randy Orton was the first to enter. His entrance was pretty tame in comparison to Triple H's. The Cerebral Assassin rode a custom motorcycle down the entrance ramp, which was practically complete opposite of how his original character in 1995 would enter. Once Triple H got inside the ropes, the bell rang and the game and the Viper sized each other up. The fight began with the two locking up and exchanging wrist locks. It was a very methodical start until H connected with a shoulder tackle. Both men went for their finishing moves early on, only to escape the holds. Shortly after that, Orton connected with his first offensive move by knocking the game down with a right hand. Orton took over offense and worked away at Triple H in the corner. The King of Canes quickly turned things around by sending the Viper crashing into the ring post. Triple H continued to attack Randy, and the fight spilled to the outside of the ring. The Cerebral Assassin began using the ring and surrounding environment to inflict the most damage he could on his opponent. Finally, Orton made a move out of desperation by back body dropping the game onto the announcer's table. The Apex Predator used Triple H's own strategy against him by whipping the game into the steel steps. The match got back inside the ring, where Orton stomped away at Triple H's defenseless body. Triple H managed to fight out of an extended headlock, but was hit with a clothesline and sent right back down to the mat. Orton put on another side headlock, but H broke free and the two began exchanging punches. Triple H got the advantage when he hit his signature high knee. The King of Kings followed up with a clothesline and knee facebreaker. He then attempted another pedigree, but the Viper countered with a catapult into the corner. Triple H stopped Orton's momentum with a high knee and again went for a pedigree. Randy Orton prevented it and got Triple H on the ring apron, where he hit the King of Kings with a dropkick. The Apex Predator got Triple H on the top turnbuckle, only to be thrown back down to the mat and clotheslined from behind. As Randy struggled to get back up, he was taunted by Triple H doing the crotch chop, which backfired as the Viper landed a power slam. Triple H crawled back to the edge of the ring, which turned out to be a bad move as the Viper caught him with a DDT. In full control, Orton coiled up, calling for the RKO, but this taunting also backfired, allowing Triple H to hit a spine buster. The two went back to the mat, with the game locking in a crossface. Randy spent over a minute in the hold until finally getting the rope break. The two got on their feet, and Orton was about to hit the RKO, but Triple H caught him and tried to hit a pedigree. The Viper then attempted the RKO a second time and hit it. The Apex Predator went for the cover, but Triple H kicked out. Orton showed frustration after not picking up the win, causing him to set up the punt kick. Luckily for Triple H, he caught the kick and hit the pedigree. However, Randy Orton kicked out of the Cerebral Assassin's finisher. An exhausted Viper rolled to the outside, with Triple H following. Orton tried to hit another back body drop on the announcer's table, only for H to reverse the move and hit Orton with four back body drops in a row. The King of Canes played to the crowd and looked to be in full control. 
When he got back inside the squared circle, he charged at his former protege, but was quickly met with an RKO from out of nowhere, allowing Orton to finally get the pin. For a final opponent, it's hard to have a better choice for Triple H than Randy Orton. Of the entire WWE roster, the Viper was the wrestler who had the most history with the game, dating back to over 15 years earlier with the formation of Evolution. The two battled in many big matches and defeated each other for world titles. One last round featuring the two seems like the ideal last battle for the King of Kings. It's also kind of interesting that Triple H's first WWE match ended with a cutter, and so did his last. While Triple H has made appearances on TV since this match, it seems unlikely we'll see him wrestle again. He underwent serious heart surgery in September 2021. During Triple H's recovery, his role backstage was greatly reduced, so it's hard to imagine him being in good enough health to compete. Never say never, but it seems like Randy Orton will end up being the final opponent for Triple H. Before he was Stone Cold Steve Austin, the Texas Rattlesnake was Stephen James Williams. When he was 7 or 8 years old, Austin accidentally discovered wrestling while changing channels on his TV. Instantly, the Rattlesnake was hooked and knew what he wanted to do. Stone Cold continued to watch wrestling as he grew older and finally got a chance to step into the ring when he found a school in Dallas, Texas, run by a man named Gentleman Chris Adams. The Rattlesnake struggled when he began training, but he didn't quit. Soon, he began competing in the ring using his real name, Steve Williams. However, there was another wrestler with the same name, Dr. Death Steve Williams. Stone Cold had to change his name, so he ended up going with Steve Austin, which is what he'd be called for for the rest of his career. Soon, Austin got the opportunity to wrestle in WCW, where he called himself Stunning Steve Austin. He had a solid run, winning several championships and forming a tag team called the Hollywood Blondes with Brian Pillman. However, in 1995, Austin would be fired, infamously finding out when he got a letter via FedEx. With his WCW career behind him, Stone Cold would head to ECW. While in the land of extreme, Steve Austin began to develop the rebellious, loudmouth character he would use in WWE. Speaking of WWE, that's where Austin would head to next. In January 1996, Ted DiBiase said he found someone that could wear the Million Dollar Championship. That person ended up being Stone Cold Steve Austin, or as he was called at the time, the Ringmaster. After the glowing introduction, Austin would compete in his first WWE match the next week. With the Million Dollar Championship around his waist and Ted DiBiase accompanying him, Steve Austin was prepared to take on his debut opponent, a young Matt Hardy. Once they locked up, Stone Cold took down Hardy with ease. The Rattlesnake's first offensive move was the Luthez Press and Punches, which had become a signature move of Stone Cold's. Austin then hit Hardy with a back body drop, followed by several chops and punches in the corner. The Rattlesnake's assault continued with a move that kind of resembled Austin's iconic pointed elbow. Matt Hardy tried him out of comeback back, but Steve Austin responded with a gorid buster. Stone Cold went for the pin, but changed his mind and wanted the match to continue. That was a mistake, as Hardy dodged a running knee and started hitting the rattlesnake with fists. Austin, though, ended his opponent's rampage by throwing him into the ropes and then locking in the Million Dollar Dream sleeper hold. Matt Hardy quickly passed out, and Steve, the Ringmaster Austin, was awarded the victory. Technically, the match was just a squash, but it seemed to have a bit more to it, which was appreciated. The craziest part though is that Matt Hardy was Steve Austin's debut opponent in WWE. While Austin debuted as the ringmaster, that name didn't last long. In real life, Steve Austin didn't like his character and decided to shave off his hair and grow a goatee. He also developed a new persona based on a serial killer named Richard Kuklinski, whose nickname was the Iceman. Along with these changes, Austin would also change his ring name to Stone Cold Steve Austin, only about two months after his first WWE match. The ringmaster name would still be referenced, but it soon faded away. Anyways, Stone Cold's first feud was with Savio Vega. They fought on Raw, with the match ending in a double countout. They had a rematch at WrestleMania 12, which Stone Cold won. However, Austin lose their third match at the following pay-per-view. The Rattlesnake and Vega had a fourth fight, with the ad stipulation that if Steve Austin lost, then Ted DiBiase would be forced to quit WWE. Stone Cold did lose, which ended his alliance with DiBiase. While this seemed like a setback, Austin's career was about to be taken to the next level. Steve Austin won the 1996 King of the Ring tournament by defeating Jake the Snake Roberts in the final round. Roberts was playing a born-again Christian character at the time, so Austin ad-libbed this famous line. Talk about your psalms, talk about John 316. Austin 316 says I just whipped your ass.
This line creates Stone Cold's iconic 316 catchphrase and helped push him as one of WWE's biggest stars. The Texas Rattlesnake was still a heel or bad guy at this point, and this was reflected over the next few months. Stone Cold would taunt Bret Hart, who was out of action. Once Bret returned, he accepted Steve Austin's challenge, setting up a match between them at Survivor Series. In the lead up, Brian Pillman was interviewing Steve Austin and inadvertently complimented the hitman, causing Stone Cold to attack Pillman and break his ankle. Later, Pillman was doing an interview from his home while recovering from the injury. Stone Cold would break in, leading to Brian Pillman pointing a gun at Steve Austin. This was a very controversial segment and became known as Pillman's Got a Gun. While there was some backlash because of it, the segment didn't hurt Stone Cold's career. If anything, it did the opposite. At the 1996 Survivor Series, Stone Cold finally got his match against Bret Hart. The winner of the match also got a WWE Championship match, so the stakes were extremely high. Despite all the trash talking Austin had done, he could not pin the hitman, and Bret Hart was the one who had his hand raised. The Rattlesnake lost the battle, but his rivalry with Hart was far from over. At the 1997 Royal Rumble, both Steve Austin and Bret Hart entered the 30-man match. Hart did eliminate Stone Cold, but due to the referees not seeing it, Steve Austin got back in the ring and ended up eliminating Bret Hart and winning the match. Due to the controversial nature of Austin's victory and the fact that the WWE Championship had been vacated after the Royal Rumble, Austin instead got to participate in a four-way match for the WWE title at the next pay-per-view in your house 13. Bret Hart was in that match as well, and the Hitman ended up winning. Austin wasn't going to let that happen, so he decided to cost Bret Hart the championship the next night while Bret was defending it. The two finally got to go one-on-one -on -one again at WrestleMania 13. This is where an important part of Stone Cold's career happened. After throwing everything at each other, Bret put Austin in the sharpshooter. Despite the pain, Stone Cold didn't submit and ended up passing out instead. The Hitman kept the sharpshooter locked in even after the bell rang. This caused Bret Hart to turn heel and for Steve Austin to become a face at the exact same moment. Now with the roles reversed, Stone Cold would fight Bret Hart in another match at the next pay-per-view in your house 14. Due to the British Bulldog hitting Stone Cold with a chair, Steve Austin won the match and earned a shot at The Undertaker's WWE Championship. Before facing the Deadman, however, Austin faced Bret Hart for a fourth time on Raw. The match was ruled a no contest, but Stone Cold still ended the fight by injuring Bret Hart's leg. With the Hitman out of the way, Stone Cold focused on his WWE Championship match against The Undertaker. Unfortunately, an old rival would come back to cost Austin his shot at becoming Coming WWE Champion. Brian Pillman distracted Stone Cold during the title match, allowing Undertaker to beat the Texas Rattlesnake. Pillman had aligned himself with Bret Hart and the Hart Foundation months earlier, so Austin conveniently had all of his enemies in one group. Shawn Michaels also had beef with the Hearts, so he and Stone Cold decided to team up. They even defeated Owen Hart and the British Bulldog to win the WWE Tag Team Championship, the first title that Stone Cold won in WWE. Since their partnership wasn't built on a solid foundation, Michaels and Steve Austin got into a fair bit of arguments. They even fought each other while they were tag team champions, with the match ending in a double disqualification when they attacked the referee. HBK would need time off due to an injury, forcing Austin to relinquish the tag team title. However, he was put in a match against Owen Hart and the British Bulldog to crown new champions. Austin was given the opportunity to choose a new tag team partner, but he elected to fight Hart and Bulldog on his own. Despite not wanting a partner, a debuting Dude Love would come to the ring and help Stone Cold. Austin accepted Dude Love's assistance and the two won the match, making Stone Cold a two-time tag team champion. Stone Cold's feud at the Hart Foundation, and especially Owen Hart, continued to get hotter and hotter. Finally, at the 1997 SummerSlam, Stone Cold Steve Austin and Owen Hart went one-on-one -on -one for Hart's Intercontinental Championship. During the match, Owen would infamously botch a pile driver, causing Stone Cold's neck to break. Stone Cold did manage to roll up Hart and win the match, but that didn't matter. Due to the injury, Steve Austin would relinquish both the IC and Tag Team Championships. However, Austin wouldn't be out of the ring for too long. In September 1997, while Owen Hart was in the ring, Stone Cold attacked him from behind. This prompted Vince McMahon to get into the ring and have a word with Austin. The Rattlesnake responded by giving his boss a Stone Cold Stunner, which kicked off a rivalry between Steve Austin and Vince McMahon. Austin, though, still had some unfinished business with Owen Hart. At Survivor Series, Mr. 316 got his rematch with Hart, who was once again the Intercontinental Champion. Stone Cold defeated Owen and won the IC Championship. This also put an end to Stone Cold's rivalry with the Hearts. Soon after, Austin would be attacked by the Nation of Domination, allowing 
on the rock to steal the Intercontinental belt. For weeks, the Brahma Bull would declare himself the best Intercontinental Champion ever. At D-Generation X In Your House, Stone Cold and The Rock had their first one-on-one -on -one match. The Rattlesnake won, and he took back possession of the Intercontinental belt. The next night, Vince McMahon ordered Austin to defend his championship against The Rock again. Due to his rebellious nature, Stone Cold decided to forfeit the IC title and threw the belt into a river. It may have seemed like a bad decision, but it definitely wasn't. At the 1998 Royal Rumble, Stone Cold won the match for a second time. This put Steve Austin in the main event of WrestleMania 14. He went up against the WWE Champion, Shawn Michaels, and to make it even bigger, boxer Mike Tyson was made the special guest enforcer. While Tyson had aligned himself with Michaels' group, DX, the baddest man on the planet turned on HBK during the WrestleMania match. This helped Stone Cold win and become WWE Champion. This was officially the point when Stone Cold Steve Austin became WWE's top star. Everyone was happy to see Stone Cold with the WWE title, except for Vince McMahon. McMahon first tried to change Steve Austin into a corporate champion, but the Rattlesnake had none of it. Since that didn't work, McMahon made it his mission to not only take the WWE Championship away from Steve Austin, but also make Austin's life as miserable as possible. Vince would do things like make himself the special guest referee during Austin's championship matches or having his stooges interfere, but that didn't work. However, at the 1998 King of the Ring, it seemed like Vince McMahon had won. Austin defended the WWE title against Kane in a first blood match. The Undertaker interfered and accidentally hit Stone Cold with a chair, causing the Rattlesnake to bleed and for Stone Cold to lose the WWE title. This was only a small bump in Stone Cold's title reign. He beat Kane in a rematch the very next night and regained the WWE Championship. McMahon was furious, so his next big plan was to have Stone Cold face Kane and The Undertaker in a triple threat match. The Brothers of Destruction ended up pinning Stone Cold at the same time, which led to Vince McMahon declaring the WWE title vacant. To crown a new champion, McMahon set up a match between Undertaker and Kane for the title, with Steve Austin as the guest referee. Stone Cold was of course not interested in raising Undertaker or Kane's hand, but Vince warned Austin that if he didn't perform his proper duties, then he would fire Stone Cold. During the match, not only did Austin get physically involved, but he also ended up declaring himself the winner. Of course, Stone Cold wasn't actually the WWE Champion, but he did get fired by Vince McMahon. However, Steve Austin's firing only lasted a day, as the next night, Shane McMahon would re-sign Stone Cold. The Texas Rattlesnake also got revenge on Vince by dragging him into the ring and pointing a gun to his head, which turned out to be a toy. With that out of the way, Austin still wanted to regain the WWE Championship. A tournament was held at the 1998 Survivor Series to crown a new champion. Steve Austin entered, but lost in the semifinal round when Shane McMahon betrayed him. Despite losing the tournament, Stone Cold would receive a WWE Championship match the next night against the man who won the tournament, The Rock. Unfortunately for Austin, The Undertaker decided this was a good opportunity to get even with Stone Cold. Austin and Taker would fight in a Buried Alive match, which the Rattlesnake won thanks to interference from Kane. The victory also meant that Stone Cold qualified for the 1999 Royal Rumble. Unfortunately, Austin got entry number one. Strangely enough, Vince McMahon was the second entry. This led to a crazy Rumble match, but in the closing moments, it came down to just Vince and Austin in the ring. The WWE Champion, The Rock, who delighted himself with McMahon, came to the ring and distracted Stone Cold, allowing Vince McMahon to eliminate him and win the Royal Rumble. Since he didn't want to fight The Rock, McMahon decided to forfeit his WrestleMania Championship match. Apparently, Vince didn't know that if you forfeit your Royal Rumble victory, the runner-up gets the championship match. In this case, Stone Cold Steve Austin. Austin used this to get a match with McMahon. At the St. Valentine's Day Massacre pay-per-view, Vince McMahon and Stone Cold would face off in a steel cage match, with the winner receiving the WWE Championship match at WrestleMania. The Big Show made his WWE debut during the match by emerging from under the ring. However, the plan backfired when Big Show threw Stone Cold through the steel cage and caused Austin to win. With his WrestleMania match locked in, Austin raised hell in the following weeks before finally facing off against The Rock. Just like the year before, Stone Cold got the job done and reclaimed the WWE Championship. In the aftermath of WrestleMania 15, we actually saw Stone Cold and Vince McMahon working together. McMahon's daughter, Stephanie, was kidnapped by The Undertaker's Ministry of Darkness. Steve Austin would come and rescue her, which moved Vince McMahon to help Austin. At the Over the Edge pay-per-view, Stone Cold defended the WWE title against The Undertaker. Vince McMahon was the special guest referee, and so was Shane McMahon, who was working with Undertaker. A chaotic match followed, and despite Vince's help, 
Austin lost the match and the WWE title. Things got even worse when it was revealed that Vince McMahon was secretly working with Taker and his alliance with Stone Cold was all a facade. Vince's wife, Linda, as well as Stephanie were rightfully disgusted by what Vince had done, so they ended up giving Steve Austin their 50% ownership of WWE, making Stone Cold CEO. The Rowl Snake would face Vince and Shane McMahon in a two-on-one handicap ladder match with 100% ownership of WWE on the line. Due to the briefcase, mysteriously moving out of Austin's reach, the McMahons won and took back control. However, before the match, Stone Cold had scheduled a WWE Championship match between himself and The Undertaker. Steve Austin won the match, making him a four-time WWE Champion. The era of Austin continued until SummerSlam, where he lost a triple threat match against Mankind and Triple H. The Texas Rail State got his rematch at No Mercy, but due to The Rock accidentally attacking Austin, the game was able to retain the title. All three men were gonna face off at the 99 Survivor Series, but before the match, Stone Cold was hit by a car. This not only made him unable to compete that night, but Austin would also be out of action for almost 10 months. The reason for this was to give Stone Cold time to undergo neck surgery for the injury he suffered two years earlier at SummerSlam 1997. It wouldn't be until September 2000 that Austin would be back full time. Upon his return, Commissioner McFoley began an investigation to find out who ran Austin down. Infamously, it turned out it was Rikishi and he did it for The Rock. In his first match back, Stone Cold fought Rikishi in a no-holds-barred match. The match was ruled a no contest when Austin tried to run Rikishi down with a truck, but Stone Cold had gotten his revenge. Later, Steve Austin fought Rikishi and Kurt Angle in a handicap match on Raw. Triple H came down to help Austin, but ended up attacking the Texas Rattlesnake. As it turned out, the game was behind the car attack and had hired Rikishi to take out Austin. Of course, the two had a match, which fittingly was at the 2000 Survivor Series. What was also fitting was that Austin lifted Triple H with a forklift and sent him falling down. With that over, Stone Cold turned his attention to the 2001 Royal Rumble. The Rattlesnake won the entire thing, giving him a shot at the WWE Championship. His opponent was The Rock, and in Austin's home state of Texas, the Rattlesnake and the Brahma Bull went toe-to-toe -to -toe for the second time on the grandest stage of them all. The match was not without controversy. Vince McMahon showed up and helped Austin, even giving him a chair to hit The Rock. Stone Cold won the match and the title, and also turned him heel by joining forces with Vince McMahon. Triple H would also side with Stone Cold, helping him defeat Rock in a rematch. Austin and Triple H would call themselves the two-man power trip and soon became WWE Tag Team Champions. However, their partnership came to an abrupt end when Triple H tore his quadricep during a tag team title defense. Austin still remained WWE champion, but started to become whinier and demanded people respect him. At the same time, Shane and Stephanie McMahon had formed the Alliance, a group consisting of WCW and ECW wrestlers. Their mission was to take over WWE. This prompted Vince McMahon to ask Stone Cold to captain Team WWE and fight back against the Alliance. Austin initially refused, but soon came around and was back to his rebellious self. At the Invasion pay-per-view, Team WWE and the Alliance went one-on-one. -on -one. To everyone's shock, Austin turned on his teammates and sided with the Alliance. A few months later, the two sides had one more battle at Survivor Series in a winner-take-all match. Austin captained the Alliance, but due to Kurt Angle turning on them, Team WWE was victorious and the Alliance was no more. Austin was still WWE Champion in the aftermath, but that would be put to the test. At the final pay-per-view of 2001, Vengeance, a tournament was held to unify the WWE and WCW World Championships. Austin defeated Kurt Angle, but lost the unification match to Chris Jericho. Since it worked well last time, Austin entered the 2002 Royal Rumble. He made it to the Final Four, but was eliminated. However, he would earn a championship match against Chris Jericho at No Way Out. At the same time, the NWO, Hulk Hogan, Kevin Nash, and Scott Hall were prepared to make their return to WWE. They met Austin backstage, but when Stone Cold refused a beer gift from them, they went the extreme route and cost Austin his match against Jericho. This set up a feud between Stone Cold and the NWO, which saw Steve Austin defeat Scott Hall at WrestleMania 18. The next few months were rather lackluster for the Rattlesnake. 
He lost the WWE Championship number one contenders match at Backlash to The Undertaker. He would then have a short feud with Big Show and Ric Flair. In real life, Stone Cold became frustrated with the creative direction of WWE and things came to a breaking point in June 2002 when Austin was supposed to lose to Brock Lesnar in a King of the Ring qualifying match. Austin no-showed the event and ended up going home and wasn't seen for the rest of the year. Things eventually got patched up behind the scenes, and in early 2003, rumblings of a Stone Cold return began. The Raw general manager, Eric Bischoff, had been trying to sign Austin to the Raw brand. Bischoff was unsuccessful and was forced to tell Vince McMahon that he had failed. Jim Ross, however, was able to commit Steve Austin to come back, and this caused McMahon to put Eric Bischoff in a match with Stone Cold. Steve Austin officially made his return at the 2003 No Way Out pay-per-view, and of course, defeated Bischoff. After that, The Rock, who had recently returned as well, was upset that Austin had been voted Superstar of the Decade. The Great One also mentioned that he had never defeated the Rattlesnake at WrestleMania. This set up a challenge that Stone Cold accepted. At WrestleMania 19, Stone Cold and The Rock locked up for the third time on the grandest stage for them all. The two had a legendary match, but this time, The Rock was the winner. Unbeknownst to just about everyone at the time, but this was basically the end of Stone Cold Steve Austin's career. He would be back later that same year as the co-general manager of Raw, but he never wrestled. As the years went on, Austin would still be part of WWE, but it became less and less likely that fans would ever see him in a match again. Then, something interesting happened almost 20 years after Stone Cold's last match. In March 2022, Kevin Owens invited Steve Austin to be a guest on the KO show at WrestleMania 38. Austin did accept, but that didn't stop Owens from insulting Stone Cold's home of Texas. Finally, on WrestleMania 38 Saturday, Owens and Steve Austin met in the ring. KO revealed that the real reason he invited the Texas Rattlesnake was to challenge him to a no-holds-barred match. Austin thought about it and decided to ask the crowd. After hearing a definite answer, Stone Cold decided it was time for one more match. The fight began with both men throwing fists, with Austin eventually getting the advantage. After some stomps in the corner, Stone Cold threw Kevin Owens into the opposite side of the ring. The WWE legend then sent KO to the outside. Owens tried to change the tide, but Stone Cold caught him with a clothesline. Kevin Owens finally got a break when he threw Austin's head into the ring post. The Canadian started throwing his own fists into the Texan's face and set up a table. Stone Cold got back into it by countering and sending Kevin Owens crashing into the foreign object. The wrestlers then went over the barricade and began brawling amongst the fans. Steve Austin tried to suplex Kevin Owens, but KO countered and sent Austin falling to the concrete floor. As the two went over the barricade, Stone Cold chucked a prone Kevin Owens onto the commentary table. With KO laid out, Austin dished out another series of fists while also chugging plenty of beer. Out of desperation, Kevin Owens stunned Steve Austin and tried to get a ride on Austin's ATV. Stone Cold thought that was a good idea and drove KO to the top of the stage. The Texas Rattlesnake hit his opponent with not one, but two suplexes onto the hard surface. Austin then sent a wounded Kevin Owens rolling back into the ring while also grabbing another round of beers. Stone Cold got a bit too relaxed though as Owens struck with a stunner from out of nowhere. The Canadian then brought a chair into the ring. Right as Kevin Owens swung, Austin ducked, causing the chair to hit Owens. What's funny is that Stone Cold had this exact same thing happen to himself years earlier. With Kevin Days, Stone Cold hit the stunner and got the pinfall. Poor Kevin Owens couldn't catch a break. After the match, Stone Cold Steve Austin gave him one more stunner and then the man was arrested. I sort of have mixed feelings about this match. Having Stone Cold wrestle a match after nearly two decades was huge and the match with Kevin Owens didn't seem to fit the hype. We didn't actually know if Austin was going to wrestle a match until about a minute before it happened. Part of me feels like the in-ring return of Stone Cold Steve Austin should have been hyped up a ton rather than presenting it as an interview and then surprising everyone with a match. On the other hand though, it was kind of fun with how casual it was. Having Steve Austin just kind of decide to have a match right there on the spot gave it this fun, laid back attitude and considering what the match was like, I think that worked out the best. Austin and Owens brawl wasn't a 5 star wrestling match, it was just a fun fight. Had WWE announced that Kevin Owens and Stone Cold were going to have a match and this is what happened, it would have felt a bit weird. But with Austin just deciding on the spot to have a match, the no holds barred brawl fit pretty well. Stone Cold also appeared the next night, confronting his old rival, Vince McMahon. Even though McMahon took the stunner incredibly poorly, it was still a fun moment. 
as of right now, this is where Stone Cold's career ends. However, now that he's finally wrestled again, this opens the doors for Steve Austin to have more matches. That would be great, but I also don't want this video to be outdated, so I'm fine if Stone Cold doesn't wrestle again. As the son of Rocky Johnson, The Rock had wrestling in his blood. The Brahma Bull was born into the legendary Anawati family, so it seemed like he was destined for the squared circle. Despite all the success he'd achieved later in his life, The Rock had a difficult childhood. While living in Hawaii, Rock was involved in a theft ring, and by the age of 17, he had already been arrested eight times. However, spending time in the gym and playing sports helped young Rock escape that life. In 1990, the Great One received a full-ride scholarship to the University of Miami and began playing football. Upon graduation, The Rock would continue his football career in his father's homeland when he signed with the Canadian football team, the Calgary Stampeders. Unfortunately, Rock's football career was cut short when he was let go by the team after just two months. As they say, when one door closes, another opens, and The Rock decided to pursue a career in his family's business. With help from Pat Patterson, The Rock was given a few tryout matches with WWE. The company liked what they saw and signed The Rock in June of 1996. Only a few months after that, The Rock would make his TV debut. In November 1996, The Rock, who was known as Rocky Maivia at the time, came to the aid of Mark Romero, who was leading the Survivor Series team The Rock was a part of. Speaking of which, that's where The Rock would make his in-ring debut. On November 17, 1996, The Great One would have his first match in WWE. Just like another legendary wrestler, The Undertaker, The Rock made his in-ring debut as part of a Survivor Series team. As I mentioned, Mark Merrill led Rocky's team while Triple H capped into the opposing side. The Rock wouldn't get tagged in until several minutes into the match, but things went downhill just seconds after the tag. Crush forced the young Rock into his corner and tagged in Jerry Lawler. Despite the rough start, The Rock quickly bounced back and showed off his athleticism before knocking Lawler down with a dropkick. That was too much for Jerry, so the King tagged in another King. Triple H nailed The Rock with an onslaught of aggressive offense and didn't allow the debuting star a chance to fight back. Goldust then tagged in and hit a few moves before tagging out with Crush. The Hawaii native continued where his teammates left off by wailing on The Rock. With the Great One sufficiently incapacitated, Jerry Lawler re-entered the match. The Rock wasn't able to get in any offense, even against the King, and to make matters worse, Triple H soon tagged back in. This time though, The Rock was able to land a few shots on his future rival. Rocky then performed a back body drop, allowing him just enough time to tag in Jake the Snake. The Rock recovered on the ring apron as the match continued. One by one, all of his teammates would be eliminated, leaving only him against Goldust and Crush. Crush manages to sucker in the third generation wrestler and take control. However, Rock quickly countered with a roll up, and while he didn't get the pin, the Brahma Bull was able to start building momentum. Goldust then got involved, but The Rock managed to stay on top of both men. Even when they tried to double-team him, The Rock was able to use his opponent's own offense against them, which allowed him to pin Crush. Now it's just one opponent left, The Rock's first win was almost in sight. Goldust did his best to fight back, but The Rock was unstoppable. The Great One hit the bizarre one with a shoulder breaker, and the match was over. Not quite The Rock bottom, but it did the job. The goal here was to get The Rock over with audiences, and I think they accomplished that. When it came down to the Rock against Crush and Goldust, you could hear the crowd chanting Rocky. They put him in the underdog position, which is a classic way to get fans behind someone, and it worked here. Of course, one new guy being able to beat two established wrestlers can cause audiences to reject someone, and that is what would happen later. On the topic of later, let's see what happened next in Rock's career. The momentum Rock gained at Survivor Series continued to grow. About four months after his debut, The Great One defeated Triple H to win the Intercontinental Championship in February 1997. The Bravo Bulls' first title run didn't last too long, but he did successfully defend the IC belt at WrestleMania against the Sultan, aka Rikishi. Shortly after losing the Intercontinental Championship in April 1997, The Rock suffered a real knee injury. This forced Rock to take time off, and he wouldn't return until August of that year. When he did come back, a pivotal moment in The Rock's career would unfold. During a match against Farouk and Chains, the referee accidentally got knocked down. During that moment, The Rock made his return by running in from the crowd. Without warning, Rocky hit Chains with the rock bottom and turned heel in the process. He joined up with the Nation of Domination and officially started calling himself The Rock and speaking in third person. A few months later, at D-Generation X in your house, The Great One had his first match with arguably his most iconic rival, Stone Cold Steve Austin. The two wrestled for Stone Cold's Intercontinental Championship, 
but The Rock wasn't able to pick up the win that evening. However, the next night, Vince McMahon ordered Steve Austin to defend the title again. The Texas Real Estate instead just gave The Rock the IC Championship, but he also threw in a Stolt Cold Stunner too. The Rock held the Intercontinental title for a good chunk of 1998, with notable defenses against Ken Shamrock. During this time, The Rock would overthrow Farouk as the leader of the Nation of Domination. With Rocky now in charge, the group was shorn to just the Nation. This led to a faction rivalry between the Nation and D-Generation X, and naturally gave way to a feud between the two leaders, The Rock and Triple H. The rivalry built up all the way to SummerSlam, where they faced off in a ladder match for the Intercontinental title. The Rock's championship reign finally came to an end that night, but something greater was just around the corner. Post SummerSlam, The Rock entered a tournament to crown a new WWE Champion. He made it to the finals, where his last opponent was Mankind. During the match, Rock locked his opponent in the sharpshooter. Despite Mankind not tapping out, Vince McMahon ran in and called for the bell, a clear reference to the Montreal Screwjob one year prior. In addition to winning the WWE Championship, The Rock also aligned himself with Vince and Shane McMahon. This was the beginning of one of the most iconic rivalries in Rock's career. For the rest of 1998 and into 1999, The Rock and Mankind had several matches with each other, including their I Quit match at the Royal Rumble and their famous Empty Arena match. In the course of their feud, The Rock became a three-time WWE Champion, even if all of his wins were in controversial fashion. Rock's rivalry with Mankind did end with the Great One as Champion, but a new challenge was right around the corner. Stone Cold Steve Austin earned the right to challenge for the WWE Championship, causing him and Rock to square off at WrestleMania 15. Like their previous encounters in 1997, Rock was unable to defeat Steve Austin and lost the belt on top of it. Despite the loss, The Rock's popularity was still rising, so it only made sense to turn him face. At Backlash, Shane McMahon betrayed the Brahma Bull during The Rock's rematch with Stone Cold. Now as a good guy, The Rock would feud with Vince and Shane McMahon, as well as various members of the corporate ministry, including Triple H and The Undertaker. During this time, Rock would team up with his former rival Mankind. Their tag team was called the Rock and Sock Connection, and this alliance resulted in the Great One becoming a three-time World Tag Team Champion. However, Mankind wasn't the only person The Rock would soon form an alliance with. At the 2000 Royal Rumble, the plan was for The Rock to win the match by eliminating The Big Show. However, The Rock's feet accidentally hit the floor first. This got turned into a storyline, with Big Show arguing he was the true winner. In the end, the WWE Championship match at WrestleMania 2000 became a four-way elimination, with The Rock, Big Show, Mankind, and Triple H, the champion. To add more drama, each wrestler had a member of the McMahon family in their corner, with Vince on The Rock's side. This alliance ended up being Rocky's downfall, as Mr. McMahon hit the People's Champion with a chair and helped Triple H retain the WWE title. However, The Rock wouldn't have to wait long to get his revenge. Rock fought Triple H for the WWE Championship at Backlash, and thanks to outside interference from Stone Cold, the most electrifying man in sports entertainment became the new WWE Champion. The Rock would lose the title back to Triple H Judgment Day, but won it back at the next pay-per-view, King of the Ring, making him a five-time WWE Champion. His fifth title reign was The Rock's longest, but it finally came to an end at No Mercy, where, in a very chaotic match, Kurt Angle defeated the Great One. The Rock would make the record straight a few months later at No Way Out 2001. He avenged his loss by beating the Olympic gold medalist and winning back the WWE Championship. Just like in 1999, Stone Cold Steve Austin was in line for a WWE title match at WrestleMania X7. The two megastars went at it for a second time on the grandest stage of them all in one of the best WrestleMania main events ever. Similar to the year prior, the Brahma Bull lost to the Rattlesnake thanks to Vince McMahon interfering. Shortly after WrestleMania, The Rock would take time off to film The Scorpion King, a foreshadowing of where his career would go. Once Rock returned, the Invasion storyline was in full force, where WWE was trying to fight off WCW and ECW. The Rock sided with WWE and was even a member of their team at Survivor Series. In the winner-takes-all match, it finally came down to The Rock on WWE side and Steve Austin on WCW and ECW side. Thanks to some assistance from Kurt Angle, The Rock beat Stone Cold, giving Team WWE the win, as well as payback for his defeat at WrestleMania. Jumping ahead to 2002, Hulk Hogan, along with Kevin Nash and Scott Hall, made their return to WWE at the No Way Out pay-per-view. The Hulkster set his sights on The Rock, leading to the Icon vs. Icon match at WrestleMania X8. In another classic WrestleMania match, The Rock successfully defeated Hulk Hogan. Like after his match with Steve Austin the previous year, 
The Rock took some time off from wrestling, following his match with Hogan. While he wouldn't be gone for too long, The Rock wouldn't be in WWE for much longer. Upon his return, The Rock became WWE Champion again after beating Kurt Angle and Undertaker at Vengeance. This was the lead-in to the 2002 SummerSlam, where The Rock would take on Brock Lesnar. The match is another classic, and is one of the defining moments in Brock Lesnar's career. The Rock would once again take time off from WWE after losing to Lesnar, but he did help make a star before leaving. Because of his focus on acting, fans began booing The Rock, so when he returned in January 2003, The Great One became a heel again. He had a rematch against Hulk Hogan shortly after returning, where The Rock once again had his hand raised. Now that the momentum was on his side, Rock went after one of his oldest rivals, Stone Cold Steve Austin. To avenge his two WrestleMania defeats at the hand of Stone Cold, The Rock challenged Austin to a third and final match. The Rattlesnake accepted, and the two met one last time at WrestleMania 19. It was a tough match, but after three consecutive Rock Bottoms, The Rock finally did it. He finally defeated Stone Cold in a one-on-one -on -one match. The Rock would have a brief rivalry with a debuting Goldberg after his WrestleMania bout. The feud ended at Backlash, where the Great One lost to the WCW star. For the next couple of years, The Rock would continue to make appearances every once in a while, and even wrestled a match in 2004. Once his WWE contract expired though, The Rock mainly focused on acting. Over the next few years, The Rock would make appearances in WWE, but usually in the form of a pre-recorded video. That changed though in 2011. On February 14th, the People's Champion appeared live on Raw for the first time in 7 years, and he was also announced as the host of WrestleMania 27. On that note, during the Raw before WrestleMania, The Rock made another appearance, but was confronted by the WWE Champion, The Miz and Alex Riley. In true wrestling fashion, this led to a brawl, but Rock was able to hold his own and fought the two off. John Cena, though, had other plans, and laid out the Brahma Bull with an attitude adjustment. In hindsight, probably not the smartest move on Cena's end. At WrestleMania, in addition to hosting the show, Rock would get his revenge. During Miz and John Cena's match for the WWE title, the Great One came out and Rock bottomed Cena, allowing Miz to win and retain his title. The next night, Rock and John Cena met in the ring and agreed to face each other at next year's WrestleMania in the main event. Even with the match scheduled, we wouldn't have to wait till 2012 to see The Rock back in the ring. Later in 2011, it was announced that The Rock would participate in a Survivor Series match. It ultimately became a tag team match, with Rock teaming up with John Cena to take on The Miz and R-Truth. In his first WWE match in over 7 years, The Rock got the win for his team. The partnership didn't last long, as shortly after the bell rang, Rock hit his WrestleMania opponent with a rock bottom. The Rock would continue to make appearances on Raw, but it all led up to April 1st, 2012. At WrestleMania 28, WWE's two biggest stars finally met in the ring, with a record-breaking number of viewers watching live. Rock and Cena wrestled for over half an hour, and in the end, the People's Champ came out on top. This victory sparked something in The Rock, and he would vow to become a WWE Champion again. We would find out when he would challenge for the WWE title a few months after WrestleMania on Raw 1000. During the special show, The Rock announced he'd compete for the WWE Championship at the 2013 Royal Rumble. CM Punk, who is the reigning WWE Champion, confronted The Rock and later turned heel by attacking the Brahma Bull at the end of the show. Following the assault, The Rock would be absent from TV until January 2013. In preparation for his Royal Rumble match, The Great One made appearances on Raw and SmackDown and confronted CM Punk, who is still the title holder. The two finally clashed at the Royal Rumble, where Rock not only ended Punk's over year-long title reign, but also became an 8-time WWE Champion. Punk and Rock had a rematch at Elimination Chamber, but take a wild guess who won that. Anyways, John Cena had won the Royal Rumble match, and since The Rock was the current WWE Champion, the Invisible Man chose to face the Great One a second time. Now, we're going to do something a little different on Bell to Bell, and we're going to talk about The Rock's final two WWE matches. You'll see why in a bit. For now, let's jump into The Rock's second to last WWE match at WrestleMania 29. In front of over 80,000 fans, The Rock and John Cena prepared to lock up for a second time. Cena was the first to hit a move by landing a shoulder on Rock. The WWE Champion was quickly back to his feet, and after a standoff, the two went at it again. The Rock then hit John Cena with a shoulder block, and the match paused again. Once they were back at it, the People's Champ hit Cena with a hip toss, causing the leader of the C-Nation to exit the ring. Once John Cena was back inside the ropes, the match really kicked off. 
The man in the cargo shorts began landing punch after punch on the rock. Rocky, though, was able to literally bounce back and take control. Unlike last time, the rock stayed on Cena, even going to the outside to inflict damage. John Cena wasn't done, though, and used a clothesline to take back the match. Rock then found himself fighting out of a headlock, which he countered by locking John Cena in a sleeper hold. The victory didn't last long, as Cena fought out of the hold with his signature slam. The WWE Champion's body continued to be beaten by John Cena, but thanks to some quick thinking and a Samoan drop, the Great One evened the playing field. The match then became a back and forth battle. Just as soon as one man was starting to build momentum, the other would counter and take over. At one point, The Rock was getting ready to hit the rock bottom, but John Cena countered with the STF. The Brahma Bull managed to fight out of it, but Cena wouldn't let up. Big Match John landed the five knuckle shuffle and almost hit the AA. The Rock prevented that from happening, only for John Cena to lock in the STF again. This time, though, The Rock rips Cena's hands off and then successfully connected with The Rock Bottom. When that didn't end the match, the Doctor of Thugonomics responded with an attitude adjustment. Rock went stayed down for the pin, though, so John Cena took things to the next level. A top rope leg drop missed, allowing Rock to perform a spine buster, followed by the people's elbow. Once both wrestlers were back on their feet, a slugfest ensued. The Rock then went for a crossbody, which Cena countered into an AA, which Rock countered into a rock bottom. Since that didn't get the win, The Rock was going to take a page out of John Cena's book, but Rocky's five knuckle shuffle was countered by an AA. Both men eventually got back on their feet and began throwing punches again. The fist fight came to an end when Cena stole The Rock bottom. That wasn't enough to win the match, so John Cena then went for the people's elbow. Unlike their match a year earlier, where Rock caught Cena with a rock bottom, Cena tried to prevent that from happening a second time, but the Great One still landed his signature finisher. With the match still going, both men attempted to hit each other with their respective signature moves. Realizing the battle was going nowhere, Rock planted his rival with a DDT. Now that the challenger was stunned, the Rock got ready to hit one final rock bottom. At the last moment, Cena turned things around and executed the attitude adjustment for the last time to win the fight, and the WWE Championship. This match was, and still is, incredible. Even today, knowing who's gonna win, I was still into it with how many counters each guy threw at each other. As I noted, there's a lot of moments where the action just stops, but I never felt like that made the match boring. I think that's because of the crowd and how vocal they were for everything that happened. It was a fantastic way for The Rock to end his in-ring career. Except that it wasn't. Let me explain. After his rematch with John Cena, The Rock would go back to making sporadic appearances. While he wouldn't wrestle, he would get physical sometimes. He even appeared at the next three WrestleManias, and in 2016, he technically had a match. At WrestleMania 32, The Great One walked out with a flamethrower and marched towards the ring. He would announce that the event had broken the WrestleMania attendance record, but was then interrupted by the Wyatt family. The Rock responded by challenging them to a match, and Eric Rowan stepped up. After the awkwardly long stare down, the bell rang. Rock hit the rock bottom, one, two, three, the match was over in six seconds. So that was technically the rock's last match. See why I also talked about his second to last match? Anyways, after Rowan was defeated, the Wyatts surrounded the ring. Luckily, John Cena ran in to provide some backup. The former WrestleMania opponents teamed up and took care of business. It was a really cool moment seeing two of the biggest stars together and a nice way to end what was technically The Rock's last WWE match. Since then, The Rock has continued to make appearances in WWE, but officially retired from wrestling in 2019. Although, there are rumors saying he'll be coming back, so who knows. You might be surprised to hear this, but King was born in Spain. His father was part of the United States Air Force and was stationed in the country. While his family wasn't poor, the Big Red Machine never had a ton of money as a kid. In order to create a better life for himself, Kane thought he would pursue a career as an athlete. He tried basketball and football, and while Kane was good at both sports, he wasn't able to go pro. At the same time, Kane graduated from college with a degree in English literature. So since he loved sports and drama, the Devil's Spirit Demon decided he put those two things together and become a wrestler. After getting trained, Kane started wrestling, but for the first few years, he made little to no money. That didn't discourage Kane, and his hard work eventually paid off. After building a name for himself, WWE offered the Big Red Machine a contract. Kane signed with the company, but he did become the Devil's Spirit Demon right away. In June 1995, Kane would debut as Jerry the King Lawler's private dentist, Isaac Yankum. 
killed Lawler in his feud against Bret Hart, but the Isaac Yankum character never went anywhere. Less than a year after debuting, the evil dentist persona was dropped. Around this time, Kevin Nash, known as Diesel in WWE, left the company. To mock his departure, WWE had Kane impersonate Diesel. Of course, pretending to be another wrestler could only go on for so long, and the imposter Diesel character was dropped a few months after it started. In 1997, Paul Bearer wanted to reunite with The Undertaker after Bearer had betrayed him the previous year. Undertaker refused, so Bearer revealed that The Undertaker killed his own family by starting a fire in their home. However, unbeknownst to the Phenom, Undertaker's brother, Kane, had survived, although he had been physically and mentally scarred by the fire. Finally, while The Undertaker was wrestling Shawn Michaels, Kane would make his debut. The masked demon used Undertaker's own finisher, the Tombstone Piledriver, to attack him and cost Taker the match. For the next few weeks, Kane would go on a rampage, attacking numerous wrestlers. One of Kane's victims was Dude Love, aka McFoley. This awakened one of Foley's other personalities, Mankind. Mankind then challenged the Big Red Machine to a match. Kane accepted, and the two faced each other at the 1997 Survivor Series. Mankind was the first man out. Mankind was so upset that he couldn't wait and attacked Kane while the demon was still making his entrance. Kane quickly turned things around and got Mankind into the ring. In a huge flex, Kane just picked up where he left off and finished his entrance. The match then officially started, and Kane returned to beating up his opponent. Mankind eventually went on the offensive, but his attacks didn't seem to do any damage. Even launching his body into Kane didn't do anything. The masked demon then threw the steel steps into Mankind before returning to the ring. Mankind tried to mount a comeback, but Kane shut it down with a big boot. The big red machine then backed his enemy into a corner and started choking him out. After wearing him down, Kane used what would become one of his signature moves, the Sidewalk Slam. The fight returned to the outside, where Mankind would try to fight back, which only made Kane more vicious. Finally, Mankind landed a direct hit by dropping Kane face first into the steel steps. The masked wrestlers returned to the ring, where Mankind did not let up, and he even managed to hit the pile driver. With Kane down, Mankind went after Paul Bearer, choking him out with the Mandible Claw. It wasn't the smartest decision, as Kane managed to knock his opponent off the ring and send him crashing through the announcer's table. Mankind had to crawl to get away, but of course, he wasn't able to get far. To Kane's surprise, Mankind still had enough strength to plant him with a DDT. Mankind added to his assault by hitting a hard elbow drop. Before he could do another move, Kane got back up and threw Mankind's body onto the floor. Mankind chose resilience and crawled into the ring and got back on his feet. Kane rewarded Mankind's bravery by giving him a tombstone pile driver and ending the match. While this wasn't a perfect first match, it still was really great. Kane looked really strong, and Mankind didn't come out looking bad either. Not everyone is a fan of it, but I feel like the red lights helped to make Kane look even scarier. I liked how Mankind's attacks at first didn't hurt Kane, but I wish there was more of a build up. The first move that actually seemed to do some damage was when Kane got hit by Mankind's boot. It just seemed odd that that was the first move that hurt him. I would have preferred if Mankind had to work just a bit more in order to actually start damaging Kane. Speaking of Mankind, I didn't really get why he attacked Paul Bearer. Bearer hadn't cheated or anything, so this just seemed kind of random and dumb of Mankind to take his eyes off a really strong opponent. Again, I thought this was a good match, and all the crazy moves Mankind did are what helped make it stand out. After Survivor Series, Kane would turn his focus back to The Undertaker. Kane wanted to fight him, but Taker said he wouldn't wrestle his own brother. The two ended up forming an alliance, something we'd see more of as Kane's career progressed. However, Kane's friendly attitude was all a facade. At the 1998 Royal Rumble, the Big Red Machine attacked The Undertaker and cost the dead man a shot at the WWE Championship. That wasn't all he did, however. The Big Red Machine locked his brother inside a casket and then set it on fire. However, The Undertaker used his supernatural powers to escape unharmed. After Kane tried to kill him, The Undertaker changed his mind and decided to fight his brother at WrestleMania. In his first match at WWE's biggest show, Kane was defeated. The Big Red Machine would get two more rematches against The Undertaker. Kane and Undertaker's second match was at the Mayhem in Manchester pay-per-view where Kane lost yet again. They fought once more at the 1998 Unforgiven pay-per-view. This time, they competed in the first ever Inferno match. Kane would end up being thrown over the top rope and dodged the flames. The Big Red Machine was content with calling it quits, but was then attacked by Vader and forced back to the ring. Kane's right arm was eventually set on fire, and The Undertaker won the match. Since Kane didn't enjoy Vader's little attack, the two faced off in a mask vs mask match at the next pay-per-view. Thankfully, Kane won, which he really needed after three consecutive losses to The Undertaker. 
Speaking of The Undertaker, Kane had a fourth match against his brother the night after defeating Vader. With a distraction from Mankind, Kane was able to finally defeat the Phenom. On top of that, the victory also made Kane the number one contender for the WWE Championship. The Big Red Machine got his title shot at the King of the Ring pay-per-view. He took on the champion, Stone Cold Steve Austin, in a first blood match. The Undertaker interfered and accidentally hit Stone Cold with a steel chair. Remember this. Anyways, this allowed Kane to win and become WWE Champion. This was without a doubt a huge victory, but Kane's title reign was short-lived. One day after winning the WWE title, Kane lost it back to Stone Cold. The Devil's Favorite Demon wouldn't be championship list for too long though. Shortly after losing to Steve Austin, Kane decided to team up with former rival Mankind. Their alliance didn't last that long, but they did manage to win the World Tag Team titles twice. During their second title reign, it was revealed that Kane had been secretly working with The Undertaker. Apparently, that accidental chair shot to Steve Austin back at Kane of the Ring was intentional. With Kane and Taker's alliance now revealed, the Big Red Machine would abandon Mankind and forced him to defend the tag team titles alone at SummerSlam. As tough as Mankind was, there was no way he could win a two-on-one match, and both he and Kane became former champions. The Big Red Machine could have cared less, as Vince McMahon put both Kane and The Undertaker in a triple threat match against the WWE Champion, Stone Cold. This match took place at Breakdown in Your House, with the stipulation that Kane and The Undertaker couldn't pin each other. McMahon did this so Steve Austin would hopefully lose the WWE Championship. The plan sort of backfired, as Kane and Undertaker pinned Stone Cold at the same time, meaning that there was no champion. McMahon was going to make the Brothers of Destruction both the champion, but Stone Cold interrupted the ceremony and attacked Vince McMahon. McMahon was furious that Undertaker and Kane didn't protect him, and he decided to not award them the championship. In hindsight, this is a pretty bad decision, because the Devil's Fair Demon and the Phenom then attacked Vince McMahon and injured his ankle. Despite this, Kane and The Undertaker would fight each other at Judgment Day for the WWE Championship, with Stone Cold as the special guest referee. During the match, Kane's former manager, Paul Bearer, came out and seemed like he wanted to help Kane. However, it turned out to be a trick, and Bearer and The Undertaker were working together. The plan didn't completely work, as Steve Austin ended up counting a double pinfall and declared himself the WWE Champion. Kane didn't care about the title at this point, and was more interested in revenge. During a Buried Alive match between Stone Cold and The Undertaker, Kane assaulted the dead man, and he ended up losing the fight. The two would go their separate ways after that, with Kane joining a group called The Corporation. He aligned himself to China, and they had feuded the man China used to protect, Triple H. Their partnership had an unfortunate ending for Kane, though. At WrestleMania 15, China turned on Kane, and the Big Red Machine was kicked out of the corporation as well. At the same event, X-Pac was betrayed by his friend, who was coincidentally Triple H. X-Pac befriended Kane, and they formed not just a tag team, but also a personal relationship. Additionally, in both a funny but also heartwarming moment, Kane got a girlfriend, a female wrestler named Tori. X-Pac and Kane even became two-time tag team champions, which makes it all the more sad when X-Pac eventually turned on his friend. X-Pac had gotten back with a recently formed D-Generation X and saw no more need for Kane. On top of that, X-Pac also stole Kane's girlfriend. For the rest of 1999 and into 2000, Kane and X-Pac faced off several times, with both men gaining their fair share of wins and losses. The rivalry finally came to an end at WrestleMania 2000, when Kane teamed up with Rikishi to defeat X-Pac and his DX buddy, Road Dog. After a short break, Kane returned and reunited with The Undertaker. He joined his brother in his feud against the McMahon-Helmsley faction, but there was clearly tension between Kane and Taker. The Brothers of Destruction did end up imploding not too long after they got back together, when Kane attacked Undertaker during the match. The two faced off at the 2000 SummerSlam, and Face Off is very accurate. The dead man unmasked Kane during the match, causing the Baker machine to flee, and the match ended in a no contest. This was the first time we had seen Kane without his mask, not counting Isaac Ankum or the fake Diesel. This was just a one-time event, and Kane would continue to wear his mask after SummerSlam. For the rest of the year, Kane competed for the WWE Championship, but didn't have any success. He also began a feud with Chris Jericho, which started when Jericho spilled coffee on the masked demon. Kane and Y2J had a trilogy of matches, with Kane winning the first two and Chris Jericho winning the last one. The Big Red Machine made history during the 2001 Royal Rumble match. He set a record of eliminating 11 wrestlers and was also the runner-up. 
Additionally, during the match, the Bickered Machine patched things up with The Undertaker. This brought back the Brothers of Destruction, and over the course of 2001, they won the WWE Tag Team titles twice, and even became the WCW Tag Team Champions during the Invasion storyline. Also, Kane would win the Hardcore Championship and the Intercontinental title, but both reigns lasted less than 40 days. Kane and Undertaker remained a tag team until Survivor Series, where they were part of Team WWE in a winner-takes-all match against Team WCW. After that, the Brothers of Destruction quietly separated. In 2002, Raw and SmackDown were split into two different rosters, with Kane being drafted to Raw. He had a short feud with the recently debuted New World Order, before disappearing for a little while. When he came back, Kane had a new look and also got a new tag team partner, the Hurricane. The two masked wrestlers soon won the Tag Team Championship, and a week later, Kane also won the Intercontinental Championship. Kane and Hurricane lost their Tag Team Championship a few weeks after winning it, but at the same time, the Bigger Machine started feuding with the World Heavyweight Champion, Triple H. This is also where the infamous Katie Vick storyline started. To make it short, Triple H claimed that when Kane was a teenager, he had a girlfriend named Katie Vick. Katie died in a car crash, and according to the game, Kane had sex with her dead body. Thankfully, this is de-emphasized before Kane and Triple H's match. At no mercy, both Kane's Intercontinental Championship and Triple H's World Championship were on the line. Due to Triple H and his friend Ric Flair cheating, Kane was defeated and lost the IC title. Kane got another shot at the World Heavyweight Championship in the first Elimination Chamber match at Survivor Series, but he didn't win there either. After that, Kane formed a new tag team with Rob Van Dam. They won the World Tag Team Championship in 2003 and held the belts for 76 days, Kane's longest championship reign up to that point. After dropping the title, Kane reunited his feud with Triple H. Thankfully, there were no mentions of Katie Vick this time. It started when Triple H offered Kane a spot in his group, Evolution. Stone Cold, who was co-general manager of Raw, countered and said if Kane didn't join Evolution, then he'd get a championship match against Triple H. The other co-general manager of Raw, Eric Bischoff, then added that if Kane lost the championship match, then he would have to unmask. Despite that stipulation, Kane accepted Stone Cold's offer, and Triple H and Kane went one-on-one -on -one in a title versus mask match. Interference from the other members of Evolution allowed Triple H to win, and Kane was forced to unmask. Unlike before in 2000, this unmasking was permanent. The Big Red Machine became unstable after losing his mask and began attacking everyone, including the CEO of WWE, Linda McMahon. Not too surprising, this enraged her son, Shane McMahon, causing him and Kane to fight in two matches, both of which Kane won. After that, Kane, who is still unhinged, decided to attack his brother, The Undertaker, during a buried alive match between the dead man and Vince McMahon. The assistance from Kane allowed Vince to win, and Undertaker wasn't seen after that match. Despite insisting that The Undertaker was dead, all kinds of strange and supernatural things would happen to Kane over the following months. Finally, The Undertaker returned at WrestleMania 20, along with Paul Bearer by his side. Kane and Taker went at it for a second time on the grandest stage of them all, and just like before, Undertaker prevailed. After Mania, Kane began another odd storyline. This one started when he kidnapped Lita. Kane wanted a child to carry on his legacy, and Lita became pregnant. Matt Hardy, who was Lita's actual boyfriend both on and off screen, was of course furious. The two men met in the ring at the 2004 SummerSlam, with the winner getting to marry Lita. Kane won and tied the knot shortly thereafter. However, a few weeks later, Kane was wrestling against Snitsky. During the match, Kane was hit in the back and he fell on top of his pregnant wife, causing a miscarriage. Kane blamed Snitsky for the incident, and the two had a rematch at Taboo Tuesday. Snitsky not only won the match, but also injured Kane's larynx. The Big Red Machine didn't return until the 2005 New Year's Revolution pay-per-view, where he eventually lost against Snitsky. Afterward, Kane and Lita reconciled, but she later turned on him and started a relationship with Edge. The Bigger Machine and the Radar Superstar had several matches against each other throughout 2005. The rivalry finally ended when Edge defeated Kane in a stretcher match. After being absent for a few months, Kane returned and won an 18-man battle royal. Because of his victory, Kane would be one of three wrestlers fans could vote for to receive a WWE Championship match. The other two options were Big Show and Shawn Michaels, with HBK receiving the majority of the votes. Big Show and Kane would instead receive a World Tag Team Championship match, which they won. This began a very lengthy title reign between the two giants. Kane and Big Show held the Tag Team Championship until April of 2006, where they lost the belt to the Spirit Squad. This would then begin another storyline where Kane would become unstable. 
The Devil's Favorite Demon began hearing voices that would constantly repeat the date, May 19th. The Big Red Machine would sporadically start attacking people, even his tag team partner, The Big Show. As it turned out, this is the day his family was killed in a fire. Even after May 19th passed, the voices continued. Later on, someone wearing Kane's old attire appeared and started attacking the Devil's Favorite Demon. The storyline had an abrupt ending when Kane beat up the imposter and unmasked him and threw the man out of the arena. For more details, watch my video on the May 19th slash Imposter Kane storyline. Anyways, after that, Kane disappeared again, but returned at SummerSlam, attacking Umaga. This ultimately set up a Loser Leaves Raw match between the two monsters. Umaga won that match, which forced Kane to move to SmackDown. On the blue brand, Kane began a rivalry with MVP, after MVP asked for better competition. The two had several matches against each other, including tag team matches, where Kane partnered with The Undertaker for a short while. The rivalry between the Big Red Machine and Montel Vontavious Porter ended at Armageddon, when Kane set MVP on fire in an Inferno match. At the 2007 Royal Rumble, Kane eliminated Booker T, only for Booker to get back into the ring and eliminate Kane. Kane would get his payback soon after, when he attacked Booker T when Booker was receiving the key to his hometown of Houston. At the No Way Out pay-per-view, Kane defeated Booker and they had a second match a few days later on SmackDown. The Great Khali attacked Kane during that match, allowing Booker to get the win. The two giants faced off WrestleMania 23, only for Kane to lose to the Indian Giant. After WrestleMania, Kane had a few smaller feuds until they get a short break. In July 2007, Teddy Long announced that Kane would be World Heavyweight Champion Edge's opponent at the Great American Bash. However, the Devil's Fair Demon would attack and injure Edge before the pay-per-view, causing the world title to be vacated. Kane participated in a 20-man battle royal to become the new world champion. The Great Khali won that match, but Kane and Batista were given a chance to become the number one contender later that night. Due to Kali interfering in that match, both the Big Red Machine and the Animal got to face the Giant at the Great American Bash. Finally, at the pay-per-view, Kali managed to retain his title after pinning Kane. After a small feud with Finley, Kane would start appearing on ECW. There, Kane started a rivalry with Big Daddy V. They battled for the rest of 2007, with the feud ending at Armageddon, where Big Daddy defeated Kane in a tag team match. While things started out rough on the Extreme brand, they got better for the Big Red Machine. Kane won a battle royal, earning him an ECW Championship match at WrestleMania 24. In 11 seconds, Kane defeated the champion Chavo Guerrero and won the ECW title. During his title reign, a unique moment happened when Kane was drafted to Raw. Kane kept the ECW title with him, but did eventually lose it when he lost a triple threat match at Night of Champions. For the next several months, Kane would compete for the World Heavyweight Championship, but failed to win it. He also began a rivalry with Rey Mysterio that lasted for several months. It ultimately ended at Survivor Series, where the two men were on opposite teams, with Ray's side winning. For the next few months, and into 2009, Kane did a lot of little things, like being a participant in the Money in the Bank match at WrestleMania 25, getting drafted to SmackDown, and having a short-lived feud with CM Punk. Kane then took a break, but returned at the Bash. He attacked old rival, the Great Khali, setting up a match at SummerSlam. Kane won that match, as well as a Singapore Kane match at Breaking Point. Kane ended the year with a feud with Chris Jericho that led to a Brothers of Destruction reunion when Kane and Taker fought Jericho and Big Show. Like earlier, Kane's career sort of hit a dry spell. He would still appear regularly, but wasn't used in any big storylines. Things finally picked up in June of 2010. The Undertaker was found in a vegetative state and Kane vowed revenge. At the same time, Kane participated in and won the Money in the Bank ladder match. Kane cashed in that same night and defeated the champion, Rey Mysterio. Unfortunately, the bad times didn't end for Mysterio. Kane then accused Rey of putting the Undertaker in that vegetative state. Mysterio denied this, but nonetheless, the two faced off in a rematch at SummerSlam. Kane won once again and was going to put Mysterio in a casket he had brought to the ring. To Kane's surprise, the Undertaker was inside. Even though he was caught off guard, Kane was still able to overpower his brother. Soon after, it was revealed that Kane was the one who put Taker in that vegetative state. The Phenom didn't really like that, and the two squared off at Night of Champions. Unlike many of their previous encounters, Kane won this match and retained the world title. Soon after, Paul Bear returned and was back with The Undertaker. Kane and Taker had a rematch inside Hell in a Cell, where Bear returned on the dead man, allowing Kane to win. In their third and final encounter, the Brothers of Destruction had a Buried Alive match. With help from the Nexus, Kane was able to bury his brother, for the uh, second time. 
Shortly after that, Edge had won a number one contenders match, making him Kane's next challenger. In the lead up to their fight, Edge kidnapped Paul Bearer. While Bearer was still being held hostage, Edge and Kane faced off at Survivor Series. Because both men pinned each other at the same time, the match was ruled a draw, and Kane retained the championship. Because Edge still had Bearer held hostage, Kane agreed to a rematch. In the lead up to their second match, Kane would accidentally knock his father off a stack of ladders, not believing that Edge had actually put Paul Bearer up there. Now totally enraged, Kane and Edge faced off one more time at TLC, in a match that also involved Rey Mysterio and Alberto Del Rio. The Radar Superstar managed to get the victory and put an end to Kane's championship reign. In early 2011, Kane and Big Show reformed their tag team. This is to combat a common enemy, the Core. Along with Santino Morella and Kofi Kingston, Kane and Big Show defeated the four-man group at WrestleMania 27. Even better, Kane and Big Show defeated the group again a few weeks later and won the tag team championship. Unfortunately, this tail reign was pretty short-lived. The two feuded with another faction, the New Nexus, and lost the belts to them about a month after winning the titles. Kane and Big Show split up after that, and the Big Red Machine was on his own again. In July 2011, Kane was attacked by Mark Henry, who was starting his Hall of Pain storyline. The world's strongest man injured the Devil's Favorite Demon, and Kane would be gone for most of the year. In December, Kane returned, but was now wearing a mask again. He attacked John Cena, and would continue to do so for the next few weeks. Kane wanted Cena to embrace the hate, as he put it, and would go after Cena's friend, Zack Ryder. John Cena and Kane faced off in an ambulance match in early 2012, where Cena won and ended the storyline. Kane then started a new feud when he attacked Randy Orton. The two had matches at WrestleMania and Extreme Rules, with Kane winning the first and Orton the second. After this, Kane was given a non-title match against the WWE Champion, CM Punk during which Daniel Bryan attacked the Big Red Machine with a steel chair. Bryan and Kane continued to butt heads, which caused Raw General Manager AJ Lee to enroll them in anger management classes. This ultimately led to their iconic tag team, Team Hell No. They ended up winning the tag team championship and had a very lengthy run with the titles. They had successful defenses against the likes of Team Road Scholars, 3MB, and Dolph Ziggler and Big E. Finally, after 245 days, the title reign came to an end, when Kane and Daniel Bryan were defeated by Roman Reigns and Seth Rollins. Following this, Team Hell No also broke up, which was kind of unfortunate considering what would happen next. Kane would be attacked by the debuting Wyatt family after he won a match. Kane would then take on the leader, Bray Wyatt, in an Inferno, I mean, Ring of Fire match at SummerSlam. Thanks to interference from Eric Rowan and Luke Harper, Bray Wyatt won, and Kane would disappear for a while. When he returned, Kane soon unmasked and joined Triple H and Stephanie McMahon's group, The Authority. The Big Red Machine started wearing a suit and tie and began being referred to as Corporate Kane. As a member of The Authority, Kane feuded with the group's enemies, including CM Punk, Daniel Bryan, and The Shield. After losing a six-man tag team match at WrestleMania 30, Stephanie McMahon berated Kane and told him to find the Big Red Monster he was before. This prompted Kane to put the mask back on, and he was made number one contender for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. The champion at this time was Kane's former tag team partner, Daniel Bryan, and they squared off at Extreme Rules. It was an awesome match, but Kane did ultimately lose. While continuing to help the authority, Kane would still be a contender for World Champion, although he was never successful. After losing a Last Man Standing match in August 2014 to Roman Reigns, Kane once again unmasked himself and returned to being Corporate Kane. Smaller rivalries would be the norm for the Big Red Machine, and it was usually against someone who is an enemy of the Authority. At the same time, Kane would also protect the WWE Champion, Seth Rollins, who was also part of the Authority. In July 2015, Brock Lesnar attacked Kane and injured the Big Red Machine. Immediately after that, Seth Rollins insulted Kane and literally kicked him while Kane was down. Once the Devil's Favorite Demon healed, Kane returned the favor and attacked Rollins. This led to a Hell in a Cell match for Rollins' World Heavyweight Championship, which Kane lost. Per the match stipulation, Kane was also fired from the Authority. Following this, Kane reunited with The Undertaker to take on and defeat the Wyatt family at Survivor Series. Oddly enough, for the next year, Kane would continue to have small feuds with various members of the Wyatt family, but this is mostly just due to coincidence. Best of all for Kane, he won most of his matches against them. After defeating Luke Harper in late 2016, Kane would disappear for 10 months. He returned by coming out from under the ring and attacking Roman Reigns and costing the big dog his match. 
Kane would then participate in a 5-on-3 match at TLC against The Shield. Despite the numbers being in his favor, Kane lost when he and his other teammates turned on Braun Strowman. Kane and the Monster Mon Men finally got to go one-on-one -on -one a couple of months later. To make the match even bigger, the winner got to face the Universal Champion, Brock Lesnar, for the title. Kane and Strowman destroyed each other, but the match ended in a double countout. Ultimately, they both got to face Lesnar at the 2018 Royal Rumble. As with most of his World Championship matches, Kane was not the man who had his hand raised. The following night on Raw, the Big Red Machine and Braun Strowman went at it again in a last man standing match. Strowman was the clear winner this time, and afterward, Kane vanished from WWE again. For the rest of the year, Kane had short rivalries. One of them was with John Cena when Cena was trying to get a WrestleMania match against The Undertaker. Later on, Kane got Team Hell No back together with Daniel Bryan. The two even challenged for the SmackDown Tag Team Championship, but a title reign was not meant to be. Towards the end of the year, Kane and Undertaker once again reunited to feud against Triple H and Shawn Michaels. At Super Showdown, Michaels interfered in Triple H and Undertaker's match, which gave the game the victory. Kane got involved afterward, and Taker and the Devil's Favorite Demon attacked Triple H and Michaels. This set up the Brothers of Destruction vs DX at Crown Jewel. While Kane and Taker looked impressive, DX won the match, after Triple H pinned Kane. Following Crown Jewel, Kane wouldn't be seen a whole lot. In real life, Kane became mayor of Knox County, Tennessee, but he would make occasional appearances in WWE. However, the Big Red Machine made time to wrestle one more match, and over 25 years after he joined WWE, Kane laced up his boots one final time. Inside the Thunderdome, 30 men entered the Royal Rumble match with the hope of winning and receiving a world title match at WrestleMania. We saw a number of familiar faces from WWE's past throughout the Rumble, and even an iconic mask. When the buzzer sounded for the 18th entrant, flames erupted, and out came the Devil's Favorite Demon. Kane's first victim was one of his old rivals, Edge. The Big Red Machine then chokeslammed Matt Riddle and Shinsuke Nakamura, and then grabbed Dolph Ziggler by the throat and threw him over the top rope. Kane set his sights on Ricochet, who tried to fight back, but got the chokeslam treatment and was eliminated. After all this fighting, Kane locked eyes on his former tag team partner, Daniel Bryan. It looked like we were going to see Team Hell No rise once again, but Kane instead gave Bryan a chokeslam. Damian Priest then approached Kane. The Big Red Machine still had plenty more choke slams to give, but Priest wasn't having it. The Puerto Rican wrestler smacked Kane around until throwing him out of the ring and eliminating the Big Red Machine. Of course, the Royal Rumble isn't exactly the best match to end one's in-ring career, but for Kane, I actually think it fits well. This is Kane's 18th appearance in the Royal Rumble match, 20th if you count the 1995 and 1997 Rumbles where he appeared as Isaac Yankum and Diesel respectively. Kane also holds the record for most eliminations if you count all of his Royal Rumble appearances. Basically what I'm saying is that Kane is synonymous with the Royal Rumble, so having this be his last match does fit. It was also cool seeing him bump into Edge and Daniel Bryan, considering Kane has history with both of them. Having Damian Priest be the one who finally eliminated him was also a nice way of giving a newer wrestler a rub. Not long after the Royal Rumble, Kane would be inducted into the 2021 WWE Hall of Fame. Being born on a farm in South Carolina, Big Show spent a lot of time outside and working on machines. It didn't take long to realize though that Big Show was a unique person. He became very tall, and this made him a natural for sports, especially basketball. It wasn't until he was in college though that Big Show found out he had agromagaly, which is what caused him to become a giant, but was also life-threatening. The giant underwent surgery in his pituitary gland, which thankfully was successful and helped keep him healthy. Unfortunately, while playing college basketball, Big Show's father passed away. The world's largest athlete lost motivation and ended up not advancing in his career as an athlete. He began working odd jobs, including being a car salesman. Despite this, Big Show ended up struggling financially. In fact, the Big Show was so poor that at one point, he ended up eating a sandwich made out of toothpaste. Of course, Big Show didn't like that, but luckily, a huge opportunity would arrive. The world's largest athlete ended up getting introduced to Hulk Hogan through a mutual friend. Hogan immediately saw that Big Show had what it took to be a wrestler and helped him get a job with WCW. After training for about six months, Show made his debut by not only beating Hulk Hogan, but also winning the World Heavyweight Championship. With an introduction like that, it's not too surprising that the Giant would have a dominant career. Even though he was one of the company's top stars, the Big Show was getting paid a fraction of what other talent was getting, and he ended up leaving WCW when his contract expired. One day after his 27th birthday, Big Show signed a long-term contract with WWE. 
At the St. Valentine's Day Massacre pay-per-view, Stone Cold Steve Austin and Vince McMahon were fighting each other in a steel cage. In the middle of the match, the giant emerged from under the ring and manhandled Steve Austin. Big Show unfortunately did his job a bit too well and accidentally threw Stone Cold out of the cage and allowed him to win. About a week later, the WWE fans were promptly introduced to the Big Show, who at the time was using his real name, Paul White. The Giant was an enforcer for Vince McMahon and ended up joining McMahon's faction, the Corporation. Later that night, The Rock, another member of the Corporation, was facing off against Mankind in a ladder match for the WWE Championship. The Big Show interfered and attacked Mankind, allowing Rock to win the title. Ironically, the next week, this had caused The Rock and Big Show to become enemies. Big Show claimed that The Rock wouldn't be champion without him, and this led to a verbal argument between them. Mankind intervened and suggested The Rock and Big Show have a match with Mankind as a special guest referee. Rocky and the Giant had too much pride and agreed to wrestle each other later that night, which led to The Big Show's first WWE match. Despite Mr. McMahon's plea, The Rock and Big Show were determined to prove who was the better man. The world's largest athlete came out second and take a listen to his entrance music. And we're gonna have the WWF Championship on the line, the big nasty Paul White against The Rock. You might recognize this because this is the same song that would be used by Luke Gallows about a decade later. Back to the match, The Rock started by shoving Big Show only for the giant to shove the great one back. Then, suddenly, Big Show kicked Mankind. It turned out the whole thing was a setup, and The Rock and The Big Show began attacking their special guest referee. Vince McMahon eventually came into the ring and punched a helpless Mankind in the face. Since the bell did ring, this was technically Big Show's first WWE match. However, let's talk about Big Show's second match, or his real first match in WWE. Even though it seemed like The Rock and the world's largest athlete were cool with each other, that wasn't actually the case. In the following weeks, Rock and Big Show started getting more and more upset with one another. In an effort to keep the corporation together, Vince McMahon set up a tag team match with The Rock and Big Show taking on Mankind and Rock's WrestleMania opponent, Stone Cold. Despite their disdain for each other, Big Show and Rocky agreed to team up. Once it came time for the match, the corporation members were the first two out. Mankind couldn't wait to get his hands on them and started attacking Big Show and Rock as soon as he got into the ring. Of course, two against one didn't work out well for Mankind, but luckily, Steve Austin quickly ran in and evened things out. The match officially got underway, and the Brahma Bull and the Texas Rattlesnake started off as the legal men. The Rock got his butt kicked by Stone Cold and later Mankind. The entire time, Big Show just stood there and watched, likely still upset with his tag team partner. Finally, the Giant did help The Rock by kicking Mankind in the back. That allowed Rocky to take control, and he soon tagged in the Big Show. The seven foot tall wrestler picked up where his tag team partner left off. The Big Show used just about every part of his body to inflict pain on Mankind. He even hit a side Russian leg sweep before taking out with the People's Champion. Rock continued wearing down Mankind's lifeless body, but Stone Cold Steve Austin helped keep the match alive. The Big Show soon tagged back in and went back to using his massive body to attack his opponent and choke him out. The Brahma Bull quickly tagged Big Show out, which wasn't a smart move as Mankind bought himself just enough time to tag in Stone Cold. The Rattlesnake unloaded on his WrestleMania opponent. Big Show eventually had to intervene, which prompted Mankind to get involved as well, and chaos broke out. All four wrestlers started brawling on the outside, with Big Show going after Mankind. This caused what was technically Big Show's second WWE match to end in a no contest. While both matches didn't have winners or losers, I think Big Show looked good. He was a tall guy who could move around the ring, and in addition to doing the typical giant stuff like chops and headbutts, the Big Show also used some more technical moves like a side rush and leg sweep and a super kick. It was also cool to see the Big Show already being used in a storyline, and having him in the ring with top stars like The Rock and Stone Cold I think only helped elevate him. Two weeks after the tag team match, the Big Show and Mankind would go one on one at WrestleMania 15, with the winner being the special guest referee for The Rock and Stone Cold's match later that night. Big Show ended up getting himself disqualified and lost the match. Vince McMahon was furious that the Giant did that, but Big Show responded by punching McMahon and leaving the corporation. Ironically, Big Show and Mankind would eventually form an alliance. Alongside Ken Shamrock and Test, the Giant and the deranged masked wrestler created the Union. They came together because they felt they had been treated unjustly by the corporation. They defeated their enemies at the Over the Edge pay-per-view, but the group would quietly dissolve after that. It didn't take long though for the Big Show to form a new alliance. On Raw, The Undertaker was being attacked by Kane. 
The world's largest athlete was the one who made the save, and he and the dead man shook hands afterward and formed a tag team. They won the WWE Tag Team Championship twice, but the alliance came to a sudden end when The Undertaker became injured. After that, the Big Show would take part in his famous, or perhaps infamous, storyline with the Big Boss Man. In the story, Big Show's father had recently died. Boss Man began making fun of the giant and even stole the casket Big Show's father was buried in. Big Show would get even by defeating Boss Man as well as three of the wrestlers at Survivor Series. And the night was made even sweeter when he beat Triple H and The Rock in the main event to win the WWE Championship. The Giant held the title for a clean 50 days before being defeated by Triple H on the first Raw of 2000. In an attempt to regain his title, Big Show entered the 2000 Royal Rumble. He made it to the final two, but was eliminated by The Rock. However, the Brahma Bull's feet actually touched the ground first. This began a long and complex storyline that basically ended up creating a fatal four-way elimination match for the WWE Championship at WrestleMania 2000. Big Show took on The Rock, Mick Foley, and the champion Triple H. On top of that, each wrestler had a member of the McMahon family in their corner, with Shane standing with Big Show. Despite having Shane O'Mac with them, Big Show was the first man eliminated due to the other three participants teaming up on him. After WrestleMania, Big Show began a gimmick where he'd impersonate different WWE stars, including Rikishi, Hulk Hogan, and others. Shane McMahon disapproved of Big Show's antics, which led to a match between them that Shane won thanks to help from his allies. This didn't really matter though, because the Big Show would later join Shane and Shane's group, The Conspiracy. The faction was short-lived, however, as Big Show's former tag team partner, The Undertaker, attacked the Giant and threw him off the Raw stage. Big Show would disappear from WWE following this incident. The reason for this was to give Big Show time to train in WWE's development system, OVW. After a few months there, Big Show returned to WWE at the 2001 Royal Rumble. From there, he had pursued the Hardcore Championship and became a three-time champion in the process. Shortly after this, the Invasion storyline would begin, with WCW and ECW trying to take over the WWE. The Giant remained loyal to WWE and was even a member of Team WWE during the 5 on 5 Survivor Series match. Jumping to 2002, WWE began the brand split, with Raw and SmackDown having their own exclusive rosters. Big Show was drafted to Raw, where he'd reunite with the NWO. While it seemed cool, it didn't really go anywhere. In fact, Big Show's entire time on Raw was rather lackluster. Things turned around when Big Show's trade to SmackDown later that year. He changed his look and went after the WWE Champion, Brock Lesnar. In a huge moment, Big Show, with help from Paul Heyman, not only won the WWE Championship, but also ended Lesnar's undefeated streak. While that was great, Big Show's second WWE title reign was short-lived, as he lost the championship a month after winning it. Afterwards, Big Show reunited a rivalry with an old friend and enemy in The Undertaker. Just like what Taker had done to him over a year ago, the Big Show returned the favor by throwing the Phenom off the SmackDown stage. The two finally got their hands on each other at the 2003 No Way Out pay-per-view. Undertaker won via submission, but was attacked by A-Train after the victory. A newcomer to WWE, Nathan Jones, ran in to make the save, which set up a tag team match at WrestleMania. It ended up being a handicap match instead, due to Big Show and A-Train attacking Jones hours before they were supposed to wrestle. Even with the advantage, Big Show and A-Train couldn't defeat the dead man, and the giant lost once again. Things didn't get any better afterwards either. Big Show went after Brock Lesnar, who was once again WWE Champion, but the Giant failed to win the title in every match. On the plus side, this did create that awesome moment where they broke the ring. Luckily, at No Mercy, Big Show would defeat Eddie Guerrero to win the United States Championship. His title reign did last 147 days, but it wasn't anything special. Big Show's time as US Champion finally came to an end at WrestleMania 20, where John Cena beat the Giant in Cena's first WrestleMania match. After the defeat, Big Show had a rematch with Eddie Guerrero, with the stipulation that if Big Show lost, he would quit WWE. The world's largest athlete ended up losing, and in his rage, Big Show chokeslammed Kurt Angle off a ledge. Despite quitting, the world's largest athlete would return a few months later, when SmackDown General Manager Teddy Long reinstated him. Building off the rivalry they already had, Big Show would agree to fight Kurt Angle at No Mercy. In the weeks leading up to the match, Angle used a tranquilizer to make Big Show unconscious and then shave the giant's head. As they say, he who laughs last, laughs hardest, and Big Show ultimately got the last laugh by defeating the Olympic gold medalist at No Mercy. The Giants' next big rivalry wouldn't happen until 2005. At WrestleMania 21, Big Show would face sumo wrestling legend Aki Bono in a, well, sumo match. Despite showing his gigantic strength in the weeks before the match, Big Show failed to defeat Aki Bono on the grandest stage of the mall. 
For the next several months, the Big Show had smaller feuds with the likes of Carlito, Matt Morgan, and Gene Snitsky. While those were alright, things got interesting again at the Taboo Tuesday pay-per-view. During the event, fans got to vote who would challenge John Cena for the WWE Championship. Their choices were Big Show, Kane, and Shawn Michaels. HBK won the poll, so Kane and Big Show ended up being given a World Tag Team Championship match. Despite being thrown together, the World's Hardest Athlete and the Big Red Machine defeated the champions and won the titles. Perhaps even more surprising, Big Show and Kane made for a pretty good tag team. They held the titles for 153 days and successfully defended them at WrestleMania 22. The group eventually lost their titles and broke up due to Kane having these sporadic fits of rage over the date May 19th. After splitting up with Kane, a third brand of WWE was about to launch called ECW. Before ECW's premiere episode, a battle royal between WWE and ECW wrestlers was set up. Big Show fought on the side of WWE, but as it turned out, he had switched alliances and was working with ECW. Not long after joining the new brand, Big Show won the ECW Championship, the first time he had held a world title since beating Brock Lesnar in 2002. He had a decent run at the title, but did lose it to Bobby Lashley at the December to Dismember pay-per-view in late 2006. Following the match, Big Show took time off to recover. Ultimately, however, Big Show let his contract expire and left WWE in February of 2007. He wouldn't be gone forever though. Almost exactly a year after leaving WWE, Big Show would make his return. At the No Way Out pay-per-view in 2008, the Giant made a surprise appearance. He attacked Rey Mysterio and taunted boxer Floyd Mayweather, who was watching the show from the front row. Big Show invited Mayweather into the ring and probably regretted the decision because the boxer threw several super fast punches and busted Big Show's nose. After an incident like that, these two had to have a match against each other, and they did. At WrestleMania 24, Big Show and Floyd Mayweather faced off in one of the biggest celebrity WWE matches of all time. Despite being the literal bigger man, Big Show walked away from WrestleMania in defeat. Things wouldn't pick up for Big Show until he was sent to SmackDown later that year. Big Show aligned himself with the general manager, Vicky Guerrero, and helped her in her ongoing feud with The Undertaker. The world's largest athlete did pick up a knockout win over The Undertaker at the No Mercy pay-per-view, but then lost three back-to-back -back matches against the dead man. Things started looking up though in 2009. Big Show would get a shot at the World Heavyweight Championship when he faced Edge and John Cena at WrestleMania 25. However, like every other WrestleMania match, Big Show lost yet again. The world's largest athlete wasn't done with Cena yet though. On the following pay-per-view, Backlash, the Giant attacked John Cena during a match and cost the leader of the C Nation the world title. This set up matches at Judgment Day and Extreme Rules, which Big Show lost. However, he did pick up a win over John Cena on Raw to end their rivalry. At Night of Champions, the unified WWE Tag Team Champions, Chris Jericho and Edge, were going to defend their titles. However, Edge was injured, so Jericho brought in Big Show as the Radar Superstars replacement. This made Big Show a Tag Team Champion, and he and Y2J successfully retained the belts. They went on to have a solid run as unified Tag Team Champions, but their time did come to an end when DX defeated them at TLC. After failing to regain the titles, Big Show walked away from Jericho, ending their partnership. The 7-foot giant wasn't done with the tag team division yet, as he found a new tag team partner, The Miz. Big Show won back the titles with his new teammate and wanted to have several successful defenses. One of them was at WrestleMania 26. This is important because this is the first time Big Show won a match at WrestleMania, over 10 years after his first match in 1999 against Mankind. Anyways, Big Show and Miz eventually lost the Unified Tag Team Championship, and, like with Jericho, Big Show ended the tag team after losing the belts. The world's largest athlete would move back to SmackDown, where he had an unsuccessful pursuit for the World Heavyweight Championship. Big Show made up for this by feuding with the Straight Edge Society. He defeated them in a 3 on 1 handicap match at SummerSlam, and defeated the leader, CM Punk, at Night of Champions. Things got interesting again in early 2011. Big Show was participating in a number one contenders match for the World Heavyweight Championship. However, the Giant lost the match due to interference by Wade Barrett. Over the following weeks, Big Show continued to be assaulted by Wade Barrett, as well as Heath Slater, Justin Gabriel, and Ezekiel Jackson, who would later call themselves the Core. In need of some allies, Big Show ended up reuniting with Kane. They were joined by Satina Morella and Kofi Kingston and defeated the Core at WrestleMania 27. On top of that, Big Show and Kane would defeat Heath Slater and Justin Gabriel a few weeks later to become tag team champions again. Unfortunately, their second title reign wasn't as dominant as their first. They lost the tag team championship to the new Nexus only about a month after winning the titles. 
Soon after that, Big Show feud with Mark Henry. The world's strongest man was beginning his Hall of Pain era, and Big Show was one of his victims. Henry injured the Giant after their match at Money in the Bank, sidelining Big Show for about three months. When he returned, Big Show was ready for revenge. Their rivalry continued throughout the rest of 2011. At the final pay-per-view of the year, TLC, Big Show was finally able to beat Mark Henry and become World Heavyweight Champion again. After the match, Henry knocked out Big Show, and then Daniel Bryan ran in and cashed his Money in the Bank contract, causing Big Show's world title reign to last only 45 seconds. Big Show would try to regain the world title, but his attempts were unsuccessful. Around this time, the Intercontinental Champion, Cody Rhodes, began making fun of Big Show by highlighting Big Show's embarrassing WrestleMania moments. This set up a match at WrestleMania 28, where the Giant shut up Cody and won the IC title. While it was a great victory, Big Show lost the title back to Rhodes only about a month after winning it. From there, the Big Show would have several confrontations with Raw and SmackDown General Manager John Laurinaitis. This ultimately led to Laurinaitis firing Big Show. Less than a week later, however, the world's largest athlete returned at the 2012 Over the Limit pay-per-view. The Giant got in the ring during a no-disqualification match between John Laurinaitis and John Cena. Shockingly, Big Show attacked Cena and helped Laurinaitis get the win. Big Show explained that no one showed him sympathy after he got fired, and John Laurinaitis agreed to give the Giant his job back if Big Show helped him defeat John Cena. For the next few months, the Big Show went on a rampage, attacking just about anyone who got in his path. This led to him becoming the number one contender for the World Heavyweight Championship. Big Show received his title match at the Hell in the Cell pay-per-view and defeated the champion, Sheamus. While much longer than his previous reign, Big Show's second run at the World Heavyweight Championship wasn't too special. He had several rematches with Sheamus before losing the title to Alberto Del Rio in early 2013. After failing to regain the belt, Big Show attacked Roman Reigns after the Big Dog accidentally got shoved into him. The Shield saw Big Show as an enemy and started attacking him. This created a short alliance between Big Show and Randy Orton and Sheamus, who had already been feuding with the Hounds of Justice. The two teams faced off at WrestleMania 29, where the Shield won. After the defeat, Big Show attacked his now former partners. This created a rivalry between Big Show, Orton, and Sheamus, ultimately leading to a match at Extreme Rules. The Viper won the fight, and the Giant disappeared from WWE for a while. When he returned, Big Show would speak out against the Authority, a faction led by Triple H and Stephanie McMahon. They forced him to attack his friends, such as Dusty Rhodes and Daniel Bryan, and do other dirty work. Big Show eventually got away from them, and for the next few months, had rivalries with the likes of Brock Lesnar, Rusev, and more. Finally, Big Show would go after the Authority again. At the 2014 Survivor Series, Big Show joined John Cena's team in a 5 on 5 elimination match against the Authority. As it turned out, Big Show was secretly working for the Authority and turned on Cena in the middle of the match. From there, Big Show would be an enforcer for the group and went for the Authority's enemies like John Cena, Roman Reigns, and Sting, but he would eventually quietly leave the group. After that, Big Show would have a lot of shorter rivalries and was mainly seen in bigger matches, like when he had a rematch against Brock Lesnar at Madison Square Garden, or his rivalry with the Wyatt family in 2016. At the 2017 Royal Rumble, Big Show would be eliminated by Braun Strowman. Strowman also eliminated Big Show during the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal at WrestleMania 33. This set up a match between the Giants on Raw that ended in a no contest due to the ring collapsing. A few months later, the Giants had one final match on Raw, this time in a steel cage that Strowman won. Strowman threw Big Show out of the cage afterward, and the world's largest athlete would disappear from WWE again. He'd be gone for about a year, returning in October 2018. When he did, Big Show joined Sheamus and Cesaro's group called The Bar. The partnership was short-lived, as Big Show got upset and punched Cesaro. In reality, this is done because Big Show needs surgery for a hamstring injury. After being absent for over a year, Big Show returned on the first Raw of 2020. He teamed up with Samoa Joe and Kevin Owens to take on his former authority friend, Seth Rollins, as well as AOP. Big Show went away for a few weeks, but returned the night after WrestleMania 36. The Jay insulted the newly crowned WWE Champion Drew McIntyre and challenged Drew to a match. Big Show ended up eating his own words, as the Scottish Warrior slayed the Giant. Shortly after this, Randy Orton defeated Edge in a match dubbed the greatest wrestling match ever. After the win, Orton began calling himself the greatest wrestler ever, and started attacking WWE legends. This got the attention of the Big Show, who challenged Randy Orton to an unsanctioned match. 
Little do we know, this would be the last time the Big Show would wrestle in WWE. Being that this was an unsanctioned match, WWE would not be liable for whatever happened, which made it extremely dangerous for both wrestlers. Even though his first match was over 20 years ago, Big Show was still fast. Seconds after the bell rang, the Giant had grabbed his opponent and began hitting him with fists. After just a few blows, Randy Orton was on the ground in pain. Randy Orton tried to get some shots in, but that only made Big Show more aggressive. After getting hit by a gigantic spear, Orton wisely rolled to the outside. Big Show followed suit and grabbed a table from under the ring. Before he could get back into the ring, Angel Garza and Andrade, who Randy Orton had been working with, attacked the Giant. Luckily, the Viking Raiders came in and evened the playing field. The tag teams eventually left and Big Show and Randy Orton returned to the ring. Big Show fought out of a submission hold with a headbutt. However, the move also did some damage to the Giant. Despite that, Big Show managed to start making a comeback. The momentum was derailed briefly when Orton hit Big Show's knees, but the Giant quickly bounced back when he turned a punt kick into a choke slam. The world's largest athlete got ready to follow up with the KO punch, but the Viper escaped by rolling to the outside again. Big Show used the time wisely by setting up the table he had brought out earlier. Orton's lifeless body was draped over the piece of furniture, but at the last second, Randy moved out of the way, causing Big Show to hit the table full force. The Apex Predator struck his injured opponent with an RKO, but Big Show didn't stay down for the three count. Orton introduced a chair into the match, and the steel connected with Big Show's body. After a third strike, it was clear that the world's hardest athlete was in serious pain. Big Show's body was draped over the top rope, allowing Randy to hit his vintage DDT. After that, Orton was finally able to execute the RKO and put the match away. Despite having his hand raised, that wasn't enough for Randy. The Viper stalked his prey and striked with a punt kick to the head. The match wasn't crazy, but it was enjoyable. I especially liked how Big Show hurt himself after hitting the headbutt. He was able to do the move fine in his first match, so this helped show that Big Show's age was becoming an issue. Randy Orton did a good job being the ruthless villain, and the way he hit Big Show with the chair and later the punt kick looked really nasty. While it would have been cool to see Big Show go out looking strong, I think this wasn't a bad way to end his WWE career, since it helped further Randy Orton's storyline. We would see Big Show again a few months later at SummerSlam. During Drew McIntyre and Randy Orton's ambulance match, the legends the Viper had beaten helped McIntyre. One of them was the Big Show, who chokeslammed Randy through the announcer's table. The world's largest athlete made his final appearance in WWE on the special Raw Legends Night in January 2021. Big Show was backstage and was confronted by Randy Orton. Orton taunted Big Show, saying that he ended the Giants' career. Big Show stayed calm and told Randy he was still able to compete, but it seemed as though the Viper had hurt Big Show's pride. If this was building to a rematch, it unfortunately never happened. In February 2021, All Elite Wrestling announced that Big Show, using his real name, Paul White, had signed with them. In addition to wrestling, the 7-foot wrestler also works as a commentator for the company. Considering how long Big Show had been part of WWE, this is a big shocker. No, pun intended. Jeffrey Nero Hardy was born in Cameron, North Carolina in 1977. From a young age, Hardy had a love for action, as he took part in extreme sports like football and motocross. But it was wrestling that quickly captured his attention. Jeff grew up watching WWE, with his favorite wrestlers being The Ultimate Warrior, Hulk Hogan, and Shawn Michaels. Jeff's childhood sadly wasn't all good though. He and his brother Matt lost their mother to brain cancer when Jeff was only 9 years old. This didn't stop them from pursuing their passion though, and the Hardy brothers began wrestling in their backyard and even held their own shows. As they grew up, the Hardys learned more and more and started wrestling for small companies around their area. Thanks to a combination of their hard work, some people they knew, a bit of luck, and a little lying, Jeff Hardy was given a huge opportunity. WWE was hosting a show in Ohio and they needed an opponent for Razor Ramon. Ramon's original opponent backed out on short notice and a 16 year old Jeff Hardy was asked to fill in. Hardy agreed, but claimed he was 18. Under the impression that he was an adult, WWE let Jeff Hardy compete, leading to Hardy's first WWE match. In the main event of Raw, Jeff Hardy, wrestling under the name Keith Davis, took on future Hall of Famer Razor Ramon. The match began with Razor kicking Hardy in the gut and backing him into the corner. Ramon then whipped Hardy across the ring, and while Jeff tried to make a comeback, the charismatic enigma was no match for the bad guy's strength. 
Razor Ramon then started stretching the young Hardy and wasn't taking the match too seriously. Razor even lifted Jeff by his pants and started attacking him in the corner. An elbow to the face sent Hardy back to the mat and the bad guy followed that up by slamming his opponent into the turnbuckle. Jeff's lifeless body was then hoisted up to the top and sent crashing down with a belly to back suplex. Finally, Ramon signaled for the Razor's Edge and planted the 16-year-old wrestler on the canvas and ended the match. The backstory of how Jeff Hardy got put into this match is a lot more interesting than the match itself. It was a squash, which can be fun, but this is just dull. There was a lot of time spent with Razor Ramon just taunting Jeff Hardy, and it wasn't that interesting. But imagine telling fans in 1994 that this Keith Davis guy would eventually become one of the most popular WWE wrestlers of all time. We got a little ways to go before that, however. After his WWE debut, Jeff Hardy would spend the next few years doing more of the same. He was used as an enhancement talent and would lose to more established stars. Jeff's brother Matt was doing a very similar thing at the time as well. It wouldn't be until 1996 that the Hardys would start taking together in WWE. They still lost most of the time and were used to make other people look good. Finally, after about five years, both Jeff and Matt would be given a chance. In 1999, the brothers were given a new look, as well as a manager, former Freebird member Michael Hayes. The Hardys finally started to pick up some victories and began an iconic rivalry with a group called The Brood, which consisted of Edge, Christian, and Gangrel. Things got even better when the Hardys captured the tag team titles by defeating the Acolytes in July 1999. While they dropped the belts back to Bradshaw and Farouk a month later, it was an encouraging start. Eventually, Jeff and Matt got rid of Michael Hayes and joined forces with their former enemy, Gangrel, and they started calling themselves the New Brood. It was a short-lived group though, as the Hardys had their eyes on someone else to guide their careers. They soon engaged in a classic feud with Edge and Christian over the managerial services of Terry Reynolds. The Hardys came out on the winning side of that battle and continued dominating the tag team division, now as Terry by their side. That was until she turned on Jeff and Matt and joined Edge and Christian. It was probably for the best, as this opened the door for Lita to join the Hardys and together they became known as Team Extreme. Now with Lita by their side, the Hardys continued to put on spectacular matches, with stellar showings at SummerSlam 2000 in the first ever TLC match and an all-time classic at WrestleMania 17 against Edge and Christian and the Dudley Boys. During these brutal matches, Jeff became increasingly known for his high-risk moves, and fans loved him because of it. After spending about two years teaming with his brother, Jeff was given a shot as a singles wrestler in 2001. He quickly became a fan favorite, as well as a title holder, when he defeated Triple H for the Intercontinental Championship. Unfortunately though, he lost it right back to the game just a few days later. Luckily, Jeff Hardy picked himself up and captured the hardcore title for Mike Awesome and battled Rob Van Dam in a series of memorable matches. During all of this, Jeff and Matt were still a tag team, but signs of tension began to appear. This caused them to fight each other at Vengeance 2001 with Lita as the guest referee. Jeff picked up the win after hitting the Swanton Bomb, but this storyline was poorly received by fans. WWE ended up dropping it and Team Extreme was back together. Unfortunately for the brothers, their next opponent was the next big thing, Brock Lesnar, who had recently debuted. Things didn't go so well for the two as Brock dominated the majority of the feud, including beating them in a match where Lesnar had Paul Heyman as his tag team partner. After the storyline wrapped up, it was time for the Hardys to officially split. Matt became part of the SmackDown roster while Jeff would stay on Raw. The charismatic Enigma saw initial success after winning the European Championship from William Regal and found himself featured in prominent matches on Raw. One of the defining moments of Hardy's career though was when he took on The Undertaker in a ladder match for the WWE title. Jeff showed a ton of heart and came close to capturing the championship. Undertaker did retain his title, but Jeff Hardy had earned the dead man's respect in an all-time classic Raw moment. Things were looking pretty good for Jeff, but in January 2003, we would see Hardy become a bad guy. He attacked Rob Van Dam and Shawn Michaels, but this run as a villain only lasted about a month before Hardy was back to being a good guy again. Sadly though, in April 2003, Jeff Hardy was released from his WWE contract. The reasons given were no showing events, drug use, and that Jeff refused to go to rehab. Hardy would spend the next few years competing on the independent scene and later joining an upstart wrestling company called TNA. Unfortunately, controversy continued to follow Jeff as he no shown a couple of TNA events and was suspended and eventually released in 2006. While the TNA door was shut, the WWE's door was open once again, and in August 2006, Jeff Hardy returned to the company. He began feuding with the Intercontinental Champion, Johnny Nitro, and while things didn't work out at first, Jeff did eventually defeat Nitro and win the title. This rivalry evolved into a tag team feud as Nitro got his partner, Joey Mercury, involved while Hardy reunited with his brother, Matt. 
The teams faced off several times between 2006 and 2007, with the Hardys coming out on top in most of their matches. Unfortunately, Jeff Hardy's singles career would suffer, as he lost the Intercontinental title to Omaga in February 2007. But things quickly turned around for Jeff when he and Matt defeated four other teams to become the World Tag Team Champions. Their main rivalry as champions was with Lance Cade and Trevor Murdoch. The Hardys defeat the two on a couple of occasions, only to lose the titles to them on Raw in June 2007. While the Hardys were still together, Jeff Hardy began to focus again on his singles career. He reignited his rivalry with Umaga, who is still Intercontinental Champion. This time, Hardy defeated the Samoan Bulldozer and once again became IC Champion. But this is only the start of something bigger for Jeff Hardy. He began being put in bigger matches and didn't crumble in defeat. This earned him a number one contenders match for the WWE title at the Armageddon pay-per-view. Jeff Hardy's opponent was Triple H, and while the odds were not in Jeff's favor, he pulled off a big upset and defeated the game. This meant that Jeff would face the WWE Champion Randy Orton at the 2008 Royal Rumble for the title. The Viper decided to make it personal and brutally attack Matt Hardy. Sadly, Jeff Hardy was unable to get his revenge and lost to Orton at the Rumble. To make matters worse, a couple of months later, Jeff Hardy not only lost the Intercontinental Championship, but would also be suspended for 60 days due to him failing a drug test. It seemed like Jeff Hardy's career had nosedived, and it did. But like a phoenix, Jeff came back stronger than ever. Once he returned, the charismatic Enigma feuded with his former rival, Umaga, and defeated him in an awesome Falls Count Anywhere match. Jeff was then sent to SmackDown, where he'd be a contender for the WWE Championship. For the rest of 2008, Hardy would try and try to win the title, but came up short each and every time. It seemed like Jeff Hardy was just never meant to be a world champion. At the 2008 Armageddon pay-per-view, Hardy got one more shot at the WWE title. He was part of a triple threat match involving the champion, Edge, and Triple H, and then it finally happened. Jeff hit the Swanton Bomb, got the 1-2-3, and won. Jeff Hardy had finally made it to the top and became WWE Champion. It was a fantastic moment and solidified Jeff Hardy as a top star. Hardy's first title offense was against the former champion Edge at the 2009 Royal Rumble. During the match, Matt Hardy came out to help his brother, only for Matt to shockingly betray Jeff and cost him the title. After many personal attacks, Jeff Hardy finally agreed to fight his brother. The Hardys fought each other at WrestleMania 25, where Jeff Hardy actually lost. Matt Hardy would also defeat him in a stretcher match as well. Finally, Jeff got his revenge at Backlash when he defeated Matt in an I Quit match. With that rivalry behind him, Jeff was right back in the title scene. On an episode of SmackDown, he defeated three other men to become the number one contender for Edge's World Heavyweight Championship. The two longtime rivals squared off at Judgment Day, but interference from Matt Hardy cost Jeff his golden opportunity. Jeff Hardy thankfully got one more shot at Extreme Rules and finally picked up the big victory and became World Heavyweight Champion. However, this title reign was very short, as C CM Punk used his Money in the Bank contract and defeated Jeff to win the world title. As you've learned, Jeff Hardy is resilient, and Hardy picked himself up and defeated CM Punk at Night of Champions to win back the gold. For whatever reason, Jeff Hardy World Championships do not mix, and at the next pay-per-view, SummerSlam, CM Punk defeated Hardy and Jeff lost the belt again. Hardy got his rematch on the following episode of SmackDown in a steel cage match. The fight had a special stipulation that the loser would leave WWE. In a heartbreaking moment, Jeff lost the match and was forced to say goodbye. In real life, the reason for this was to give Hardy time off to heal his body. However, like in the storyline, Jeff Hardy really did not have a contract with WWE. This resulted in Hardy returning to TNA in 2010. For seven years, Jeff was one of the top stars in the company, winning the world title on three different occasions and often being featured in major storylines. Of course, it wasn't all highlights for the charismatic enigma, as he continued to battle drug and alcohol issues and infamously ruined the main event of Victory Road 2011. TNA didn't give up on him though, and Jeff eventually reunited with his brother and later feuded with them when Matt became Broken Matt Hardy. Both Jeff and Matt's TNA contracts eventually expired in early 2017. Just like the last time, WWE welcomed Jeff and his brother back and they made a surprise return at WrestleMania 33. They competed against three other teams for the Raw Tag Team Championship. It was also a ladder match, so the Hardys were legally required to win. Jeff and Matt continued to ride the momentum for the next few months, defending and retaining their titles on several occasions. However, all championship reigns come to an end, and at Extreme Rules, so did the Hardys. Afterward, Jeff Hardy would explore his singles career and even became the number one contender for the Intercontinental Championship, but was unsuccessful in his title match. Sadly, Jeff Hardy would suffer a shoulder injury and needed several months off to recover. The charismatic Enigma finally returned in April 2018 and soon defeated the United States Champion, Jinder Mahal, and won the title. 
Hardy had a solid run at the belt, holding it for exactly 90 days. He lost the US Championship to Shinsuke Nakamura, and to throw Salt into the wound, Randy Orton came out afterward and low blowed Hardy. The Viper and the Charismatic Enigma would feud for the next couple of months, ultimately leading to a Hell in a Cell match that Jeff Hardy lost. The next few months would be pretty uneventful for Jeff. He would compete in big matches, like the World Cup Tournament, the Royal Rumble, and the Elimination Chamber, but didn't win any of them. However, in February 2019, Matt Hardy made his WWE return and reunited with Jeff. Then, in April, the Hardy brothers defeated the Usos to win the SmackDown Tag Team Championship. As we know, however, Jeff Hardy has the worst luck with title reigns. 21 days after winning the tag team belts, the Hardys had to vacate them due to Jeff getting injured. It would be almost an entire year before fans saw Jeff Hardy again. In March 2020, Jeff made his return on SmackDown, but unfortunately, the pandemic era had just begun. Things got back on track when Hardy began a feud with Sheamus. It started when the Celtic Warrior mocked Jeff for his history of addiction problems. This ultimately led to, ironically, a bar fight, which Jeff Hardy won. Hardy's next feud was with the Intercontinental Champion AJ Styles after Jeff issued a challenge to AJ. A week later, Jeff Hardy beat Styles and was once again IC Champion. Jeff would rather ironically lose the belt in a ladder match involving AJ Styles and Sami Zayn. Soon after, Jeff Hardy would be sent to Raw as part of the 2020 draft. He began a feud with Elias that ran through the rest of the year that Hardy more or less won. In 2021, while Jeff was still popular with fans, he began losing quite a bit. It was mainly used to put over newer stars like Damian Priest and Karrion Cross. Ironically, this is exactly what Jeff Hardy was doing as a teenager in the mid-90s. In October, Jeff got a new start when he was moved over to SmackDown. Things started out pretty good for Jeff Hardy, as he won his first two matches on the brand and was part of Team SmackDown at Survivor Series. Everything seemed to be going fine, but little did we know that Jeff Hardy was about to leave WWE. On the November 26, 2021 episode of SmackDown, Jeff Hardy would compete in his final two WWE matches. The first match of the night was a tag team contest, which saw Hardy and Drew McIntyre defeat Happy Corbin and Madcap Moss. The charismatic enigma even got the pin for his team. Later that night, an 18-man battle royal was set up, with the winner becoming the number one contender for the Universal Championship. Jeff Hardy was one of the participants, and not even he knew that this would be his last WWE match. Before the battle royal actually got started, Jeff's former tag team partner, Drew McIntyre, ran into the ring with his sword. Luckily, all it took was a commercial break, and when we came back, McIntyre was gone. Now that the battle royal was underway, Jeff Hardy's first target was Madcap Moss. Jeff, who had changed his attire and gotten rid of his face paint, tried to eliminate Moss, but got attacked from behind by Rich Holland. Hardy then formed an alliance with Mansoor, but Holland overpowered both of them. After recovering, Jeff saw an opportunity and took it, and made the first elimination by pushing Jinder Mahal out of the ring. There was no rest for Jeff, as Shanky started shoving his massive boot into Hardy's throat. The charismatic enigma stayed close to the ground until he found an opportunity to get back at Shanky. Jeff wasn't able to do much damage though, as Madcap Moss returned and began attacking Hardy. Moss even tried to eliminate Jeff, but thanks to the chaos, Jeff Hardy was able to get away. Hardy then laid low for a bit, but when he got to his feet, his old rival, Sheamus, went after him. In a moment of pure luck, the Celtic warrior abruptly left Jeff Hardy and focused his attention on someone else. Jeff Hardy went back to the ground, and it became clear that he was hurt, likely due to having wrestled already. However, after returning from a commercial break, Jeff Hardy was not only on his feet, but he was inches away from eliminating Sheamus. Unfortunately, the Celtic Warrior got the better of Jeff, and Hardy fell back onto the mat. Unfortunately, Happy Corbin saw that Jeff was wounded and decided to try and eliminate him. Even though he was hurt, Jeff managed to stun Corbin just long enough to get back inside the ring. Hardy tried to go on the offensive and take out Ricochet, but that didn't go too well. With the Battle Royal coming to an end, the action started getting more intense, but Jeff Hardy couldn't do much. Realizing that it was do or die, Jeff Hardy had a burst of adrenaline and ambushed Happy Corbin and Sheamus. Hardy hit Sheamus with a whisper in the wind, and Corbin with a twist of fate. Corbin then suddenly pulled a fast one and eliminated Sheamus, which allowed Jeff to eliminate Happy, and it appeared he won the Battle Royal. As Jeff Hardy was celebrating, Sami Zayn, who hadn't been eliminated, ran in and knocked Jeff out of the ring. Kind of a disappointing way to end the match, but considering the way the storyline went with Sami Zayn, I think it worked fine. Talking about Jeff Hardy's last match though, it made sense that Hardy didn't do much considering he had already wrestled, but I think it would have been better if he played a more active role. The way the match was played out, Jeff Hardy just felt like another body in the ring, and I was honestly surprised that he lasted till the very end. The commentators didn't even acknowledge when Jeff Hardy eliminated Jinder Mahal, which only added to this feeling that Hardy wasn't really a big part of the Battle Royal. 
At the very least, it was cool that Jeff Hardy had his last match in front of his home state of North Carolina. About a week after his match on SmackDown, Jeff Hardy would wrestle at a non-televised WWE event in Texas. Before I go on, I know what you're thinking. Wouldn't this be Jeff Hardy's last match? Fair point, but on Bell to Bell, we only look at wrestlers' matches on TV. With that cleared up, Hardy was wrestling a 3-on-3 tag team match at the Texas show. In a very bizarre moment, Jeff Hardy just randomly left the ring and started walking through the crowd. This wasn't part of the show, and it made people wonder if Hardy was under the influence. So far, there hasn't been anything to suggest that Jeff was, but there still isn't any explanation why he up and left the match. Either way, WWE sent Jeff Hardy home following the incident, and shortly thereafter, they would release him from his contract. Batista's birth is an interesting story. The future WWE star's mother went into labor in Maryland. However, she refused to have her child born anywhere besides Washington, D.C., so Batista's father drove them to the capital of the U.S., and a future WWE champion entered the world. However, life wasn't so glamorous for the young Batista. His father would leave the family, and three people had been killed on Batista's front lawn before he was even nine years old. Because of this, Batista's family moved across the country to San Francisco, California, but unfortunately, trouble would continue. As young as 13 years old, Batista was stealing cars, and by 17, he was kicked out of his parents' house and living on his own. This would lead to Batista working as a bouncer and eventually getting into bodybuilding. The animal did this for about 10 years, but at a life-changing moment when he had to ask a co-worker if he could borrow money to buy Christmas presents for his children. The embarrassment made Batista want to change his life and led to him training to become a wrestler at 30 years old. He eventually got connected with Afa Anawahi, who was one half of the Wild Samoans in WWE. Afa could see that Batista was someone special and got the animal a tryout with WWE. One day later, WWE offered Batista a job and he began training at the development system Ohio Valley wrestling. The future world champion would spend about two years there until it came time for him to make his WWE debut. On the May 9th, 2002 episode of SmackDown, Vince McMahon was meeting with his spiritual advisor, Reverend Devon. McMahon asked if he was here, to which Devon said yes. A little later on, we found out who he was. When Reverend Devon came out for his match at Triple H, he was accompanied by a huge man. This monster of a being was named Deacon Batista, and he was there to protect Devon's building fund. The Reverend's match at Triple H started soon after, where Deacon Batista would help Devon by attacking the game while the referee wasn't looking. However, it was thanks to interference by Chris Jericho that ultimately got Devon the win. Things stayed mostly the same for the next few weeks, with Deacon Batista being the muscle for Reverend Devon. However, the future animal would eventually drop the Deacon and just be referred to as Batista. Finally, seven weeks after he debuted, the animal would be unleashed and competed in his first WWE match. As expected, Batista's debut match was a tag team contest with Reverend Devon. Their opponents were Farouk and, ironically, Randy Orton. Devon and Orton started the match, and it took nearly three minutes before Batista did anything. Once he was the legal man, Batista quickly took Randy Orton down with a monstrous clothesline. The animal then took out Farouk, ran Randy Orton to the corner, and then finished his future Evolution teammate off with a vicious spine buster to get the pin. The tag team match itself was pretty enjoyable, and while Batista looked excellent, I think they went a bit too far. The man only hit four moves, one of which was a push into the turnbuckles, and the other was a shove off the apron. Maybe Batista was just limited at the time, so this is their way of hiding it, but it felt like WWE was trying to make Batista seem really strong by having him win with just a few moves. Anyways, Batista would continue to tag with Devon until August 8th, 2002, when the former Deacon had his first ever singles match against Rikishi. However, due to an unintended attack by Devon, Rikishi beat Batista and gave him his first loss. This created tension between the two, and ultimately led to Batista turning on his mentor a few weeks later. They soon fought one-on-one, -on -one, where Batista got even by laying out the Reverend. Shortly after that, Batista was moved over to the Raw brand. There he formed an alliance with Ric Flair, which helped him score a victory over Kane at the final pay-per-view of 2002, Armageddon. Soon after, Batista would join former enemies Triple H and Randy Orton, as well as Ric Flair, to form Evolution. This helped solidify Batista's career, but it actually didn't start out that great for the animal. About a month after Evolution was formed, Batista tore his right tricep muscle at a non-televised WWE show. Because of this, Batista spent much of 2003 sidelined. He returned in October, attacking and injuring Goldberg, and in doing so, got the bounty Triple H had placed on the World Heavyweight Champion. The animal picked up right where he left off and continued assisting his Evolution teammates. At the final pay-per-view of the year, Armageddon, Batista and Ric Flair teamed up and won the World Tag Team Championship, the first title Batista ever won in WWE. They would, however, lose the titles about two months later to Booker T and Rob Van Dam, but won the belts back just a few weeks after that. Around that same time, Batista was gearing up for his first WrestleMania match. Along with Ric Flair and Randy Orton, the animal fought Mick Foley and The Rock in a handicap match. While Batista didn't get the pin, 
Revolution was victorious at the grandest stage for them all. The momentum from the big win didn't last long, however. Shortly after WrestleMania, Batista and Flair lost the World Tag Team Championship again, this time to Edge and Chris Benoit, and the Evolution partners would never regain the gold. Batista would continue to help his teammates in the following months, but he started to change. The animal wouldn't agree with everything the group did, and even started to butt heads with the leader, Triple H. However, Batista remained part of Evolution, even when the group kicked out Randy Orton after he won the World Heavyweight Championship. Batista would also help the game regain the world title when Triple H fought Randy Orton at Unforgiven 2004. While Batista continued to support Triple H, the Washington native went against the King of Kings' wishes and entered the 2005 Royal Rumble match. On top of that, Batista won after that infamous botched ending where Batista and John Cena both went over the top rope. After the victory, Batista had a choice of which championship he would challenge for at WrestleMania, either Triple H's World Heavyweight title or JBL's WWE Championship. The game tried to get the animal to challenge for the WWE title. He showed an interview of JBL mocking Batista, and later, a limo that looked like JBL's nearly ran over the animal. Thankfully, Triple H was in the right place at the right time. However, Batista and the fans would later find out that it was all set up by the King of Kings. Triple H's plan to keep Batista from challenging him had failed, and the animal chose the game as his WrestleMania opponent. The now former teammates went one-on-one -on -one at the grandest stage of them all, where the animal reigned supreme. In the aftermath, Batista and Triple H fought two more times, but Batista was unstoppable. Soon after, Batista was drafted from Raw to SmackDown and took the World Heavyweight Championship with him. Upon his return to SmackDown, Batista attacked JBL, who had just become the number one contender for the world title. They officially fought a few weeks later at the Great American Bash pay-per-view. During the match, JBL's head Frenchman, Orlando Jordan, tried to attack the world champion with a steel chair. Batista instead grabbed the chair and hit Orlando and JBL with it. This caused the match to end in a disqualification, and the animal walked away with the title. Batista and JBL went at it again at SummerSlam in a no-holds-barred match, where Batista was the decisive winner. After JBL, Batista moved on to another former WWE champion, Eddie Guerrero. Batista beat Latino Heat at no mercy, but did sing him happy birthday after the match. After that, the animal became a target of Big Show and Kane, the World Tag Team Champions. Batista sort of got his hands on them at Survivor Series when he captained Team SmackDown against Team Raw, which Show and Kane were a part of. While Batista did get eliminated, his brand was successful. Batista still had unfinished business with Kane and Big Show, though, so he got a tag team partner, Rey Mysterio. They defeated the tag team champions, Eminem, to win the titles, and then fought Big Show and Kane two days later. Unfortunately, the animal and the luchador weren't so fortunate in that encounter. Even worse, about two weeks later, Batista and Ray would lose their tag championship back to Eminem when a returning Mark Henry interfered in their match. The world's strongest man specifically targeted Batista and made it clear he was coming for the Animals World Championship. However, in early 2006, Batista would get injured at a non-televised WWE show. About a week later, Batista would be forced to relinquish the title to undergo surgery, ending his World Championship reign at 280 days. While recovering, Batista appeared at WrestleMania 22 and said that the World Heavyweight title would be back around his waist by next year's WrestleMania. The animal finally got a start on his goal of becoming World Heavyweight Champion again in July 2006, when he officially returned to in-ring action. The animal immediately called up Mark Henry, but before they could go one-on-one, -on -one, Mark Henry would be injured. Instead, Batista began a feud with Mr. Kennedy. Batista would technically lose to Kennedy two times, the first by disqualification and the second by countout. Finally, in their third match, Batista got the pinfall victory over the man from Green Bay, Wisconsin. After that, Batista focused on his goal of becoming World Heavyweight Champion. The man holding the title was King Booker, and the animal got a shot at SummerSlam 2006. However, due to Booker's wife, Charmel, the animal won the match, but not the heavyweight title. Batista got another shot at the next pay-per-view, No Mercy, in a fatal foreign match, but the gold slipped through his fingers again. Finally, after all the fails, Batista regained the World Heavyweight Championship at Survivor Series. The animal ended the year on a high note, but as 2007 started, Batista came face to face with an old rival, Mr. Kennedy. They fought it out at the 2007 Royal Rumble, where the world champion proved his superiority by beating Kennedy again. That same night, The Undertaker won the Royal Rumble match and later chose Batista as his WrestleMania opponent. Before that, The Animal and The Dead Man teamed up to take on John Cena and Shawn Michaels at No Way Out. During the match, Batista betrayed his tag team partner and, in doing so, turned heel for the first time since his days in Evolution. This added fuel to the fire in the lead up to WrestleMania 23. Like Batista claimed one year ago, he did walk into the event as the World Heavyweight Champion. Unfortunately for him, he did not walk out the same. The Phenom defeated the World Champ and not only took Batista's title, but also gave the Animal his first defeat at WrestleMania. Batista wasn't going down that easily though. They fought again at the next pay-per-view backlash where the match ended after Batista speared the Undertaker off the stage. A 
third match was set up on SmackDown shortly after, this time in a steel cage. The match also ended in a draw, but Edge, who had the Money in the Bank contract, cashed in and stole the Phenom's World Heavyweight Championship. Batista then turned his attention to the Radar Superstar and fought him at Judgment Day, but was unsuccessful. The Animal got another shot at vengeance, but the match had a special stipulation. If Batista didn't win, then he could never challenge Edge for the World Heavyweight Championship. The former champion took his shot, but unfortunately, the risk did not pay off. However, the stipulation ended up not really mattering because Edge would have to relinquish the title soon after, and a 20-man battle royal was set up to crown a new heavyweight champion. Batista entered the match, but was one of the final men eliminated by the Great Khali. Both Batista and Kane would challenge the new world champion just two days later at the Great American Bash pay-per-view. However, Khali won the match. About a month later, Batista got his one-on-one -on -one fight with the Indian Giant at SummerSlam. Despite an impressive performance, the animal did not become a three-time world champion, due to Great Khali getting himself disqualified. Finally though, after nine title matches, Batista finally won the World Heavyweight Championship again, when he defeated the Great Khali and Rey Mysterio in a triple threat match at Unforgiven. Batista and the Great Khali would square off one more time in a Punjabi prison match where the animal had his hand raised at the end of that one too. Around this time, Batista's old rival, The Undertaker, returned and the two reignited their feud. They fought at Cyber Sunday where fans voted to have Stone Cold Steve Austin be the special guest referee. Undertaker hit the champion with a lot of big moves, but Batista somehow managed to stay alive. Finally, after executing not one, but two Batista bombs, the animal was able to end the match. Of course, it didn't stop there, and Batista would come face to face with the dead man again, this time inside Hell in a Cell. It was another brutal match, but the ending was different. Edge had disguised himself as a cameraman and attacked the Undertaker. He then placed Batista over Taker, allowing the animal to win. In the aftermath, Vicky Guerrero, who was the SmackDown general manager in Edge's love interest, set up a World Heavyweight Championship match between Batista and the Radar Superstar. However, Undertaker pulled an Uno reverse and interfered in the match, causing a no contest. This set up a triple threat match at the final pay-per-view of 2007, Armageddon, during which two other Edges appeared and helped the real Edge win. These two guys later turned out to be Zack Ryder and Kurt Hawkins. Unfortunately for Batista, the year ended without any championship gold, but fun fact, Batista was part of every every single World Heavyweight Championship match on pay-per-view in 2007. Anyways, the animal was anxious to get the gold back around his waist, and he had that opportunity at the 2008 Royal Rumble. This is the first time since 2005 that the three-time world champion had been in the Rumble match. Batista entered at number 8 and made it all the way to the final three. However, unlike in 2005, Batista got thrown over the top rope and was eliminated for real. I guess lightning only strikes once, or does it? Anyways, the animal had one more shot at the World Heavyweight Championship match and the next pay-per-view, No Way Out. The animal was one of six men who competed in the Elimination Chamber match, where the winner would challenge Edge for the title at WrestleMania 24. Like the Royal Rumble, Batista made it to the very end, but was the last man eliminated by his former foe, The Undertaker. With no championship opportunity available to him, Batista took a more low-key route and faced Umaga at WrestleMania. The animal Batista bombed his way to victory, which gave him momentum going to his next feud with Shawn Michaels. On the SmackDown after WrestleMania, Batista confronted HBK, who had just defeated Ric Flair and forced the Nature Boy to retire. The animal said Shum was selfish and egotistical for what he did, which ultimately set up a match between them at Backlash. Chris Jericho was added in as a special guest referee, but during the match, it appeared that Michaels had injured his knee. It turned out to be fake, and HBK used it to help him defeat Batista and win. In the aftermath, Batista earned the right to a rematch with Shawn Michaels at the next pay-per-view, One Night Stand. The stakes were raised by making it a stretcher match, and this did the trick for Batista, as he defeated Shawn and ended their feud. The next big chapter in Batista's career was when he was drafted from SmackDown to Raw. Batista had the opportunity to take the World Heavyweight Championship with them when he faced Edge at Night of Champions. However, thanks to shenanigans involving Zack Ryder, Kurt Hawkins, Vicky Guerrero, and Chavo, Edge won the match. The next night, Batista got even and laid out the world champion. This allowed the Money in the Bank winner, CM Punk, to cash in and win the gold. The Animal then won a Fatal 4 match to become the number one contender for the belt. He and CM Punk faced off at the Great American Bash, but Batista was unable to win his fourth world championship due to interference by Kane. This set up a rematch between CM Punk and Batista the next night, which, fun fact, was the last TV14 WWE match before Raw went PG. 
Anyways, during the rematch, JBL interfered. John Cena ran in to help, but accidentally hit Batista instead. This started a brawl that required WWE officials to break up. The next week, Batista said he had no issues with John Cena, but Cena found that hard to believe. Regardless, the two would be put into a tag team match against JBL and Kane that Batista and Cena won. Then, it was announced that Cena and Batista would face off at SummerSlam, the first time they had ever fought in a one-on-one -on -one match. Even then, the Animal and John Cena would continue teaming together, and they actually won the World Tag Team Championship. However, tension began to rise between the SummerSlam opponents. This resulted in them losing the tag team titles a week after winning them. With tempers flaring, the two faces of WWE finally went one-on-one -on -one six years after they debuted. The fans were split on who they wanted to see win, and both men laid out everything they had. The match was so physical that John Cena legitimately got injured during it. In the end, though, Batista won. This gave the animal loads of momentum going into his next big match, the World Heavyweight Championship Scramble. It looked like Batista was finally going to become world champion again, but a sneaky Chris Jericho got the pinfall during the final seconds and won. However, this was only a delay. Batista became the number one contender at the next pay-per-view, No Mercy, and then challenged Jericho for the title at Cyber Sunday. Ironically, just like the year before, not only was Batista competing for the World Heavyweight Championship, but fans voted to have Stone Cold be the special guest referee again. The match turned to chaos as the other candidates for referee, Shawn Michaels or Andy Orton, also got involved. In the end, though, Austin had a stunner, and Batista finally became a four-time world champion. However, the celebration was short-lived. Just eight days later, Batista fought Chris Jericho in a rematch and lost the championship. The next week, Batista opened up old wounds with his former teammate, Randy Orton. This ultimately led to Batista and Orton captain rival Survivor Series teams. Despite making two eliminations on his own, Batista's team fell to the Vipers. While the battle was over, the war was far from finished. To close out the year, Batista fought Randy Orton one-on-one -on -one at Armageddon. This time, the animal came out on top, but Randy wasn't done. The next night on Raw, Batista teamed with his SummerSlam opponent, John Cena, to take on Randy Orton, Cody Rhodes, and Manu, who called themselves the Legacy. During the match, Orton hit Batista with a punt kick. The attack caused a head injury and put the animal out of action. In reality, Batista had suffered a tear in his hamstring during his match at SummerSlam earlier in the year and needed time for surgery. Batista would make his return the night after WrestleMania 25. The animal attacked the Legacy and saved Triple H as well as Vince and Shane McMahon. This set up a six-man tag team match at Backlash where Batista, The Game, and Shane fought the Legacy. However, there was a special stipulation that if Triple H's team lost in any way, then he would lose the WWE Championship. This led to a moment where Batista brought out a steel chair, only for Triple H to stop him. The distraction allowed Randy Orton to strike and get the pinfall and take the WWE title. The next night, Batista would get an opportunity to face Randy Orton alone when he fought Big Show in a number one contenders match. Thanks to a distraction by John Cena, the Animal won and locked in his match with Orton. The Animal and the Viper went one-on-one -on -one at Judgment Day, where Batista won via disqualification. After Orton slapped the referee. This led to a rematch at Extreme Rules that was inside a steel cage. With no one able to interfere, the animal finally defeated his former Evolution brother and won the WWE Championship for the first time. However, like Batista's last world title reign, this one was short-lived. The next night, the new WWE Champion was attacked by Randy Orton and the Legacy. The attack injured Batista and sidelined him again. Like before, the purpose was to tend to a real-life injury. About three months later, Batista returned and it looked like he was going to retire. Randy Orton thought so too, but the animal revealed he was healthy and was going to be moving to SmackDown. Before heading back to the blue brand, Batista fought Randy Orton in a no-holds-barred match and won, putting an end to their feud once and for all. In his first two matches on SmackDown, Batista defeated Chris Jericho and The Big Show, who were the unified tag team champions. This earned Batista a championship match, and all he needed was a partner. Enter in Rey Mysterio. The Animal and the Mass Luchador restarted their tag team and faced Jericho and Show at Hell in a Cell. Unlike in 2005 though, Batista and Ray could not win the gold. Despite the defeat, Vince McMahon would personally select the two to be part of a Fatal 4 match for the World Heavyweight Championship. The two other participants were CM Punk and the champion, The Undertaker. During the match, Mysterio broke up Batista's pin attempt, which resulted in The Undertaker hitting the Animal with a Tombstone Piledriver and winning the match. Afterward, Batista shared his frustrations and then attacked his now former friend. To Batista's defense, Ray was supposed to be his friend. You're supposed to be my friend! Anyways, the two would have a match against each other at Survivor Series. Batista gave Mysterio three Batista bombs, forcing the referee to stop the match and give the victory to the animal. Ray and Batista would meet a few weeks later in a street fight, where Batista won once again. The former world champion needed all the momentum he could get, as he then found himself in a heavyweight championship match against The Undertaker. Their match was at TLC, and was appropriately enough a chairs match. At first, Batista was awarded the victory after he hit the dead man with a low blow behind the referee's back. 
However, the SmackDown General Manager, Teddy Long, gave a hold up playa, and then the match restarted, where The Undertaker got the last laugh. Going into 2010, Batista made his fourth Royal Rumble appearance, entering at number 30. Unfortunately, he was eliminated by John Cena. This reignited their rivalry, which got even more heated soon after the Rumble. Batista would align himself with Vince McMahon, who was feuding with Bret Hart. The animal was helping McMahon beat down the Hitman, which prompted John Cena to make the save. However, Batista ended up attacking him as well. Fast forward to Elimination Chamber, John Cena had just won the WWE Championship. Right after winning, McMahon gave Batista a title match, which allowed the animal to win the belt in 30 seconds. In the aftermath, Cena won a rematch at WrestleMania. Vince McMahon said Cena could have his match if he could defeat Batista that night. However, it ended up being another quick match as Batista low blowed Cena and intentionally got himself disqualified, making the WrestleMania match official. Finally, for the first time since their SummerSlam match in 2008, Batista and John Cena would get a proper one-on-one -on -one match. However, this time, John Cena won after he made the animal tap out. Batista wasn't finished yet and used his rematch clause in the next pay-per-view, Extreme Rules. Cena and Batista fought in a last man standing match where John famously won by duct taping his opponent's legs together. The next night, Batista beat Randy Orton and Sheamus to get another opportunity to reclaim the WWE Championship. A week later, both Batista and John Cena would fight and beat the clock matches, and the man who won in the shortest amount of time would get to pick the match stipulation. Cena got the better in that contest, and chose an I Quit match, which was ironic considering what would happen next. The Animal and the face of WWE laced up their boots one more time at Over the Limit. John Cena is legally not allowed to say I and quit in the same sentence, so of course he won, but still decided to get Batista and AA off the stage. The night after the match, Batista said he quit again, and this time it was permanent. After roughly 8 years in WWE, the animal was done. He set off to become an actor and said he would never come back to wrestling until he made it. It was a hard battle, as Batista himself said he couldn't get a job and struggled financially. Despite this, the animal never gave up and things eventually turned around. In March 2013, Batista was cast in a Marvel movie called Guardians of the Galaxy. This was the turning point in Batista's acting career, and after filming wrapped up in October 2013, the animal was finally ready to return to the ring. On January 20th, 2014, Batista came back to WWE. He embraced Triple H and also made it clear to the WWE World Heavyweight Champion, Randy Orton, the animal was here to win the title. While Batista wouldn't wrestle that night, he did get in on some action. In the lead up to Batista's return, Alberto Del Rio had been saying that fans should be talking about him and not Batista. Del Rio also vowed to eliminate the animal from the Royal Rumble. On the night of his return, Batista responded by attacking Alberto Del Rio after a match. With the adrenaline flowing, Batista was all ready for the 2014 Royal Rumble. The animal entered at number 28 and won the entire thing, making him one of nine men to win the Rumble multiple times. However, the victory was met with massive backlash, even though Batista was supposed to be a good guy. Despite this, the animal still had unfinished business with Alberto Del Rio. The two squared off at the Elimination Chamber pay-per-view where the master of the Batista bomb won. Batista fought Del Rio once again the next night, but this time lost thanks to interference by his WrestleMania opponent, Randy Orton. Soon after, Batista would turn on the fans, saying he did not come back to be liked and he was there to become champion. The Animal finally got his chance to do that once WrestleMania 30 arrived, but in addition to fighting Randy Orton, Daniel Bryan had also been added to the match. Despite Batista's claims they could defeat anyone WWE put in front of him, he was unable to escape the yes lock and tapped out. This made Batista 3-3 three three at WrestleMania. The next night, Batista had another shot at championship gold when he and Randy Orton were put in a title match against the tag team champions, the Usos. However, the match would end in a double countout. Later on, Randy Orton and Batista, as well as Kane, attacked Daniel Bryan before he was set to have a match with Triple H. However, The Shield came in to even the playing field. The next week, Batista, Orton, and The Game walked out to their iconic Evolution theme song, officially bringing the group back together. They got the revenge of The Shield that night, which set up a match between the two teams at Extreme Rules. Roman Reigns, Seth Rollins, and Dean Ambrose came out on top in that encounter, but Evolution wasn't done yet. In the following weeks, Batista and his teammates made The Shield's lives miserable, forcing the Hounds of Justice to ask for a rematch, which Evolution accepted. Their second encounter happened at Payback and was a no-holds-barred elimination match that was absolutely insane. Despite that, The Shield proved that Evolution hadn't evolved enough, and Batista, Randy, and Triple H were sent packing. The next night, Batista demanded he get a one-on-one -on -one world championship match. When Triple H didn't give it to him, the animal quit. And just like that, Batista's second run in WWE was over. This was done so that Batista could go and do promotion for Guardians of the Galaxy. Similar to 2010, Batista wouldn't be seen in WWE for over four years. But on October 16th, 2018, SmackDown celebrated 
its 1000th episode, so naturally, one of the greatest factions in Monday Night Raw history reunited. Batista returned to join Randy Orton, Ric Flair, and Triple H for an Evolution reunion. However, Batista would take a shot at the game by mentioning that Triple H had never beaten him in a one-on-one -on -one match. It seemed to upset the Camp Kings, but the two hugged it out. Little did we know, this was only the beginning. About four months later, WWE celebrated the 70th birthday of Ric Flair. Fans and wrestlers were waiting for the Nature Boy to make his entrance, but nothing happened. Then, Batista made an unannounced appearance backstage and attacked Ric Flair. Now that he had Triple H's attention, Batista said he always felt the game held him down, which is why he wanted a match against the Camp Canes at WrestleMania 35. Triple H accepted, but made the match no holds barred. Batista upped the stakes by saying if the game lost, then he would be forced to retire. The stage was set, and now it was time for Batista's last match. Unfortunately for the animal, he did not start the night on the right foot as he tripped his way into the ring. Still, the animal was intense as he stared down Triple H's dad, who was watching ringside, as well as Shawn Michaels, who was doing commentary. Thankfully, Triple H made time out of his schedule from filling Mad Max 5 to be there for the match. Finally, the bell rang and Batista started very aggressively, but Triple H gave it right back and sent the animal out of the ring. Batista fought back and threw the game's body all over the ringside area. Triple H then made use of the no-holds-barred stipulation and hit Batista with a toolbox. The Camp Kings then pulled out a chain and began whipping and choking out his opponent. After discarding the weapon, Triple H pulled out a pair of pliers and used them to twist Batista's arm and damage his fingers. The assault continued with a chair shot to the animal's back, followed by Triple H yanking Batista's nose ring out with another pair of pliers. Just as it was looking like the sixth time world champion was out, he caught Triple H and slammed him onto the announcer's table. The animal gave his former evolution leader a second table smack and not one, but two Irish whips into the barricade. Batista got the fight back into the ring, where he started using his own body as a weapon. Triple H briefly turned things around, but the animal countered the game's attempt at a pedigree. The match continued, but it was clear the battle was taking its toll. Batista signaled for the end with a Batista bomb through the announcer's table, only for Triple H to counter his opponent's finisher. The cerebral assassin then followed up with a spear that sent Batista's spine blasting through a table. The two men struggled to get to their feet, but Triple H found the strength to grab a sledgehammer. Before he could use it, Batista hit a spear from out of nowhere. The animal then got a hold of the hammer, but Triple H responded with a boot to the face. Batista then did the same to Triple H and added in a spine buster. Batista also hit his finisher, but didn't get the job done. The animal's next move was to bring the steel steps and set his opponent on the top turnbuckle. The plan backfired though, and Triple H gave Batista a powerbomb onto the steps, followed by a pedigree. However, Batista somehow kicked out. The animal then blocked a sledgehammer shot and gave the King of Kings a DDT onto the steel steps. Just then, Ric Flair appeared and had Triple H a second sledgehammer. The Nature Boy then distracted Batista, allowing Triple H to deliver a fatal blow to the animal, followed by a pedigree for the 1, 2, 3. This was definitely a top tier final match, and Triple H was arguably a perfect opponent for Batista, especially when you consider the first person Batista physically fought in WWE was Triple H. As for the match at WrestleMania 35, it was pretty good, and my only real complaint is that it was a bit sloppy, like you can see Batista adjusting the chain so it's around his mouth, and Triple H's head clearly didn't hit the steel steps. However, this is still an excellent match and a great way to end the career of the animal, Batista. Before he became the best in the world, CM Punk was a kid named Philip Brooks. Born in Chicago, Punk grew up in the nearby city of Lockport. His father struggled with alcoholism, which made CM Punk want to live a drug and alcohol-free life and got him into the straight edge lifestyle. He also got into wrestling, with Roddy Piper being a big source of inspiration. Punk's first foray into wrestling was backyard wrestling. This is where he'd get the name CM Punk, which originally stood for Chick Magnet before being changed to Chicago Made. While he enjoyed backyard wrestling, Punk wanted to take things to the next level. The stray edge wrestler found a school and started to properly train. CM Punk also began making friendships and connections and soon began wrestling on the independent scene. Slowly but surely, CM Punk started making a name for himself and could keep performing on bigger stages and in front of larger crowds. He soon got the attention of WWE. They wanted to see what he could do, so they gave CM Punk a tryout match on TV, and this would be CM Punk's first time in a WWE ring. In his debut, CM Punk teamed up with a guy named Chad Russell Simpson and went up against the team of Maven and Simon Dean on Sunday Night Heat. Simpson started the match, but quickly gained control and tagged in Punk. The straight edge wrestler beat up Maven with punches and kicks, but was knocked down when Simon Dean hit him while the referee wasn't looking. This put Maven in the driver's seat and he soon tagged out with Simon Dean. Dean continued to punish the young CM Punk until Maven tagged back in. Thinking fast, Punk caught himself on the rope and countered Maven's drop kick. 
This gave CM Punk just enough time to tag out. Unfortunately, Maven and Dean got the better of Chad Russell Simpson, forcing Punk to walk away in defeat. This was just a squash match, but one interesting fact is that this match took place in CM Punk's home state of Illinois, in a city called Moline. While the match wasn't much, it did get WWE interested in CM Punk. Punk would wrestle a few more WWE tryouts until finally getting offered a contract. He was assigned to OVW, WWE's development system at the time, and began training and appearing on their weekly show. About a year later, in July 2006, Punk would appear on WWE's recently relaunched ECW. He appeared in promo videos talking about his strange lifestyle. Additionally, WWE also gave Punk's character a background in the martial art Muay Thai. <laughs> WWE predicted CM Punk's UFC career. Anyways, after about two months of promos, CM Punk made his in-ring debut, taking on and defeating ECW original Just Incredible in the historic Hammerstein Ballroom. The crowd loved him, and Punk's WWE career was off and running. His first feud was kind of bizarre. Kelly Kelly began to show a romantic interest in CM Punk. This made her boyfriend, Mike Knox, jealous and led to several matches between Knox and Punk all of which CM Punk won. Additionally, Punk would be part of D-Generation X and the Hardys Survivor Series team where CM Punk's side won. Then, at the December to Dismember pay-per-view, Punk was one of six participants in the Extreme Elimination Chamber match for the ECW Championship. Unfortunately, this is where Punk's momentum ran out. Not only did he lose the match, but he was the first wrestler to be eliminated. It was a sad way to end Punk's debut year, and unfortunately, things would get worse before they'd get better. In January 2007, Punk lost his first singles match when Hardcore Holly defeated him. He also participated in the Royal Rumble and the WrestleMania Money in the Bank ladder match, but lost both matches. Around this time, there was a war going on in ECW between the New Breed and the ECW Originals. Both sides had been trying to recruit Punk, and the strange wrestler ended up going with the New Breed. However, it was all a trick. Two weeks after joining the group, CM Punk turned on them and aligned himself with the ECW Originals. Punk would then challenge and defeat the New Breed leader, Elijah Burke. CM Punk also joined the ECW Originals in a tables match against the New Breed, where Punk also won. Soon after, the ECW champion Bobby Lashley would be drafted to Raw and forced to vacate the title. This set up a tournament to crown a new champion. Punk entered and did pretty well, so well that he made it to the final round. He was originally supposed to face Chris Benoit, but ended up facing John Morrison instead, for reasons you probably already know. Morrison ended up defeating CM Punk, but the Chicago native wasn't done yet. Over the next few pay-per-views, CM Punk kept challenging John Morrison for the ECW title, but was always unsuccessful. Finally, Punk had his final chance in September 2007. It was now or never, and luckily for CM Punk, now was the time. The future best in the world defeated his rival and won his first championship in WWE. For the rest of the year, CM Punk would successfully defend the title against the likes of The Miz, Big Daddy V, Elijah Burke, and others. However, in January 2008, Punk's reign ended when he was defeated by Chavo Guerrero, thanks to interference from Edge. Over the next few weeks, the former champion tried to regain his title, but with no luck. However, CM Punk would be presented with a new opportunity when he qualified for the Money in the Bank ladder match at WrestleMania 24. This time, Punk was successful and earned himself a championship match at any time. CM Punk held onto the briefcase for a while and would eventually get drafted to Raw. It didn't take long for Punk to make an impact. One week after getting drafted, CM Punk cashed in his contract after Batista had attacked Edge. Punk capitalized and got even with the man who cost him the ECW title by taking Edge's World Heavyweight Championship. That same night, Punk would defend his newly won title against JBL and was successful. Over the next several months, Punk remained champion, but it seemed as though the focus was always on other stars. This led to an underwhelming title reign that ended at Unforgiven when Punk was attacked by Randy Orton and the Legacy and was forced to vacate the title. He would get a rematch against the man who won his vacated championship, Chris Jericho, but the straight-edge star failed to become a two-time World Heavyweight Champion. Punk picked himself up and ended up being put into a tag team with Kofi Kingston. It was a surprise pairing, but worked out pretty well. Punk and Kofi won the World Tag Team Championship in their second match as a tag team. Like Punk's World Heavyweight Championship title reign, his tag team title reign had an underwhelming finish. After holding the gold for 47 days, CM Punk and Kofi Kingston lost the titles at a non-televised WWE show. However, at the same time, CM Punk entered a tournament with the winner getting an Intercontinental Championship match. 
match. Punk ultimately won the whole thing when he last defeated Rey Mysterio. On the first Raw of 2009, CM Punk got his Intercontinental title match against the champion, William Regal. Regal ended up disqualifying himself, which prompted Stephanie McMahon to give Punk a rematch the next week. However, this time, CM Punk got himself disqualified. This set up a third match that was no DQ. Finally, CM Punk defeated William Regal and won the IC title in his home state of Illinois. Unfortunately, like his tag team title reign, Punk's run at the Intercontinental Championship didn't last long. In March 2009, CM Punk was defeated by his old rival, JBL, and lost the title. However, things weren't all bad. CM Punk would again qualify for the Money in the Bank ladder match at WrestleMania. Also like last year, Punk won, making him the first person to win Money in the Bank twice. In a weird coincidence, after winning the briefcase, Punk was also drafted, this time going to SmackDown. On the blue brand, CM Punk would try to cash in his briefcase, but was thwarted by Umaga. This led to two pay-per-view matches, with Umaga winning the first and Punk winning the second. The same night the straight dresser defeated the Samoan Bulldozer, CM Punk cashed in his briefcase to defeat the recently crowned World Heavyweight Champion, Jeff Hardy. Hardy, of course, was entitled to a rematch, and the two would go one-on-one -on -one at the Bash pay-per-view. During their match, Punk kicked the referee and got himself disqualified. CM Punk claimed his eye was injured and couldn't see, but Jeff Hardy didn't believe him. This marked the beginning of Punk turning into a villain. His transformation was complete when CM Punk started saying he was superior to Jeff and his fans because he lived a drug-free life. With things hotter than before, Punk and Jeff had another match at Night of Champions, where the charismatic Enigma defeated the Straight Edge Champion. However, it was CM Punk who got the last laugh. Punk defeated Jeff Hardy at the next pay-per-view, SummerSlam, and became a three-time World Heavyweight Champion. On top of that, CM Punk would face Jeff Hardy in a steel cage match, with the loser being forced to leave WWE. Throwing salt into the wound, CM Punk defeated Jeff and finished the rivalry. Rewinding just a little bit, after CM Punk beat Hardy at SummerSlam, Punk was attacked by The Undertaker. This led to Punk and Taker facing off in a submission match for the World Championship. Undertaker won after CM Punk tapped out to the Hell's Gate submission hold. However, moments after the victory, the SmackDown general manager, Teddy Long, came out to say the Hell's Gate was banned and restarted the match. CM Punk managed to lock the dead man in the Anaconda Vice, which prompted the referee to call for the bell, even though Undertaker never tapped out. This was a reference to the Montreal Screwjob, which happened in the same arena 12 years earlier. The Undertaker was not happy, and kidnapped and tortured Teddy Long until Long gave him a rematch against CM Punk. The two fought again inside Hell in a Cell, where the Straight Edge Champion lost for good this time. Punk would get a few more shots at the gold, but was unsuccessful. After this, CM Punk began the Straight Edge Society. The first member was Luke Gallows, who had previously wrestled in WWE as Festus. Punk explained that he got Gallows off the drugs he was on and therefore got rid of the mental issues Festus had. Going into 2010, CM Punk would begin converting audience members to his straight edge society, symbolized by shaving their heads. Most of these people were never seen again, except for one named Serena, who began accompanying Punk and Gallows. Punk entered the 2010 Elimination Chamber, but was taken out by Rey Mysterio. This started a feud that famously saw CM Punk ruin Mysterio's daughter's 9th birthday party. Punk and Rey would eventually agree to a match at WrestleMania 26, where if Punk defeated Rey, the Mysterio would have to join the Strange Society. The joke was on CM Punk the entire time, because Rey Mysterio was already bald. Despite that, Rey won and defeated Punk. A rematch took place the next pay-per-view, Extreme Rules, where if Punk lost, he would have to shave his head. Luckily, a new masked member of the Straight Edge Society, who later turned out to be Joey Mercury, helped Punk win the match and save his hair. With one win each, CM Punk and Rey Mysterio decided to go at it a third time, with both stipulations on the line. In the end, Punk lost and was forced to have his head shaved. Afterward, Punk began wearing a mask to hide his baldness, but Big Show had other plans. The giant unmasked CM Punk, which started a rivalry, Punk, along with Joey Mercury and Luke Gallows, 
fought Big Show at SummerSlam in a handicap match. CM Punk would abandon his teammates during the fight, ultimately costing them the match. The straight-edge wrestler would face Big Show himself at the next pay-per-view, Night of Champions, but the world's largest athlete still came out on top. This also marked the end of the straight-edge society, and it was made official when CM Punk fought and defeated Luke Gallows. Punk would then get drafted back to Raw and earn a spot on the show's bragging rights team. Ironically, CM Punk was eliminated by his former rival, Rey Mysterio, during the match. Shortly after that, the Chicago-made Punk suffered a hip injury and was out of action. Rather than take him off TV, WB had CM Punk begin commentating on Raw. This only lasted about a month, until Punk would attack John Cena. As it turned out, CM Punk was taking over the group, The Nexus. With The Nexus under his control, Punk made each member take some kind of physical punishment to prove themselves. While some agreed, others didn't and chose to leave the group. Still, CM Punk had a small army and used it to cost Randy Orton his WWE Championship match at the 2011 Royal Rumble. CM Punk revealed that the reason he cost Orton the WWE Championship was to get revenge for the Viper did to Punk back in 2008. It may not have been the wisest decision because this turned Orton into a one-man wrecking crew. The Apex Predator would go after every member of CM Punk's Nexus and Orton would defeat Punk at WrestleMania 27 and at Extreme Rules. The Strayage wrestler would rebound from this loss by winning a number one contenders match for the WWE Championship. After that, Punk would reveal that his WWE contract would expire at Money in the Bank, the same event where Punk would get his WWE title match. Soon after, CM Punk gave his famous pipe bomb promo where he publicly aired the real frustrations he had with WWE. This transformed Punk from a popular wrestler to a megastar. In the storyline, CM Punk would be suspended, but was reinstated after the WWE Champion, John Cena, insisted. The two finally had their much-anticipated match at Money in the Bank. With the crowd mostly behind the Chicago native, CM Punk was able to defeat John Cena and win the WWE Championship. As previously mentioned, Punk's contract expired shortly after the match, so he took the title and ran. In the meantime, a tournament was set up to crown a new WWE Champion. Rey Mysterio won it eight days after mining the bank and had to defend the WWE Championship the same night against John Cena. Cena won, but was interrupted by a returning CM Punk, who still had his WWE Championship. To determine the undisputed champion, Punk and Cena fought each other in a rematch at SummerSlam, with Triple H as the special guest referee. CM Punk won, despite Cena's foot touching the rope. However, the undisputed WWE Champion was then attacked by a returning Kevin Nash. In all the chaos, the Money in the Bank winner, Alberto Del Rio, cashed in his contract and took the WWE Championship from CM Punk. The next night, Punk accused Kevin Nash of working with Triple H to take the WWE title away from him. This set up a match between Nash and Punk at the next pay-per-view, Night of Champions. However, when CM Punk kept making verbal attacks against Triple H's wife, Stephanie McMahon, the game decided to fight CM Punk instead. The two legends fought in a no DQ match, which saw Kevin Nash, as well as The Miz and R-Truth, attack both men. All the chaos allowed the game to beat CM Punk. Miz and Truth would attack CM Punk again during a Hell in a Cell match, leading to a temporary alliance between Punk and Triple H. They fought the awesome truth at Vengeance, but failed to get the win when Kevin Nash attacked the game. After that, CM Punk set his sights on reclaiming the WWE Championship. He got himself a title shot at Survivor Series against Alberto Del Rio. Punk was successful and kicked off his second run with the belt. The Straight Edge Champion held onto the title for the rest of 2011, but on the final Raw of the year, he would get pinned by Dolph Ziggler in a non-title match. This awarded Ziggler a championship match, which CM Punk lost via countout after the interim Raw general manager, John Laurinaitis, interfered. Laurinaitis continued to be a thorn in CM Punk's side, but despite that, the best in the world was able to retain his WWE Championship. Soon after feuding with Dolph Ziggler, CM Punk began a rivalry with Chris Jericho after Y2J attacked Punk during the match. Jericho claimed that everyone on the WWE roster was copying him and Punk was the worst offender. The two would meet again along with four other wrestlers inside the Elimination Chamber. While CM Punk did win, Chris Jericho never got eliminated due to Punk kicking Jericho out of the chamber and temporarily injuring him. Soon after, Chris Jericho earned the right to challenge CM Punk at WrestleMania 28. 
Before the match, Chris Jericho began taunting Punk by revealing that CM Punk's father was an alcoholic and alleged that Punk's sister was a drug addict. In the weeks before the match, John Laurinaitis added a special stipulation to CM Punk and Chris Jericho's match that the title would change hands via disqualification. This led to Jericho trying to get CM Punk to hit him with a weapon during the WrestleMania bout. Punk didn't give in and ended up winning and retaining his title. A rematch was eventually set up for Extreme Rules in Punk's hometown of Chicago. Fitting with the pay-per-view, the two fought in a street fight. The best in the world proved why he was called that and beat Y2J again. At the next pay-per-view, Over the Limit, CM Punk fought Daniel Bryan. It was a very close match, with Punk tapping out seconds after he pinned Bryan. This enraged Daniel and caused him to interfere during two matches between Punk and Kane. To make things even crazier, AJ Lee, Daniel Bryan's ex-girlfriend, began showing interest in CM Punk and Kane. AJ even tried to propose to CM Punk at one point. This did end up benefiting Punk though, when he fought Kane and Daniel Bryan in a triple threat match. Lee distracted the Big Red Machine, allowing CM Punk to take advantage and retain the title. CM Punk and Daniel Bryan would also face off in a rematch with AJ Lee as the special guest referee. Despite not knowing what AJ Lee would do, CM Punk still managed to win the match. With all that behind him, CM Punk appeared on the special 1000th episode of Raw. Unfortunately, the best in the world was interrupted by The Rock. The Great One revealed he would challenge whoever the WWE Champion was at the 2013 Royal Rumble, creating some tension. Later that night, CM Punk fought John Cena for the WWE Championship. During the match, Big Show interfered and attacked Cena. This prompted The Rock to make the save, but he was then attacked by CM Punk. Punk explained the next week that he was tired of people like The Rock and John Cena overshadowing him, despite being the WWE Champion, and he started demanding respect. After that, Punk would face John Cena and The Big Show at SummerSlam. Cena and Punk both submitted the Giants simultaneously, causing a draw. However, AJ Lee, who had become Raw General Manager, restarted the match. Cena hit the Giant with an AA, but Punk capitalized by throwing Cena out of the ring and pinning Big Show. Soon after, CM Punk would align himself with Paul Heyman. With Heyman by his side, CM Punk fought John Cena one-on-one -on -one again at Night of Champions. The match ended in a draw due to both men having their shoulders on the mat at the same time. Punk and Cena were originally set to go at it again inside Hell in a Cell, but Cena was eventually removed and replaced with Ryback. The big guy had never been defeated, but the WWE Champion had a plan. In the closing moments of the match, the referee low-blowed Ryback, allowing Punk to get the pinfall. While the ref denied working for CM Punk, it was later found out that he did. In the aftermath, CM Punk was put in a triple threat match against John Cena and Ryback at Survivor Series. It looked like Punk had finally met his match, but thanks to help from a group of intruding wrestlers, later called The Shield, the WWE Champion was able to retain his title. This also meant that CM Punk had been WWE Champion for over a year. Unfortunately, shortly after this huge accomplishment, Punk needed surgery to repair a partially torn meniscus. The best in the world didn't return to action until January 2013, when he defended his title against Ryback. Like their previous encounter, the Shield interfered, allowing Punk to win. It was soon revealed that the Shield was secretly working for CM Punk and Paul Heyman, like the referee. With the big guy out of the way, CM Punk turned his attention to The Rock, who, as you might remember, said he would challenge for the WWE Championship at the 2013 Royal Rumble. Because of that, CM Punk already had a challenger for the pay-per-view. A stipulation was added where Punk would lose the title if the Shield interfered. This seems like a foolproof plan, but during the match, the lights suddenly went out. When they turned back on, The Rock had been put through the announcer's table. This allowed Punk to pin the Great One and retain the title. However, Vince McMahon realized what was going on and was going to award the title to The Rock, but the Brahma Bull requested that the match be restarted. It ended up not mattering, because The Rock won and ended CM Punk's historic title reign. The best in the world did get his rematch at Elimination Chamber, but Punk's time as WWE Champion was over. With that chapter done, CM Punk decided to go after the next best thing, The Undertaker's WrestleMania streak. Punk earned the right to face the dead man at Mania and began getting under the Phenom's skin. In a controversial moment, CM Punk began making disrespectful marks towards Paul Bearer, who had recently passed away. Nonetheless, CM Punk and The Undertaker fought on the grandest stage of them all. Just like everyone before him, CM Punk fell victim to the Tombstone Piledriver and lost the match.
After the defeat, CM Punk would disappear from WWE for a while. When he returned, Punk ended his alliance with Paul Heyman. Heyman wasn't too happy about this and had his other client, Brock Lesnar, attack CM Punk. Additionally, Paul Heyman himself would assault Punk during the Money in the Bank ladder match. All this led to Punk and Brock Lesnar fighting it out at SummerSlam. The match was no disqualification, and thanks to Paul Heyman's interference, the Beast won. The rivalry would continue, but without Brock. Instead, CM Punk feuded with Heyman and his newer client, Curtis Axel. The best in the world fought both of them in a no disqualification 2 on 1 handicap match. After eliminating Axel, CM Punk had Paul Heyman all to himself. Punk's sweet revenge was unfortunately interrupted by his former rival, Ryback. The big guy had joined forces with Heyman and Axel, allowing Paul to pin the best in the world. CM Punk would get his hands on Ryback at the next pay per view, Battleground, and got the victory. After that, CM Punk fought Paul Heyman once more. This time, Heyman was paired with Ryback, and the match took place inside Hell in a Cell. Just like their match a year earlier, CM Punk defeated the Human Wrecking Ball, and also gave his former manager a GTS for good measure. There was no rest for CM Punk though, as he and Daniel Bryan would both be victims of attacks by the Wyatt family. The former enemies became tag team partners as they worked together to defeat the Wyatts at Survivor Series. The following night, the Wyatts took Daniel Bryan hostage. Punk tried to save Bryan, but was attacked by the men that used to work for him, the Shield. CM Punk believed that the Authority, who had taken control of WWE at this point, ordered the Shield to assault him. This caused the Authority to put CM Punk in a 3 on 1 handicap match against the Shield at TLC. Despite the odds not being in his favor, CM Punk was able to win the match after Roman Reigns accidentally speared Dean Ambrose. Punk continued to butt heads with the Authority, specifically the Director of Operations, Kane. The Devil's Favorite Demon punished CM Punk by making him the first entrant in the 2014 Royal Rumble. Little did we know, but this would be the last time we would see CM Punk in WWE. For the first time since 2011, CM Punk entered the Royal Rumble match. As mentioned, Punk was the first man out. Fittingly, the person who entered at number 2 was Seth Rollins. Once the rumble officially started, CM Punk immediately backed Rollins into a corner. The two started throwing fists and kicks at each other and went back and forth over who was in control. Ultimately, the two knocked themselves both out with kicks to the head. The next entrant then came out, which was Damian Sandow. Sandow went after Punk, aligning himself with Seth Rollins. Punk managed to fight them both off, but the numbers eventually caught up to him. Luckily, the fourth entrant, Cody Rhodes, ran out and went after Damian Sandow, until getting attacked by Seth Rollins. CM Punk then focused on Sandow and quickly eliminated him. After that, Punk and Cody formed their own alliance against Seth Rollins. Unfortunately, it got demolished once entry number 5, Kane, got into the ring. Kane naturally had his sights on the best in the world and brought the fight straight to him. However, a well-placed kick and perfect timing allowed CM Punk to eliminate the Big Red Machine. While this was a small victory, there was no rest as Rusev entered the match. The Bulgarian brute destroyed everyone, including CM Punk. The best in the world felt the pain and had to remain low. Jack Swagger entered the match next, followed by Kofi Kingston, the latter giving Punk a clothesline that can cuss him for real. Punk managed to stay alive despite both Kofi and Cody Rhodes trying to eliminate him. Jimmy Uso entered at number 9 and gave CM Punk an up close look at his head. Punk would get back on his feet and try to choke out Rusev, but had no success. Punk would try again and, along with three other participants, was able to eliminate Rusev. Punk also tried to eliminate his former tag team partner, Kofi Kingston, but Kofi wasn't finished yet. Dean Ambrose came out at number 11 and began attacking CM Punk. Punk tried to fight back, but the match was beginning to take a toll on him. Jack Swagger tried to eliminate the former WWE Champion, but CM Punk managed to survive. For the next while, CM Punk stayed pretty quiet, mostly sticking towards one of the corners. However, he partnered with Goldust to beat up Seth Rollins. At entry number 14, Kevin Nash made a surprise appearance. Considering what Kevin Nash did to CM Punk in the past, it was smart for Punk to avoid getting in Nash's way. Roman Reigns, the final member of the Shield, then entered the Royal Rumble and kicked CM Punk in the head. While the best in the world was still in the match, the Shield began taking over. Eventually, the Hounds of Justice had eliminated everyone except CM Punk.
Before they could take him out, backup arrived in the form of Seamus. The shield turned their attention to the Celtic warrior, giving Punk a chance to catch his breath. The Miz then came out at number 18, and Fandango at number 19. The entire time, CM Punk remained practically motionless in the corner. El Torito was the next man to enter the Rumble. He ended up challenging the best in the world, and actually took CM Punk for a ride. Despite this, Punk would soon get back on his feet, and started a fight with Rowan Reigns. Cesaro was the next man in the match, and almost took Punk for a swing, but the shield of all people saved him. Luke Harper joined at number 22 and knocked CM Punk out with a hard clothesline. Once he regained consciousness, Punk started a fight with Roman again, but the best in the world was starting to run on empty. Harper then tried to eliminate the former WWE Champion, but somehow CM Punk managed to stay in the ring. After a little break, CM Punk set his sights on Cesaro, but he was unsuccessful. Roman Reigns then went after CM Punk again, but stopped when he, Seth, and Dean all suddenly turned their attention to the Wyatts. Ryback then entered at number 26, but CM Punk could barely stand at this point. Seth Rollins and Punk tried to eliminate each other, but neither one would go over the top rope. Just then, the buzzer sounded for number 28, and it was Batista. The animal knocked out just about everyone, including CM Punk. Punk wisely avoided Batista and instead tried to eliminate Sheamus. When that didn't go anywhere, CM Punk targeted Batista, who had now been worn down. Unfortunately, the best in the world just didn't have the strength and was struggling to survive, much less eliminate people. The final entrant, Rey Mysterio, then entered. The master of the 619 brought the fight right to CM Punk probably still upset about Punk ruining his daughter's birthday. Anyways, CM Punk continued to fight, but he had almost nothing left. As the match wore on, more wrestlers were eliminated, but Punk stayed in there and even made it to the Final Four. He dished out GTSs to Sheamus and Roman Reigns, but was then unceremoniously eliminated by Kane, who had come back out. The Big Red Machine didn't stop there and sent CM Punk through the announcer's table. Hey, what goes around comes around. CM Punk was eventually helped to the back, and that was the last fans would see of CM Punk in WWE. This isn't the ideal final match for any career, but I don't think it was awful. I thought Punk went out looking really good, with him starting as the first entrant and making it all the way to the final four. The ending with Kane was meant to fuel their rivalry and likely lead to a match, but as we're about to find out, that never happened. The next night, CM Punk would walk out of WWE. He would later say the main reason was his health. He had broken ribs, injured knees, a staph infection, and concussions. There were other reasons too, but all this ultimately led to CM Punk permanently leaving WWE. It wouldn't be until 2021 that CM Punk officially returned to wrestling when he joined AEW. Considering how their relationship ended, it's unlikely we'll see CM Punk return to WWE. Ric Flair's origins are actually quite mysterious. It's believed that Flair was kidnapped as a child and put up for adoption in the infamous Tennessee Children's Home Society. However, Flair would be taken in by good parents. After being adopted, the future nature boy moved to Minnesota. There he discovered wrestling and instantly became hooked. Every year for his birthday, Flair would ask his parents to take him to shows. It wouldn't be until Ric Flair was out of college though that he got his step inside the ropes. The young nature boy met Vern Gagne, who was a wrestler and the owner of the American Wrestling Association, AWA. Ganya agreed to train Flair, but it wasn't easy. Vern was tough, and after the first day of training, Ric Flair almost quit. However, Flair toughed it out and made his debut in 1972. It didn't take long for people to notice that Ric Flair had the potential to be a big star. However, his entire career and life nearly came to an end. In October 1975, Flair was flying in a plane with a few other wrestlers. The aircraft ended up crashing and Rick broke his back. He was lucky to be alive and this would normally end someone's career, but not Ric Flair. Only three months later, the Nature Boy was back in the ring. However, he would have to change his wrestling style and use fewer power moves and focus more on grappling. This would help lead to the Nature Boy persona fans would become familiar with. Soon after this incredible comeback, Ric Flair would be noticed by WWE, which was known as the WWWF at the time. The company decided to see what this up and coming star was all about, leading to Ric Flair's first WWE match. Inside the legendary Madison Square Garden, Ric Flair took on a man named Pete Sanchez. Once the bell rang, the two locked up, and Flair won the first test of strength. Sanchez fought back by flipping Rick onto his back, which prompted Flair to get more aggressive, and he began throwing punches. Sanchez was no pushover and grabbed a hold of the Nature Boy's arm and began wearing him down. 
Ric Flair fought out of Sanchez's hold, but Pete secured a second arm lock almost instantly. The Nature Boy struggled to free himself, and the hold was doing more damage every second. Finally, Ric Flair ended the hold by throwing Pete Sanchez into the ropes, but Flair's opponent bounced right back and locked in another hold. Playing up his dirtiest player persona, Ric Flair fought back with a knee to the midsection. The Nature Boy began stomping on Pete Sanchez and then locked the man in his own hold. Once Sanchez was back on the ground, Ric Flair began pressing his knee into his opponent's skull and continued to work on the wrist lock. Flair threw some punches and strikes in there too as he wore down Pete Sanchez. The Nature Boy finally got outmatched when Sanchez flipped Ric Flair over and got out of the hold. This started a comeback for Pete and he began dishing out punches on Flair. Ric tried to stop it, but Pete Sanchez was fired up. Once Ric Flair was on the mat, Sanchez got his revenge by stomping the Nature Boy. Just like before, Flair used a knee to the midsection to get the match back in his favor. The future WWE Hall of Famer seemed to be in the driver's seat until his opponent dodged a standing elbow drop. Pete Sanchez used the opportunity to take back the match, and he threw Ric Flair into the turnbuckles, which caused Flair to do his iconic turnbuckle flip. However, Flair would catch his opponent with a kick to the face. He followed that up with a suplex that got the Nature Boy the win. You can tell this match is from a different era. This is still when wrestling was kind of trying to be a real sport, which is why the moves are so simple compared to today. It is interesting to see Ric Flair do things that would become a staple of his, like some of the moves he hit, and of course, the flip in the corner. It's hard to judge the match since it took place almost 50 years ago, but I thought it was alright. Ric Flair would have one more match in WWE a few months later, but then disappeared from the company. Flair ended up joining WWE's rival, the NWA. The Nature Boy spent the next 10 years there and would win the NWA World Heavyweight Championship in 1981. Flair went on to win the title another 7 more times throughout his career, or more depending on who you ask. Anyways, during his time with the NWA, Ric Flair, along with Tully Blanchard, Arn Anderson, and Ole Anderson, formed the Four Horsemen, one of the most legendary factions in wrestling history. With each year that went by, Flair became more and more popular until he was arguably the biggest wrestler outside of WWE at the time. Things turned ugly though in 1991. The NWA had now joined with WCW, which was being run by a guy named Jim Hurd. Hurd wanted Flair to shave his hair and completely change his character. The Nature Boy, of course, was not excited about that, but the breaking point was when Jim Hurd wanted Flair to take a pay cut. Ric Flair had enough and left the NWA and WCW in 1991 while he was still World Heavyweight Champion. Not long after, Ric Flair would join WWE, about 15 years since he last appeared in the company. Most shocking was Flair brought with him the WCW World title and began calling himself the Real World's Champion since he never lost the championship. Upon his arrival, Flair aligned himself with Bobby Heenan and Mr. Perfect and began issuing challenges to WWE's biggest stars. One of them was Rowdy Piper and the two ended up facing off at Survivor Series, with each man captaining a four-man team. Flair Flair's side won, but his night didn't end there. Later on, The Undertaker took on Hulk Hogan for the WWE Championship. Flair interfered, allowing the dead man to defeat Hogan and win the title. Taker and Hogan faced off just six days later in a rematch, where Ric Flair got involved again. This time though, the Hulkster was able to outsmart everyone and win back the title. However, due to all the outside interference, the WWE President, Jack Tunney, decided to strip Hulk Hogan of the title. Tunney then said that whoever would win the 1990s Royal Rumble match would become the new WWE Champion. Ric Flair was one of 29 other wrestlers who entered the match. Despite being only the third man in, Ric Flair won and added the WWE Championship to his list of accomplishments. Soon after, Ric Flair began claiming he used to be in a relationship with the Macho Man Randy Savage's wife, Miss Elizabeth, even showing pictures of them together. Macho Man became Macho Pissed and challenged Ric Flair to a championship match at WrestleMania 8. Even though Mr. Perfect was in his corner, the Nature Boy could not put Savage down and lost the WWE title. Despite the defeat, Ric Flair would go on a winning streak over the next few months. He would also continue to feud with the Macho Man during this time. At the 1982 SummerSlam, Randy Savage defended the WWE Championship against the Ultimate Warrior. During the match, Flair and Mr. Perfect both appeared ringside. They ended up causing trouble for both Savage and Warrior, and Flair would actually injure the Macho Man's leg. Macho Man would retain the title by countout, leading to a rematch match between Ric Flair and Randy Savage three days later. The Nature Boy exploited Macho Man's still injured leg, and thanks to some interference from Razor Ramon, Flair was able to win and regain the WWE Championship. 
However, this tail reign was over pretty fast, and on televised WWE show, a little over a month later, Bret Hart defeated Flair to become the new WWE Champion. Since he still had some unfinished business with Randy Savage, a tag team match was set up, pitting Ric Flair and Razor Ramon against Macho Man and the Ultimate Warrior. However, Warrior would leave the company before the match took place. In need of a new partner, Randy Savage convinced Mr. Perfect to join him after making Perfect realize how poorly Bobby Heenan had treated him. At Survivor Series 1992, the two teams faced off, with Ric Flair and Razor Ramon failing to defeat Macho Man and Mr. Perfect. After a few months, Ric Flair and Mr. Perfect would go one-on-one -on, -one on the January 25th, 1993 episode of Raw in a Loser Leaves WWE match. Flair was defeated by his former partner and was kicked out of WWE. The reason for Ric Flair's abrupt departure was because of a deal he had with Vince McMahon, where if Flair wasn't going to be used in the main event, he could leave WWE. Since that was going to happen, the Nature Boy said adios and went back to WCW. Just like how the Nature Boy worked with WWE's rival in the 80s, Flair did the same thing again in the 90s as the Monday Night War began to heat up. Unfortunately, the Nature Boy was on the losing side, and WCW shut down in 2001. About eight months later, Ric Flair would make his return to WWE. In the storyline, Shane and Stephanie McMahon Man sold their WWE stock to Ric Flair, making him the co-owner of the company with Vince McMahon. The two got on each other's nerves, ultimately setting up Ric Flair's first WWE match since his return. McMahon and Flair faced off in a street fight at the 2002 Royal Rumble. The Nature Boy won, proving to everyone he still had it. Afterward, Ric Flair got upset when The Undertaker attacked The Rock backstage, which is kind of ironic considering what Flair did years earlier in WWE. Anyways, this led to The Nature Boy causing the dead man a match against Rocky. In response, Undertaker challenged Ric Flair to a match at WrestleMania. Flair said he was just an owner now and wasn't going to wrestle. Not happy with Rick's answer, the Phenom began attacking Flair's friends and family until the wrestling legend agreed to a match at WrestleMania. While Ric Flair put up a good fight, his name wasn't Brock Lesnar, so he fell victim to the Tombstone Piledriver and lost. After this rivalry, Flair returned to his ownership responsibilities. He refereed a number of contenders match against Stone Cold Steve Austin and, ironically, The Undertaker at Backlash. The Undertaker won due to Rick not seeing Austin's foot touching the rope. At first, it seemed like Flair wanted to make amends, but he would later turn on Stone Cold and align himself with the Big Show. Steve Austin would get his revenge when he cost Ric Flair a WWE Championship match against Hulk Hogan on Raw. This ultimately led to a two-on-one handicap match between Flair and Big Show and the Texas Rattlesnake. Despite having the odds in his favor, a botched attack from X-Pac ended up costing Flair the match. Ric Flair and Steve Austin would have a one-on-one -on -one match soon after, where Stone Cold won again. To make matters worse, Ric Flair would lose his ownership of WWE when he lost to Vince McMahon in a rematch, thanks to Brock Lesnar interfering. The Nature Boy would start a short feud with the Beast, but was defeated twice, once in a singles match and once in a tag team match. From there, Flair would move on to another short feud with Chris Jericho that started when Jericho attacked Rick after Y2J had been moved from SmackDown to Raw. The two went one-on-one -on -one at the 2002 SummerSlam, and this time, Ric Flair got the win. With a bit of momentum, the Nature Boy was granted a World Heavyweight Championship match against Triple H. Unfortunately, Flair's victory at SummerSlam only got him so far. Things would get interesting at the next pay-per-view Unforgiven, when Triple H had a match against Rob Van Dam. Ric Flair came out during it, and at first, it looked like he was going to attack the game, but ended up taking out RVD instead. After this, Flair would become Triple H's manager and started accompanying him to the ring. It didn't end there though. Soon, Batista joined them, as well as Randy Orton. This then created a faction known as Evolution. For the first while, Ric Flair continued to be more of a manager for the group, but as time went on, he started wrestling more and more. He even fought Shawn Michaels for the first time at Bad Blood 2003 and won thanks to a little help from Randy Orton. However, Flair would take more of a backseat role and mainly help the other members of Evolution in their feuds, especially Triple H. At the Armageddon pay-per-view, the group would really show its dominance with every member winning a championship. For Ric Flair, he teamed up with Batista and won the World Tag Team Championship, the first time the Nature Boy had won a WWE title in 11 years. Going into 2004, Flair and the Animal would lose the tag titles to Booker T and Rob Van Dam in February. After that, the 
the two had partnered with Randy Orton in his feud against Mick Foley. Foley, though, had reunited with The Rock, which set up a two-on-three handicap match at WrestleMania 20. Evolution was victorious that night and gave Ric Flair and Batista the momentum they needed for their World Tag Team title rematch. Eight days after WrestleMania, Flair and The Animal fought Booker in RVD again, and this time, they won. While they had gold back around their waist, someone who didn't have any gold was Triple H, due to him losing the world title to Chris Benoit. This led to Ric Flair and Batista to defend their world championship against Benoit and Edge. Unfortunately, like the game, they also lost their gold. After becoming titleless again, Ric Flair would go back to being more of a background character. He would mainly help Triple H in the game's pursuit to become world heavyweight champion again. Speaking of which, after Randy Orton won the title at SummerSlam, Flair, Triple H, and Batista all turned on the Legend Killer. This set up a match between H and Orton at Unforgiven, where Ric Flair interfered and helped the Cerebral Assassin become a champion again. For the rest of the year, Flair continued to aid Triple H, as well as fight Randy Orton, who was a little ticked off at Evolution. Unfortunately, this wasn't the only person who was going to get upset with the group. Batista won the 2005 Royal Rumble match, earning himself a World Championship match at WrestleMania 21. Triple H and Flair tried to convince the Animal to challenge for the WWE Championship, however, Batista would ultimately choose Triple H as his WrestleMania opponent. The Nature Boy would do his best to help the game fight the Animal, but it didn't work and Batista became the new World Heavyweight Champion. Soon after WrestleMania, Evolution would end and Ric Flair was back on his own. He would become a good guy again and defeat the Intercontinental Champion Carlito at Unforgiven, and all seemed good. That was, until Triple H returned in October 2005. The two teamed up and won a tight team match against Carlito and Chris Masters. However, afterward, the game would attack the Nature Boy, kicking off a rivalry. The two first fought inside of a steel cage match at Taboo Tuesday, where Ric Flair won. They went one-on-one -on -one again at Survivor Series in a last man standing match. This time, Flair didn't fare so well, and ended up crumbling to the game. Despite this loss, Flair's IC Championship was not on the line, so he continued to defend the title throughout the rest of 2005. Around this time, in real life, arrest warrants were issued for Ric Flair, following a road rage incident. Flair was ultimately charged with two misdemeanors, and the incident would actually lead to a storyline in WWE. Edge had recently started a talk show called The Cutting Edge, and began mocking Ric Flair for the road rage incident. Ric Flair didn't take too kindly to the joke, and attacked the radar superstar. At New Year's Revolution, Flair and Edge would go one-on-one -on -one for Ric's Intercontinental Championship. However, Edge attacked the Nature Boy with his Money in the Bank briefcase and was disqualified. Ric Flair and Edge would meet once more eight days later in a tables, ladders, and chairs match, where this time, Edge was the decisive winner. However, like with Triple H, the IC title wasn't on the line, so Ric Flair remained champion. His time as champ, though, finally came to an end in February 2006, when the Nature Boy was defeated by Shelton Benjamin. Flair didn't manage to win back the Intercontinental Championship, but he did qualify for the Money in the Bank match at WrestleMania 22. Unfortunately, that didn't work out too well for the Nature Boy. Soon after, Ric Flair would take a break from WWE. When he returned, he began a rivalry with Mick Foley, someone who Flair legitimately had heat with backstage. The two legends took shots at each other, with Ric Flair calling Foley a glorified stuntman, while Mick called Flair a washed up piece of crap. They had a best 2 out of 3 falls match at Vengeance, where the Nature Boy beat the hardcore legend in 2 straight falls. The two went at it once more at SummerSlam in an insanely bloody eye quit match. Flair would threaten to attack Molina, who had come out to help Foley, which made Mick say, I quit. After beating Mick Foley 2 to none, Ric Flair would be in feuding with the Spirit Squad. He teamed up with Roddy Piper, and they managed to beat the male cheerleaders for the World Tag Team Championship. The victory was short-lived, as eight days later, Rick and Rowdy lost the titles to Flair's old rivals, Edge and Randy Orton. That didn't stop the Nature Boy, though, from leading a team of WWE legends to defeat the Spirit Squad at Survivor Series. In early 2007, Ric Flair would start an interesting storyline with Carlito. It began when Ric Flair got angry at Carlito for leaving a WWE show early, and said the Apple Man had no heart. Flair and Carlito would soon have a one-on-one -on -one match that the Nature Boy won. They then formed a tag team with Ric Flair mentoring Carlito. Unfortunately, they would suffer their fair share of losses, and there was ongoing conflict between them. Just as their tag team got started, it ended when Ric Flair and Carlito began fighting each other during a match. The former tag team partners decided to go one-on-one -on -one again at Judgment Day, with the Nature Boy getting the better of the Apple Man. After his rivalry with Carlito, Ric Flair would be drafted to SmackDown. Flair's first order of business was to challenge the United States Champion MVP. 
Flair got his title match at Vengeance, but got outplayed when MVP low blowed him and won. While things didn't quite go according to the Nature Boy's plan, things picked up when he realigned himself with Batista. Unfortunately, shortly after the Evolution teammates got back together, Flair would get injured during a match with the Great Khali. He spent a few months away from WWE, and when he came back, he was on Raw. Upon his return, Ric Flair gave a speech talking about his future and retirement, only to announce that he would never retire. This got the attention of Vince McMahon, who said that if Ric Flair lost any singles matches, he'd be forced into retirement. Over the next several months, almost every match Ric Flair is a part of was heart-pounding, knowing that one defeat would end his career. However, this didn't stop the Nature Boy from challenging Shawn Michaels to a match at WrestleMania 24. HBK was reluctant at first, but eventually agreed. Not to spoil anything, but this would be Ric Flair's last match in WWE. While both men got a great ovation, the fans were definitely the loudest for Ric Flair. Once the match started, Flair began with a bit of showboating, but Michaels got him back by hitting the first offensive move. The two then started grappling and went back and forth with who was in control. Michaels tried to fight out of Flair's hold with elbows, but Ric Flair caught Mr. WrestleMania with a hip toss. The match then started turning personal, with Rick and Sean yelling at each other and slapping one another. Speaking of slapping, Flair started dishing out his signature chops on HBK. Michaels tried to fight out of it, but ended up getting a boot to the face, just like Pete Sanchez over 30 years earlier. Flair's momentum was briefly derailed when Michaels nailed him with a hard elbow, but the Nature Boy got it back on track when he threw his opponent off the top turnbuckle. Flair then took to the skies with the crossbody and tried to lock in the figure four, but got literally booted out of the ring. Mr. WrestleMania then connected with a baseball slide to Flair, but completely missed a moonsault and ate the announcer's table. HBK made it back into the ring, but the botched move had done some serious damage. Flair didn't give Michaels a second of recovery and kept wailing on him. Despite all the abuse, Shawn Michaels still stayed in the match. Ric Flair then dished out a second serving of chops, followed by a spectacular standing suplex. Shawn Michaels finally caught up to Flair when the showstopper hit the Nature Boy with a neckbreaker. Michaels followed this up by giving Ric Flair a hard throw to the outside and then hit a moonsault from the top rope that definitely connected. Despite that, both men had to crawl to get back into the ring. The two legends began trading chops, which ended when Michaels rammed his elbow into Ric's face. Mr. WrestleMania then hit two atomic drops on the Nature Boy, followed by a body slam onto the mat, and ending with the showstopper's signature elbow drop from the top rope. HBK started tuning up the band, but stopped himself before he hit Ric Flair, which allowed Flair to execute the figure four leg lock. Michaels was able to get out of the hold, which led to the two icons starting to grapple again and going for the pin. When that didn't end the match, Ric Flair catapulted Shawn Michaels into the opposite turnbuckle, leading to Shawn Michaels' signature flop, something Ric Flair did years before Shawn Michaels was even a wrestler. Flair took out his opponent's left leg and tried to lock in the figure four. The first attempt wasn't successful, but the second one was. Ric Flair kept Shawn Michaels locked in for 50 seconds until Shawn caused a rope break. After failing to get the tap out, Ric Flair started getting vicious and sloppy. This created an opening for the Heartbreak Kid tit sweet chin music, but Ric Flair somehow kicked out. Michaels got ready to hit a second one, but Flair wouldn't get up. Frustrated, Shawn Michaels walked over to the Nature Boy, which allowed Ric Flair to low blow HBK. However, Shawn Michaels countered with his own version of the figure four leg lock, but Flair managed to reach the rope and get a thumb to the eye as well. Once both men were on their feet, Ric Flair began serving up chops, but from out of nowhere, Shawn Michaels hit sweet chin music. Instead of going for the pin, Michaels got ready to hit a second one, but was hesitant. Ric Flair motioned for Shawn to bring it, so the showstopper did and put an end to one of the most legendary careers in wrestling history. Sort of. I can't really add anything that's already been said. This match is spectacular. It does seem like it doesn't get talked about as much though, and I think that might be because of Shawn Michaels and Undertaker's match at the following WrestleMania overshadowing that. Despite that, this is still a phenomenal match, and is in the top tier of last matches. The entire storyline of Ric Flair's career being on the line in every single match was great too. One thing that I find fascinating about Ric Flair's last WWE match is how much the world evolved since his first. Just look at his first WWE match in 1976 compared to his last in 2008. The quality of the footage speaks for itself. Anyways, while this would be Ric Flair's last match in WWE, he would compete a few more times, mainly in TNA between 2010 and 2011. More recently, Ric Flair is stepping out of retirement again at the age of 73 for a match at StarCast during SummerSlam weekend. Like the man said, 
that I will never retire.